Okay, I guess we. Frank didn't tell me which table we stand at. Which one or that one? Which one do you want? Yeah, it uh, it has started. Uh, so the camera now is on over there. Yeah. Yeah. So we can start the no, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, it's good. It's good. <laughs> All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So good to be in the room with live people on a stage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, so, I'm so happy to see that and to experience this. Welcome to Innovate for Water. It's, again, great to be here. My name is Ana Maria Montero. I will be your host uh, along the way today. Uh, but I am joined on stage by someone that most of you already know. So it doesn't need a lot of introduction. One of the three waterpreneurs who, in fact, makes these events happen. Frank Barroso, good to see you. Thank you, Anna Maria, and uh, thank you, everyone. I would like also to uh, to welcome all the people that uh, should be now with us uh, on Hermit on the digital platform. So uh, be aware that uh, uh, those people are here. So don't hesitate uh, for the one that are on the digital platform to uh, to use the the chat. Uh, you can uh, ask question. Uh, after the, the, the different uh, pitch that we will do, uh, we will do the Q&A, so I will remind you that. So don't hesitate to use the, the chat. And I'm very pleased to be here with you also here in person. Now, Frank, Innovate for Water has already taken place in several cities. Why bring it now to Lausanne? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, in fact, we are from here. Uh, so we are from, from Lausanne. Uh, and uh, after the first Innovate for Water that we've done in 2017, it was in, in Geneva. Uh, so we've been to several countries, uh, in particular in, in Africa, in Kenya, Zambia, Nigeria, also in, in Australia. And we were just about to, uh, to do another one in, uh, in Kenya in March uh, last year, and then COVID uh, came. Uh, so we had to, to cancel, and uh, so we were thinking, okay, now it's going to be a difficult time, so how about maybe uh, do another Innovate, try to do another Innovate for Water here in Switzerland. 
uh, in the city where we are. So uh, we came with this proposition with uh, intent and we have the pleasure to, uh, to, to do this uh, Lausanne event, which will be in fact a uh, the first of a series of uh, three events. Uh, next one will be uh, Geneva and uh, Arles after the, the summer. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to really uh, show what is happening uh, in Switzerland, in Europe, uh, with different challenges uh, related to the Rhone River Basin. And uh, today we'll have a lot of experts uh, in the room presenting those. Yeah. Speaking of which, um, Andre Hoffman, co-founder of Intent, partner of today's event, is also in the house and will be speaking with us in just a few moments. But coming back to the agenda you just mentioned and everything we're going to see, we've got quite a lot going on. What can you tell us? Yes, we've got uh, a packed uh, agenda, in fact, today. So as you've seen all in the, in the program, uh, so the day is divided into four uh, big sessions, uh, four thematic sessions that uh, we've decided together with our uh, uh, partners. So the way it will work, uh, there will be a series of pitch from organizations. So it's uh, not only startups of SME, but also uh, accelerator, uh, investor, public authorities will be pitching uh, what they do and the different solution that the, they bring. Uh, and after those pitch, uh, there will be a short uh, Q&A. Uh, so that's why I encourage again the people from the audience and also uh, from the digital platform to think about some question maybe that you want to ask to the, to the speakers. And at the end of all those uh, sessions, uh, what we will do is the networking time. So the networking time happens, of course, in person here at the Swiss Tech Center, but also on the digital platform uh, where you can use the different table to sit uh, to the different and meet the different participants. So there is a name on the table when we go back on the lounge. So this is for the one on Hermit. Uh, so you when you go back on the lounge, you can go to the different tables and you will see the name of the different organizations that are presenting during the day and you can go and interact with some of the people uh, there. Plus, there will be also two panels uh, happening, uh, one in the morning after the, the first session on nature-based solution and, and another one at the end of the, of the day. Okay, and you've just Brenda, mentioned um, our networking sessions. Also here live, there's a couple of things to have in mind, right? There's left versus right. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> want me to explain that? Yeah, you want to go ahead. Yeah, yeah sure. So what is very important, uh, you need to, to be aware that uh, we are still have the COVID measure. So here you are sitting uh, once, uh, one seat uh, every three seats. Uh, so please respect that. So no coffee here. Coffee and food is only on the, on the right, so on the zone de restauration. Uh, that's when you, you take uh, your coffee, your food, uh, and you, you go on the table, you sit, and you cannot uh, move from table. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to network with people and move from table, uh, so it's on this, on the left, with the networking done, but here, no food, no drink uh, are allowed. So you are allowed to, to have the discussion and move from table on the left. On the, on the right, it's food, and you cannot really move. So yeah, that's for, for here. That's what it is, yeah. right? We're, we're, it's getting better, numbers are coming down, but we still have to be vigilant. And that also includes wearing your mask. I know that's great. I know we don't like to wear our masks, but we must wear them at all times, of course, unless you're eating or drinking or you're on stage. For those people that will be joining us on stage, don't worry, don't have to wear your mask. And we will repeat uh, some of these housekeeping things throughout the day. So if you forget which way, left or right, don't worry, we'll be here to remind you. <laughs> Okay, so um, with that, Frank, thank you so much yeah. for helping me out with that introduction. Thank you, Anna Maria, <laughs> and uh, I'll be there also uh, all day. Thank you. Yes, he'll be around. All right, so thank you again to all of you for being here. As mentioned, our first guest today is a man of many hats, um, including Vice Chairman of Roche Holding Limited, President of Fondacion Mava and the Fondacion Tour de Ballet in the Camargue. Uh, board member of System IQ, member of the Board of Trustees of the World Economic Forum, and center of the Fourth Industrial Revolution in San Francisco. But today, he is wearing a hat that is very close to his heart, and this is the one of co-founder, along with his wife, Rosalie, uh, of the Intent platform that was formed just recently in Davos in 2019. Andre Hoffman, please join me on stage. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Please, please. Please, here in the no, middle. I, I it's a better I better shot. So, there we go. Yeah, there you go. You can grab that mic there. 
<laughs> and as we, uh, as we get started, for those people in the room who may not be familiar with the Intent platform, because it's rather new, just 2019, what, what is the intention behind it? Let me grab you that mic. Yeah. Do you use this one or this one? Oh, you're mic'd already. Okay, so we don't need that. Excuse me. <laughs> so, um, f first of all, thank you very much to everybody uh, for g taking the time to listening to me. I completely agree with Anna-Maria. It is wonderful to see people. So, for those of you online, uh, there are not many people here, so don't worry, not missing much, but um, uh, it's nice to be able to talk in front of fellow human beings and not just uh, pieces of silicon. So, uh, Intent. Intent is a partner of, um, of the event of today, one of the partners, with many others. And um, uh, I, st I started this uh, platform with my, with my wife um, some years ago uh, on the principle that we needed to, and we have uh, wrote down the mission on a little panel there, and th th that we need to uh, accelerate the movement towards a sustainable economy by fostering the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations and uh, 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 calibrating this on the SDG goals. Goals. And we do this with the, um, by br building bridges between different uh, pro projects, and I think today is a good example of that, but also by connecting people who, um, have not necessarily, who don't necessarily know each other, or who are not necessarily aware that they are working in the same direction. So uh, as, as uh, Anna Maya said kindly in her introduction, I happen to be uh, one of these rare animals who happens uh, to sit in, in corporate uh, boards and corporate distractions, but also quite actively involved involved in NGOs, and I'm uh, completely convinced that uh, business is a force for good, and I'm going to explain that, because sometimes that particular thing needs to be explained. But first, intent. Intent, um, uh, um, uh, we, 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 we try to create these events, which today have to be uh, on, on the screen, but which normally were in a, uh, uh, in real life, and we hope to be able to resume that very soon. Um, the, 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 the principle of uh, what we are trying to achieve is to demonstrate that the current system, and the pandemic has shown that very clearly, the current system is not really fit for purpose. As a humanity, we are not respecting the different forces that constitute our system in a, in a reasonable way. In particular, we overconsume natural resources, we abuse social and human systems, and all this in the name of short-term profit maximization, which has been the operating system of humanity for, for the past 250 years, perhaps even longer, but let, let's, work about, uh, let's talk about the industrial period. And um, how do we make sure that this is changed? We need to change that because we need to better understand what the impact of the, that our system is having on humanity and on the planet. We only have one planet, we need to look after it. I think that uh, nature is a, a solution rather than a problem, and uh, I think it's very important that we enter into this age of collaboration. Now, <clears throat> how do we translate that in practical terms? How do we make sure that we get, in fact, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a business opportunity. It's a, you know, how do we get nature to work for us? Rather than working on the principle that we as humanity know better than uh, everybody and that we have to dominate nature so that nature can deliver what we need to continue this growth which is destroying the real planet on which we are, how do we get nature to compensate for the mistakes we've made in the past and how do we get it to, to how do we get our activities to become regenerative rather than, uh, regenerative, sorry, rather than just co uh, consuming. Um, for this we need to do two big things. One is we, we need to be able to understand the impact we're having and um, uh, uh, measuring impact, measuring impact on human, on social and on natural capital. How do we put it together so that the produced capital that we measure um, is, um, uh, is a true reflection of what's happening. Very simple example, water. Clean water is not for free. It has a cost. And because it has a cost that we do not integrate normally in our calculation for investments, uh, we are so often um, destroying more than we are producing by producing uh, uh, produce capital based on water. We will come back to that during the whole day, and I'm really very much looking for forward to that. Um, so now, once we know what we are influencing and how we're influencing it, we can then start managing impact, and we can start managing impact in a positive manner, and not just in an after-the-event uh, forgetting manner. 
So once we've, we've established the, the way to measuring uh, the impact we're having, we then need to look at nature-based solution. How can we get nature to work for us? Uh, one of my favorite examples is wetlands, you know, the, 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 the marshes. Um, uh, Anna Maria mentioned before, I'm the chair of um, uh, Fondation Tour du Valat, of which we have also a board member in the audience, and I'm looking forward to be able to discuss that later as well. Um, uh, and the Fondation Tour du Valat has given itself as a mission to restore and where possible, sorry, to protect and where possible restore Mediterranean wetlands. And uh, why Mediterranean? Because we established there and it makes it easier. And um, uh, uh, why, why wetlands? Because wetlands have an incredibly important role to play in the water cycle that we are going to explore here today in different uh, perspectives. So why did Intent decide to associate itself uh, with Votopreneur and all the partners you see here? It's because of water. Water is, the, uh, uh, water is life. Water is the, 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 the backbone of the life support system on Earth uh, in nature. Without, without water, nothing happens. And so if we want to zoom in into practical solution of how we can promote nature-based solution, I think the idea of talking, starting with water is not wrong. And water is also not only an expression of nature, it's also an expression of civilization, of social and human systems. Um, we've, uh, we've heard before that uh, the waterpreneurs are based here in Lausanne. We have an event that we will, that we will uh, participate with here in Lausanne. We will then go on the other side of the lake in Geneva, and then we will follow the Rhone River. And the Rhone River is not just a, an ecosystem which is in need of all sorts of help, it's also a historical vector. It's created, uh, in many ways, a French civilization. I mean, the whole valley between Lyon and Marseille has been for years the place where wealth was being created in a rather destructive manner. So it's a, it's a, good, it's a good example of, of, what, um, of, of what can be done. Um, maybe just a, a, a comma, uh, I'm not talking against uh, uh, business, or I'm talking uh, against uh, creating wealth. We need the wealth because we have more and more needs, also socially, but we need to do it in a, in a, in a way that is sufficiently respectuous to be able to continue to add value without destroying uh, the, the system in which we are. And that makes water so, such an interesting idea. Now, I'm sure you've all been to a number of these conferences and everybody tells you, we have to do this, we have to do that. This is not what today is about. Today is about practical solutions. We are going to have pitches by organizations which are involved in water in the hope that we can get some uh, tools, some, 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 some content in our toolbox which will allow us to continue to manage the water resources in a way that will um, really help us to, 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 um, to, make, to bring practical solutions to a very practical problem. Um, you know, water is, is, um, is an interesting uh, thing to study because it is something that we know it will not disappear. There will always be water on the planet. We've all, been, we've all learned the, the water cycle at school, right? you know, evaporation, rain, and start again. Uh, uh, the problem is that it is not in the right quantity, at the right place, at the right time, in the right quality. Now, if I talk about quality and, and, and place, I talk about logistics. Now, logistics is something that we know how to do in humanity. We've done logistics all our lives. That's what we do. We move things around. And it strikes me that um, uh, in water in particular, there is an opportunity to, to um, um, put these systems in place, which will increase uh, our well-being, will increase our uh, impact on humanity, and deliver the growth that we all need. So that's about, well, in, in a nutshell what I wanted to say to you today. Thank you for the patience of listening to me. And um, uh, I, I wish us all a great day. And in particular, I wish us to get a little bit closer to the reality of what we actually need. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andre. I couldn't agree more. We, today is about not only uh, being reminded of the problems that we are facing in terms of water, but what are the solutions, really? Really seeing practical hands-on tools, solutions, things that can actually be done. So we're all looking forward to seeing that. Thank you again, Andre, for those words and for being here with us today. Thank you, Anna-Marie. All right, speaking of which, we have our first pitch session coming up now. So we're going to be hearing from some of these first solution-oriented individuals and what they have come up with. So, um, and for that, I would like to call up our next guest, Tobias Salate, who actually, are you going to come up? Okay, good. <laughs> I can come down, but happy for you to come up. Please come here where we can all see you. 
perfect. All right, so for those of you who may not have had the pleasure of meeting this gentleman, he is senior advisor at the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. And he's worked on field projects in Europe and Africa, environmental communication, policy development, and intergovernmental processes with BirdLife International, the European Commission, and the Tour de Vala Research Institute for Mediterranean Wetlands, which I believe is what Andre mentioned among. So, Tobias, what else can I say? The floor is yours. Good morning to everybody. And I, I'm happy to be able to have been invited to moderate this first session. I will give you a brief introduction with three slides. Here they are already. And then I will call our pictures up on the scene here. Uh, I think Andre Hoffman mentioned already the wetlands and the importance of wetlands because water, obviously, I, everybody of us is composed of about 70% of water. Water is life. And there is no life without water. That's the big question on Mars. Uh, but water is not only not free, but it comes to our tap through wetlands, through that infrastructure which is so important to, to make the hydrological cycle running. And uh, maybe the first thing, I'm not sure if you can read the, the comics here, but you can look at wetlands also as the water bank. When you have a lot of water, you put it in a bank. So you, wetlands can store water for drought season and they do a lot of other things. They, they uh, obviously also purify it. They have also cultural, historical values or so. So maybe the second slide, those wetland landscapes, uh, if you can move to the second slide. Okay, here we are. Uh, the good news here is that this is not very new, this understanding, because already 50 years ago, back in 71, the countries have started to understand this. And there were the first 18 nations who signed a treaty, the Convention on Wetlands. They went for signing this to a town at a seaside resort in the Caspian, a town called Ramsar. Therefore, the convention is known colloquially as the Ramsar Convention. So they are engaging themselves in doing mainly three things, using that infrastructure, those landscapes, those ecosystems, related to water in a wise sense, in the sustainable use, wise use of wetlands was created, the term in the 60s, 1960s. They are obliged to maintain iconic places. Uh, we have uh, uh, mentioned, Andre has mentioned uh, the Rhone River. It's a, a river catchment approach. So you have three examples here. It starts at the glacier, as long as it still is a glacier. Afterwards, we will probably have some problems for irrigation. Uh, where there is one Ramsar site. It, uh, you have in the middle another picture which shows you on the other side of the lake, the Plateau de Gavo, where the rain infiltrates peatlands and uh, grazing areas uh, and uh, becomes eventually after 27 years or so the Evian mineral water, which is a, a very good quality water for the inhabitants, but also obviously a business opportunity. And it goes down, as was mentioned, to, to the Camargue, the delta where the River Rhone flows into the, the Mediterranean. It has also a few other sites. Uh, I, I just mentioned another one. The whole Lake Geneva could be such uh, called Ramsar site. It's not yet the case, but the Geneva and the downstream to the French border is a Ramsar site, or the whole of Lake Bourget. So just to tell you, the, the countries have agreed on those principles. Now it's up to each of us, the actors, the, the, the business actors, the uh, entrepreneurs also to do most out of it. And the last slide, please. Uh, so there are a lot of wetland-based or nature-based solutions for different stakeholder needs. And, and uh, we want, want to explore those opportunities during today, and, but keeping in mind that that wetland infrastructure behind the opportunities is important and we have to maintain it, we have to monitor it, we have to restore it, uh, and uh, we have to make a sustainable use of, out of it, but not a destructive or short-term use only. So there are multiple benefits, we are looking for it, and we are looking for integrated solutions. And uh, after all, a few weeks ago, the decade on restoration of ecosystems started under the UN level, so that's probably a good moment also to focus on this. So after this introduction, I am happy to uh, invite our four pitchers who are in the room. And we are starting with the fifth one, who will be joining us uh, 
um, uh, online. The first one is Michael van Kutzem from B Our Diversity. So the other four, please come up. I will go down. You can have a, a stand or sit behind each of those four tables. But we will start with the fifth one, who I hope will be online. And uh, so I am invent inviting Michael van Kutzem to start as soon as uh, the other four are installed here. I'm, I'm going down. Michael, the floor is yours. Michael, Michael, do you hear me? Okay, we don't. Do we have his sound in the room? Okay, so. We will start with the next one. This would be David Nussbaumer from eFficiency. Please, David, you, you start then. Do you hear me? Okay, good morning everyone. I'm David Nussbaumer. I'm the co-founder of Efficiency, a spin-off project from the University of Lausanne. We, we all know that life appeared in water, but since we left this environment and evolved as human, we have lost our emotional and spiritual link with the aquatic ecosystem. We exploit it industri industrially causing massive decline in aquatic biodiversity and in fish stock. At Efficiency, we strongly believe that we, as humans, highly depend on thriving and resilient aquatic ecosystem. And for that reason, we, we, we believe that um, this, uh, this resilience that I just mentioned is highly rooted in a strong genetic biodiversity. And therefore, we want to create a new era of aquatic genetic resources management for the conservation authorities that need to bend the curve of aquatic biodiversity decline, and also for fish farms that need to feed the world and seek better yields to a sustainable and durable approach. This vision was born in 2019, just before the pandemic. And we then raised 10,000 francs and enrolled in an innovation program from the University of Lausanne. And later in the same year, we raised 100,000 francs from a pact and got offices and laboratory space in the university for another year. And we are now trying to set up a CTI Inosis project and during our journey, we have initiated seven implementation projects of our ideas and concepts. We have established, established four partnerships, and we have developed activities in three countries already. To implement this vision, we offer and sell uh, two families of services to people who breed fish, either for production or for conservation. On one side, we offer genomic analysis based on next generation sequencing technologies to assess and promote genetic diversity in breeding. And on the other side, we offer sperm credit preservation to secure forever valuable genes in our gene bank. Politicians and leaders have now started to realize that our civilization highly depends on resilient aquatic ecosystem and our vision is well aligned with that of important political agenda. For instance, the Sustainable Development Goal number 14 of the United Nations, or uh, many of the, the point of Cluster 6 from the EU Horizon 
program for innovation and research, and also of, of uh, one with one of uh, the mission 2030 of the European Union, which seeks at restoring healthy and um, healthy and resilient ocean seas and inland waters. Behind efficiency, there are three people. Christian and I did our PhD together at the University of Lausanne, working six years with uh, fish research. Uh, I've developed expertise in uh, fertilization technology for fish and cryopreservation, while Christian is an expert in genomics and bioinformatics. And we are pleased to be coached by Caroline, an agronomist and Innosis business coach with a passion for sustainable entrepreneurship. Efficiency is not incorporated yet, but together, over the last year, we have established a um, partnership with a public institute, research institute, or innovation cluster for ne networking and uh, advancing our research. And also, we have already a few client and validation partner to, uh, uh, in the aquaculture industry, as well as uh, with uh, conservation managers. To continue our journey and implement our vision, what we need now is further funding and laboratory space from September on. And we are also always seeking a partner to um, validate our, uh, our ideas in the field. So if, I have, uh, if you have anything for us, or if we do have any solution that may interest you, don't hesitate to reach out to us online or in the networking session. I'm David Nussbaumer, and I thank you all for your attention and uh, the organizer for this exciting event. Thank you very much, David. If you have questions, please put them online in the chat and they will come at the end. We will discuss at the end after the five presentations. If you have something here in the room which is very urgent, we may take one question, but, but keep them to the end. Is uh, uh, Michael van Kutzem now online? Okay, then please, Michael, you are the next one. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if the slides will appear. Thank you. So, um, hello everyone. Um, I'm Michael, the CEO of Biodiversity, where we uh, create value with biodiversity regeneration. Next slide, please. Um, let me start with a short story. If you can go to the next slide. Um, we met a big water producer several years ago, um, and he told us, well, listen, I have 13,000 hectares of water catchment area that I'm protecting since years, but there's no tool to monitor in terms of agricultural and industrial pollution, such as surface, and in terms of biodiversity as well. And so we realized that nature could be the best tool, and actually bees, Bees can be seen as little natural drones. You can go to the next slide. Uh, because they collect pollen on a, a very large surface, so on average 700 hectares of land. And they bring back this pollen from billions of plants in the beehive. So we developed a small tool to collect the pollen on a daily basis. Next slide, please. And the advantage with the pollen is that it fixes air and soil pollution. And so we can see whatever kind of agricultural pollution there is, industrial pollution, but also, of course, it contains the DNA of the plant so we can see biodiversity. And we can see what is the impact of this pollution on the ecosystem, on water, where it comes from, and what are the issues in terms of biodiversity. Next slide, please. And so based on this data, so we collect the pollen, we analyze the pollen, we send out reports and data, and we can take very targeted actions to improve the environment and protect water resources, for example. Next slide, please. Um, today, we're active in uh, 10 countries on 100 sites um, and uh, have some nice awards for these tools, as you can see. Next slide, please. Um, and let me show you the power of this data. So this is an area, it's a water catchment area with vineyards above. Um, in 2014, we had more than 25 pesticides, uh, some of which were really presenting a risk for the water. And we reduced it to less than five within three years' time. 
so people could take decisions based on strong metrics and involve local farmers to reduce the use of these pesticides and reduce the risk for water and water treatment costs. And in parallel, we in, in enhance the local biodiversity by 400%, as you can see. Next slide, please. So we're working with several partners in the Rhone region, as you can see. Next slide, please. And we have different kind of client segments, the water client segment, of course, but the food business also has to change its practices based on data. Real estate has to better design its project based on data. Smart cities or region have to protect air quality or, or their area based on data. And industries have to limit, for example, pollution or work with stakeholders based on data as well. And so we believe there's a total addressable market of more than a billion. Next slide, please. And to reach that objective, uh, we're developing now a platform with Microsoft and Accenture uh, that will be based on artificial intelligence. Of course, it's impossible to place bees everywhere, but this artificial intelligence with the unique data we have will be able to assess the quality of a site in terms of biodiversity and pollution. And so it will give a score. You can upload hundreds of sites. It will give a score and it will list the main risks and what are the solutions. Meaning that for water producers, for example, or the protection of water, you can follow the water floor and highlight the red spots and act directly on these uh, spots which present a risk. Uh, next slide, please. So we're a team of uh, bioengineers and experts in those fields, but also of 12.5 million bees, which makes us the largest employer in the world today. And we're very happy for that. The next slide, please. And what we need today, first, well, we believe we can reach a turnover of more or less 9 million by um, 2026 uh, with this platform, but we need more projects. So we need partners to do bio monitoring projects. So monitor with bees in the Rhone region, but also, of course, outside. We're in Europe, in the US, but we would like to be in Africa and other, other countries. So if, if you know people that can help uh, we would be very happy uh, to work with them. And on the other side, we search for support, uh, corporates or other actors that want to be part of this consortium with Accenture and Microsoft to develop this AI platform. We're already, we already have a prototype, but we want to develop by the end of the year. And so happy to have partners joining the, the journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael, after the first pitch on fish, which was obvious because fish live in, in wetlands, rivers and lakes are part of the wetland ecosystems. An interesting excourse on the bees. I like that Michael was mentioning the catchment approach and that the vineyards are linked through the groundwater to eventually the water we are drinking as well. So after these two, uh, pitches we're going, going into the third one, which is a little bit more engineering type. I'm inviting Marc Diebold from Idric Ingenieur to pitch uh, his uh, proposal. Okay, yeah. So, good morning, everybody. I'm Marc Diebold, and I'm here today to present you one of the many facets of Idric Ingenieur. So, but his here, lakes and lakes modeling. So to make it easy to model a lake, something on lake, you take data, you feed it, you feed a computer with this data, and then you end up with an eye picture. It could be waves, it could be currents, it could be sediment transport, it could be water renewal, it could be many things. So here, for example, on that slide, you take winds, you take a lake, the shape of a lake, you give it to a computer, and you end up with a nice picture telling you where you can go surfing on Geneva Lake when you have some bees events. As well, it can also tell you how to make your new beach or shore renewal just to be sure that it will handle the next storm. This is a nice picture, and then we confront it with reality just through measurement, and you get a validation, that's the last picture, and so you see the red line, the blue, and the black line, they kind of match, showing us a good agreement between modeling 
and measurement. But something we do since already 10 years now, with more than 40 successful projects, some going from big scale, like the Swiss Lakes project website, giving you wave properties on several Swiss Lakes. So that's something we are still improving the data and increasing the number of lakes. At a smaller scale, we have modeling of beach, shores, and harbor, and that's just giving you an idea how you can do it better and safer. Actually, we are mostly working in Switzerland. It's not a big market, it's a niche market, really not so big, but it's still increasing, as you can see the trend, but still with some up and downs, and that would be for us a good thing just to try to find a way to smoothen this curve, just to be more flexible. The impact of us, as I said, is just to improve shore revitalization. Because if you see even on Geneva Lake, you have something like more than 50% of a harbor which display a, a problem or water renewal, bad protection against wave, then you have to think, okay, if I'm going to improve a shore to invest some money, I'd like to have more of a 50% of chances to do it right. And the social part as well, being able to improve or to give, to create new beaches, new shores is a good improvement. Our team by Idric, the team working on it, is made of five people. So Philip, Philip, and Jeremy and I. And everybody is able to work on both sides, measurements or modeling. For sure, everybody has an area of specialization, and so we are able to meet the demand. For our key partner, then you have really to take the several pieces of a puzzle. So you need some, somebody to give you software to make your calculation. You need data because a wave, for example, that's just wind blowing over water. So data from Meteo Suisse are doing a very good job. And then you link everything with reality. So we have collaboration with engineering from environment or civil engineering. At the moment, our key clients are still in Switzerland, so Geneva and Zurich. But we hope to find new application, and that's because why we are here. It's just, okay, what are your needs? What else could you, are you looking for besides of wave properties, currents, sediment transfer, or how could we apply it just to kind of increase? So it could be at local scale, Vaux, Canton, because uh, we are working just five kilometers away from here, and we would be happy to be more involved in local development, or as well, a bit more abroad, international, so going to our friends or Germany. So I hope I rose your interest for lake modeling and everything, and I would be happy to discuss it further with you at the coffee break. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We have a new aspect here, restoration of the ecosystem, restoration of wetlands for different purposes, and, and we need techniques for that and to do it right. And we can even construct whole wetlands ourselves. The convention I was mentioning before does include human-made wetland ecosystem, so there is no st strict difference made. It, nature is our basis, and, and nature can provide a lot, but we humans can obviously use it and create it, or, or create part of it. And uh, therefore, I would like to invite now Thomas Aubron from EcoBird, who will present to us a specifically human-created type of wetland. Please. Hi, everybody. My name is Thomas Aubron. I'm from the company EcoBird, and I'm going to talk to you about intensified nature-based solutions for water treatment. So why nature-based solutions and why intensification? Well, nature-based solutions have been identified as uh, key tools to help us handle the change in brought by climate and human activities. Um, but these solutions need to be integrated 
in existing infrastructure. Why? Because they're simple, they're robust and resilient, they're cost efficient. They can be adapted to treat any type of wastewater from domestic to industrial wastewater. Could be also sludge treatment, stormwater, runoff, polluted river water or aquifers. And these solutions can be deployed uh, for any decentralized context, being in rural or urban environment. However, especially in urban, in urban and peri-urban environments, uh, space is at a premium. And this nature-based solution requires space. So intensification makes sense because it enab enables compactness. I'm talking about light intensification. This in intensification also help increase the performance of the treatment systems and lower operation and maintenance. They also a uh, are able to handle solids and sludge that could uh, end up in these systems and they do not require the use of sand, which is becoming a scarce resource. So key date of nature-based solutions. So research started early 80s about using these solutions for water treatment with the first systems built in the 90s for treatment of raw wastewater. The these systems led up to standardization of the designs, first for uh, raw wastewater treatment in 2005, followed by stormwater systems in 2013 and adaptation to tropical climates in 2017. In 1999, a company called uh, Eponature was created by the people who were at the origin of the first systems. This company was later split um, between Ecobel, my company, who does engineering, research, and so on, and another company that does only construction. In 2016, we came up with a new concept, which we call the rhizosphere, which is an intensified constructed wetland for water treatment. It's a very compact and high performance design that we are now marketing. Um, the impact of EcoBird, well, first of all, the French market. In France, nature-based solutions are now 60 or 70% of the new decentralized water treatment systems. There's now about 4,000 systems built in France, and EcoBird has been uh, responsible for designing almost 2,000 of these systems. But now the challenge is to deploy these uh, nature-based solutions in urban areas, but also in other countries, especially in the developing world, where they need uh, serious investments for managing their water. Uh, thus, we are targeting the um, SDG 6 for water and sanitation, the 11 for sustainable cities, as well as the 13 climate action and 15 life on Earth. Uh, EcoBird is a small company of 12 people that is organized around the management and a very strong research and department, as well as an in international department that I'm representing today. But the core of the company is the engineering section with process engineers, programming and automation experts, modelers, and so on. EcoBird has uh, a lot of partners in the research world with uh, French Research Institute in RAE, INSA, University of Montpellier, but also in other countries, in Denmark with Aarhus University of Germany, the Helmholtz uh, Center for Environmental Research, but also professional networks uh, like Global Wetland Technology or Accelera in the Rhone Valley for chemical uh, industry, France Water Team, and so on. Why we are at uh, in Lausanne, Today, it's because we have identified potential in the Rhone catchment, but we are also um, interested in developing our international network to find partner to deploy and build nature-based solutions. But also we need help to support the accept acceptation of nature-based solutions by a regulator, which is currently a big bottleneck. And finally, of course, we are looking for projects. So thank you very much for listening to me. And if you have any question, do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Yes, please don't be shy to ask your questions online through the chat. And we will come to them just after the last presentation. Also, those people in the room, please think about the questions or the suggestions or the comments you are preparing. and will be having the opportunity to speak to it then afterwards, after the last presentation. 
The last one is going to bring us into a bigger size. It's about the whole upstream part of the Rhone River, upstream of Lake Geneva. And I'm happy to invite Tony Arborino from the canton of Valle, which is the regional uh, entity or authority in, uh, who is dealing with that third correction of the River Rhone. Please. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour à toutes et bonjour à tous. Ça me fait plaisir d'être ici pour vous parler de cette troisième correction du Rhône. Ça a été dit, l'amont du lac Léman, 160 km entre la source du Rhône, le glacier, jusqu'à l'embouchure du Léman. Le Rhône est propriété du canton du Valais et sur la dernière partie de la rive droite du canton de Vaud. Donc un aménagement de cours d'eau à une grande échelle qui est nécessaire. Pourquoi Parce qu'on a une situation de danger qui, elle aussi, est à une très grande échelle. On voit sur cette image, on a analyser la situation historique. On a eu des crues importantes en Suisse et en Valais et on a vu qu'on avait la majeure partie de la plaine qui était inondable en cas de crue du Rhône. Les digues sont hautes, vieilles, fragiles. Quand les digues cèdent ou débordent, on a une inondation qui peut se propager très très loin. En Suisse, on structure les zones de risque avec trois types de couleurs, du rouge, du bleu et du jaune. Dans les zones rouges, on a plus de 2 mètres d'inondation. Et grâce à cette cartographie de danger qu'on applique à tout type de danger naturel, on a une homogénéité de la gestion du territoire. Ce sera notre premier axe. Parce que la difficulté, c'est de mettre en œuvre une stratégie qui est à la fois rapide pour protéger les personnes qui sont menacées et durable pour avoir une solution qui nous permette de donner des bonnes conditions de vie aux prochaines générations. Premier axe donc de la stratégie, on va travailler sur la prévention. Le deuxième, sur l'intervention d'urgence. Et le troisième, sur la construction, sur l'aménagement du Rhône, sur la troisième correction du Rhône. Voyons comment est-ce qu'on réalise la prévention. Première mesure dans la prévention, c'est des notions de préavis. Chaque fois qu'il y a un nouveau bâtiment qui doit se construire en zone de danger, eh bien, c'est transmis à l'autorité qui délivre un préavis et qui permet ou pas la construction ou qui demande des adaptations en fonction du danger. Cette mesure, elle coûte peu en termes de travaux, elle rapporte beaucoup en termes de risques. Autre mesure de prévention, l'entretien des berges du Rhône pour maintenir au maximum le cours d'eau dans son état le plus solide et le plus robuste, c'est réglé annuellement par les différentes communes riveraines du cours d'eau. En termes d'intervention d'urgence, on a un système de prévision de crue, on a un système d'alerte, d'alarme, on a défini des seuils, on sait qu'il faut environ 6 heures pour que le Rhône monte en crue et risque de déborder. On peut, pendant ces 6 heures, organiser l'évacuation de la population, ça a été fait, ça a été testé, et on sait qu'en moins de 3 à 4 heures, on peut évacuer les secteurs les plus dangereux. Et on est toujours prêt à le faire, surtout en période automnale où on a les grandes crues de ce type de cours d'eau. Finalement, troisième axe le plus important, la construction du Rhône. Alors la construction du Rhône, pratiquement sur 160 km, pratiquement chaque secteur doit être revu, avec la question de savoir quel est l'aménagement qu'on va amener à ce cours d'eau. La réponse qui a été donnée, c'est de travailler avec trois types de profils sur ce cours d'eau sur 160 km, des approfondissements du fond et des renforcements de digues dans les secteurs où on a la possibilité de le faire avec la nappe phréatique, dans les secteurs où les contraintes sont fortes, où le bâti est dense, où on n'a pas de place pour faire autre chose. Combiné avec des solutions d'élargissement du cours d'eau qui vont amener de la robustesse, qui vont amener de la nature aussi, quelque chose qui est nécessaire du point de vue légal et qui est intéressant du point de vue de l'engineering. Et finalement, des éléments plus ponctuels, d'élargissement plus importants qui permettent à la, à la nature de se développer. Alors à quoi ça ressemble au final aujourd'hui L'exemple ici du tronçon sur le Haut-Valais, on est à 120 km à l'amont du Léman. L'objectif sécuritaire sur ce secteur, c'était de sécuriser la zone industrielle, une zone chimique, fortement urbanisée, densément bâtie aussi. On parle de 2 à 3 milliards de dégâts potentiels. Pour sécuriser ce secteur de 2 km, il fallait travailler sur l'amont et sur l'aval pour éviter que la crue ne déborde à l'amont et pour garantir qu'elle puisse s'évacuer. 8 km d'aménagement de cours d'eau, 160 millions de travaux rapportés aux 3,6 milliards de l'ensemble de la correction du Rhône avec un aspect sécuritaire qui a été mis en œuvre maintenant grâce à l'élargissement sur le tronçon qu'on voit sur cette image. Le cours d'eau a été élargi environ d'une fois et demie pour faire passer environ une fois et demie plus d'eau. C'est la partie sécuritaire, c'est le moteur économique de ce grand dossier, de ce type de projet de protection contre les crues. 
mais il y a un bénéfice et un objectif environnemental. Quand on élargit le cours d'eau, on le voit sur l'image, il y a une dynamique naturelle qui s'installe. Le cours d'eau va reprendre sa place, il est bloqué par deux digues solides, mais à l'intérieur, il y a une morphologie alluviale qui se développe et qui va permettre à la nature de développer des zones pionnières et intéressantes. Et tout ça, ce nouveau paysage, est intéressant pour la population qui va pouvoir retrouver son fleuve, un fleuve pacifié, un fleuve sur lequel il sera intéressant de se promener, de s'opposer, de pouvoir respirer en famille et de finalement de profiter de cette espèce de poumon vert que l'on va construire dans l'ensemble de la plaine du Rhône, sur l'ensemble du linéaire du cours d'eau. Merci pour votre attention. Thank you very much uh, to Tony. Indeed, uh, this is about building back better, <laughs> because that movement to dike and channelize the river started in the 19th century, essentially, at least in Western Europe. A lot of Dutch engineering art and knowledge was exported to Britain, to other countries. But we have started to understand that those solutions are not sufficient enough. Therefore, those heavy investments, but a lot of opportunities also, obviously for different businesses, to build back better. Do we have any questions online? I don't see yet. In the room? Yes, please, if you could give the mic to the gentleman over there. It, it, it's coming. Make sure this is, yes. <clears throat> Thank you to everybody. Those were very, very good presentations. Uh, David, David, I have a, a question for you. I'd be very interested if you could explain the similarities or differences of what you do with eDNA, which is increasing, um, uh, I'm, I'm, something I'm paying attention to, so I'd love to hear your relationship to that. And Thomas, I'd like to hear about your, um, business model in a sense. How do you work with engineering firms to actually go do the work? And how, or are, are you the engineering firm that goes and does the work? I'd be very interested to understand how you, how you connect with, with people to do large scale projects in other countries, for example. Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. That's a very good uh, question that is often asked. Um, with ADNA, you, you probe the, the environment most often in the water, and you get information about the composition of uh, the ecosystem in terms of presence or absence of species. Uh, so you get to know like uh, wh what kind of fish are in this river or in this lake. Or uh, It's not restricted to fish, ob obviously. But wh what we do is not um, assessing uh, general biodiversity in terms of uh, composition of the ecosystem. It's really looking e into each species. So we need to, to catch individuals. And um, w with that, with uh, the analysis of the, the DNA of each, each individual, we can assess level of uh, genetic diversity within a species, within a population, and we can assess how individuals are related and how to, to, to cross this individual together if you carry reproduction. So it's, it's very different, but it's, uh, it's uh, complementary, and uh, I think that there are synergies that can, uh, in between these two technologies for, uh, for, for the future. Is that clear? Okay. So now, how we how he covered works. Um, so we are a small company. We don't have offices in other countries or so on. So we rely with part, uh, on partnerships. We establish partnerships with two types of um, I would say companies. Uh, we've got the consultants first because they're the one who are able to collect the data. So the one who have uh, usually local offices with people with the knowledge of the local situation, and they're able to collect, access the data that we need. We are a small company that is specialized in basically process engineering of nature-based solutions and other water treatment solutions. So this is what we sell. Um, we do not construct. We partner with companies that build the systems. We drive them, we show them how to build properly. We 
we work alongside their construction team to make sure that everything is done properly from uh, selection of the equipment to the um, implementation of the system on the ground. Um, our business model is the knowledge that we have from 25 years of experience of 2,000 systems in dif different, different uh, countries, climates, uh, different type of effluence, different conditions. So we are experts in designing these solutions. But to design a solution, we need partners to basically frame the context, and we need partners, on the other hand, to implement what we design. So usually the company comes and says, hey, I have a, a problem here. I would like a nature-based solution. I think nature-based solution is appropriate. Uh, can it be done? Yes or no? And what kind of solution? what kind of design is possible, and then we make recommendations. Sometimes it's with nature-based solutions, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a combination of different types of solutions. And then we um, help them de deploy, basically implement the, the systems. So does it answer your question? OK, thanks. Yes, please, there are more questions in the room. We are about 40 people in the room, for those who are online. It's for, it's for Michael. Uh, in your project, are you considering all the species of bee? Because, for example, in Switzerland, we have one species who produce meal. It's 40% of pollinization. But we have 60, 39 species who represent 60%. And a lot of them, they are flying around 300 meters where they are. And it's very important. Yeah, very good question. So the, the first point is even when we work with so the domestic bees, um, the data we get, of course, in terms of pollutants, but in terms of plants, enables us to design a project that focuses also on solitary or wild bees. So the actions will, of course, um, enhance the biodiversity for the solitary bees as well. Um, because we will see exactly at what moment of the year there's a lack of biodiversity in terms of nutritional quality, in terms of amount of species, and so on. And the second point is that we also developed a tool to uh, collect the pollen via solitary bees. So that's much more focused on the solitary bee uh, ecosystem, but it responds exactly to the need you're, you're talking about and focusing on these kind of bees as well. Thank you. I think there was another... Question, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much to all for this very interesting presentation. It's also a question to Michael about actually the data sets you're using. How dynamic are they? Are you looking at monthly, yearly types of uh, data sets coming into your system? And second question, could you combine it with other types of data sets from partners who can then bring maybe more deeper understanding of those ecosystems? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So um, I would say in 80% of the cases, we um, we collect so the pollen during a month and a half and analyze all the pollen collecting during this month and a half. So we will have results during the bee season, of, of course, between April and October uh, on this period of one month and a half. But in certain cases, uh, we have clients that need a more specific period of time and so we will limit, of course, the, the, limit, the time and have a more specific uh, analysis for 15 days or something like that. Um, on, on, for the second question, of course, we would love to have more data and share the data and put all the data together. And that's the whole objective also of this artificial intelligence platform with Microsoft is to do data sharing to really um, improve uh, the, the assessment and uh, have more impact. Thank you. Are there more questions in the room, online? Maybe for the last two minutes, I may ask the pitchers to say in two words, as you are relatively close to the generation of the Friday for Futures, uh, how do you, in two words, say what your solution contribute to our main two challenges? And we will come back to that question later during the day. The decline of biodiversity and the climate change challenge. And linked to that, of course, the nexus through the water. 
Please, who, who starts? <laughs> shall, shall we start at this side? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think with our solution, we can contribute to uh, address the decline in uh, biodiversity. Well, not generally, but at least at the fish level. Uh, regarding climate, climate change, uh, we, we cannot do anything with that, but uh, at least with uh, promoting uh, genetic diversity within the species that are important for us, either socially, economically, or that have an importance in the eco ecosystem, we can um, enhance the ability to, of species to cope with, uh, with uh, ch coming changes, because um, as I, I said in my presentation, well, the, the potential of, of adaptation of species really, uh, lies in the in in a strong genetic diversity at the population level. So I think in that way we are uh, addressing a bit the, the issue of this, this decline in biodiversity. Great, thanks. Would you continue, Tony? Et volontiers, de notre côté, ben, on voit que l'aménagement moderne des cours d'eau, qui intègre non seulement l'objectif sécuritaire, l'hydraulique pure, mais aussi les objectifs nature, environnement, socio-économique, ça permet de rétablir une biodiversité et d'avoir la robustesse pour assumer les nouveaux débits. Les débits qu'on connaît depuis quelques décennies maintenant, qui sont plus importants, des crues de plus en plus fortes, et de pouvoir comme ça avoir une réserve de sécurité pour le futur, dans un espace qui est plus naturel et qui contribue à la biodiversité. Donc c'est un espace tout en un, c'est du 3 en 1, sécurité, environnement et socio-économie dans le même mètre carré, dans le même lit du cours d'eau. Merci. Thomas, please. Well, our solutions uh, basically can bring nature back to the cities because they're a highland of nature. So that usually helps quite a lot and they are also very good at adapting to droughts or uh, floods and so on. So they're really resilient and I think they're really made for uh, the future. Merci. And Mark? So yes, uh, our solution is really when you want to renaturate a shore or create something around the lake, then you will, be, you will be able to be sure that the biodiversity will stay here, so that the work you are doing won't be destroyed by the next storm, and thus that's our main piece we are bringing to the puzzle. On the other side, regarding climate change, modeling lake won't help a lot, but we also are able to model discharge in rivers, and so as a future discharge, and so won't fight it, but it would help trying to know what to expect from this charge in the next couple of years or next years. Thank you. Does Michael want to add a statement online? Yeah, just I think if you can't measure, you can't act. And if you don't have data, you cannot involve local stakeholders. And that's really how we respond to the issue, uh, collecting this data, sharing this data to all stakeholders enable them to act on biodiversity, but also for climate change on pollution. Um, and so everything is strongly linked. So we believe that with data and sharing this data, we can have a great change effect. Thank you very well, very much to everybody. <laughs> Thanks for your contribution. I think that was a good start for uh, Day, which will be rich in different presentations. I'm handing happily over to the next session and thank again everybody for their involvement. Thank you so much, Tobias. I might be out of a job. Good work. Thanks to all of you for joining us. All right, we'll give you just a minute to get yourselves together, put those masks back on. That's right. Good job. All right, so now it's time to move this along and get started with our first panel of the day, for which I would like to welcome back Andre Hoffman to the stage, as well as Pavan Sutef, I saw him make an entrance, and Gerard Boss is, ah, here you are. <laughs> I didn't see you back there. All right. Just took it off, yeah? Just took it off. Right. Just, just took it off, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna be the mask police. Like All right, uh, there you go, great. You have a double. <laughs> You're not playing around. <laughs> we have two. Like... 
Okay, feel free to take a seat or stand, whatever you're most comfortable with. Yeah, yeah. I might do a little standing, actually. Do you like? Whatever you want. I'm, I'm mic'd up, so it's okay. Yeah. You, you want to sit? Okay. Yeah. Actually, no, stand. Why not? I don't mean to peer pressure everybody into standing. S I just, sitting on um, the train all morning. But, uh, I yeah. feel less. Okay. <laughs> I feel less um, yeah, constrained when, I'm, when I get to stand. All right. Well, great to see you, gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Andre, we already heard a little bit about you. But for those of you that missed Andre's opening presentation this morning, just very briefly, Vice Chairman of Roche Holding, um, President of Fondacion Mava, Fondacion Tour du Valle de Camar, Board Member of System IQ, Member of the Board of Trustees of the World Economic Forum, among many other things. But today, he's also representing Intent, which is the partner, um, the partner uh, organization of today's event, which is something that he co-founded along with his wife, Rosalie. So, Andre, welcome back. Paban. Thank you. So good to see you again. A scientist by education, an international banker by training, so very diverse background, and an environmental economist by passion. Founder and CEO of GIST, you are also the current president and board chair of WWF International. So during his career, Pavan took time out to lead two landmark UN reports, the TEEB, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, and UN EPs towards a green economy in 2011. And to wrap it up, studied physics at the University of Oxford. <laughs> so <laughs> you're one of these guys who always has some kind of conversation to bring to the table, right? <laughs> Can talk about so many different things. And Gerard Boss, the first time that I have the pleasure of having you on this stage, so it's great to meet you. Head of the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Global Business and Biodiversity Program, otherwise known as the IUCN. But he is responsible for the implementation of IUCN's business engagement strategy and serves as focal point for all business and biodiversity related matters at the um, IUCN. So before joining in 2012, you worked for five years in Barclays Bank in London and Madrid and for 17 years in Wholesome, for Wholesome, one of the largest building materials producers in Europe, USA, and Africa. So also a very diverse background, <laughs> finance, construction, and now we're in biodiversity. I realize there's a link which you can address later on, but <laughs> <laughs> his passion for bringing together different parts of society to find optimal solutions for transformational change is what ultimately led you from your financial uh, path to the IUCN. All right, so before we get started with um, you know, kind of jumping into the subject of biodiversity for business, I, I want to hear what did you take away from this presentation? What did you guys think of, these, of the pitches? But I, I was super inspired. Um, I mean, uh, listening to, to the bee diversity, for me, that's a true example of a nature-based solution. So it's using nature's ingenuity and combining it and linking it to data uh, and artificial intelligence and really seeing on, on how we can leverage on that. Um, I can't thank Thomas uh, for mentioning NBS many times in his presentation. Uh, you know, concept that, that IUCN put on the table uh, and, and wants really to further because we think that's a way to get to the finance world as well uh, by really describing better and having a standard around nature-based solutions. We'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, Tony, I loved your comment to saying engineers love nature. It helps them in making sure that it works. And, and that's a word that we need to get out more because at the moment we're not uh, demonstrating as much as how nature can be an ally to a lot of man-made engineered uh, construction. Um, and, and finally, the three-in-one, you know, being adaptive and resilient, that's where you are bringing both the human ingenuity together with the nature ingenuity. And that's what I really liked as the thread of the various pitches that we heard this morning, and hopefully we'll hear more uh, this afternoon. <laughs> Pavan, what did you take away? I was very impressed. I, I'd read all the presentations on my train. I missed my train this morning, so I wasn't in time to see all of them. But uh, from what I read and from what I saw of the last three, very, very interesting examples indeed. I think the, the uh, ability to scale is really important. So I think where, um, where we are as a group of uh, one of your groups, a group of small group of engineers, scaling out the idea of um, providing 
uh, sort of wetland-based uh, absorption of waste. I think that sort of um, ability to scale, I think, is really important. So I was particularly pleased to see that. Um, and I think overall, um, perhaps you were, you were uh, a little shy of saying how much you can actually um, show for both impacts and dependencies. So I'd like to hark back to Tobias's question right at the end, which uh, was, you know, what do your uh, projects have to do with uh, the two underlying um, uh, boundaries, climate and, and, and biodiversity? I think all of you have impacts on biodiversity, and that's important, but all of you are helping to manage dependencies as a result of climate, because the systems globally that are going to be worst affected and most affected by climate change as it comes, or by climate breakdown as I start calling it, are actually freshwater systems. And in some way or the other, all of you are in some way involved in helping humanity manage those dependencies. So I think in that sense, you are all connected to both these fundamental planetary boundaries of climate change and biodiversity. So congratulations again. Really, really good work. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I'm falling in the usual trap of being the last one to talk because, of course, you all said everything. Uh, but, but, but I, I'll start I, with you next time. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. But, but, but uh, what really sort of uh, impressed me was the fact that we had Tobias, Tobias representing uh, the, uh, the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, coming from this, this school of thinking that what we need to do with nature is to protect it. And then we move uh, seamlessly to these entrepreneurs who are telling us, nature is a friend. We can do something with nature. We can use it. We can create a business model. We can make nature work for us. And so the cohabitation of these two ways, the two approaches, I think worked really well this morning. Because we could really see that this is not just a, uh, um, a, about uh, trying to, uh, what's the word, um, retain something, it's about building something, it's about going forward, it's about uh, investment and it's about, uh, it's about um, uh, sustainable b business models and that's very exciting. I was also very pleased to see the Canton du Valais joining in because of course the, the planners in general have a tendency of being not really too business minded nor too nature minded and to see that uh, we, you, you were, um, I don't know if Tony's still there, if you were, that, that you were able to introduce into your presentation all these elements of fostering biodiversity while helping security issues, while so helping social and human systems and uh, as, as Papan just mentioned, the dependency towards the system, I think that, that's, that's very exciting because it gives us a, a, a way forward, it allows us to in, in many ways to think how we are going to be able to construct this sustainable, this nature based solution, NBS, which we are going to use for, for stability in human um, development. Now, I also would like to add that I'm absolutely petrified to be on stage with these two titans of uh, financial thinking. I mean, uh, I, I'm very much an amateur compared to them. So if you have taken a question, they are the guys. <laughs> Imagine how I feel. <laughs> I'm definitely a bottom of the rung on that one. But um, as, and, and also something, it's, and it's, it's innovation and talent coming out of Switzerland. You know, and there's so much happening here. I mean, just in the Valais region, just what we've seen this morning, what we have yet to see. I mean, I, you know, I'd argue that there is something in the water <laughs> here. <laughs> okay. All right. So as we get back now into our panel, we've already touched on a few of these points. You know, that we're looking at the business opportunities for biodiversity. Um, Pavan, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to hand this over to you. Sure. Um, I believe you had a, a, few, a few words that you wanted to give us. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to, I mean, I have material to share with you because I, I, I'm also passionate about this space personally and this triple intersection of biodiversity, of, of climate leading to freshwater systems because there are these dependency impact connections. And then technology as the enabler and business, as Andre has rightly pointed out, as a force for good, but actually as a force for performance and profit as well. And the two are not irreconcilable. So there's this constant barrage of misinformation and disinformation and wrong information that suggests that somehow or the other you can either be environmentally responsible or you can have development and profits. And I completely refute that logic. It is not logic. It is actually kind of a, a, a strategy of those who can't do things right. Um, I think the, the uh, key takeaways I think we need to come to is that in this day and age, the use of technology as an enabler is not an option. And that's my story, if I may just spend a few moments sharing my story. We, I, I founded a company called GIST. We are basically measuring impacts 
And I want to share with you how we, we measure uh, water impacts. Because any corporation, any company, has got direct and indirect impacts on nature. And those impacts need to be measured because that's where the demand for water is coming from. And excessive demands can lead to problems with residential users, problems with agriculturalists, and problems with uh, companies themselves because of the lack of availability. One of my first and earliest experiences with uh, uh, dealing with large utilities uh, was with Yarra Valley Water. And when I met them for the first time in Melbourne, they are Melbourne's largest water utility. It struck me that they were almost paranoid about uh, doing their business well, not doing their business well. And I realized somewhere along the line that Melbourne had won the, uh, e econ the Economist Intelligence Unit Prize for the fifth time at that point as the most livable city. And guess what everyone thought was the most important aspect of livability was the delivery and availability of fresh water, basically fresh water and sanitation systems. And here was this utility with 1.9 million Melbournean consumers, customers, uh, clearly petrified that if they didn't get it right, they would lose that fantastic rating. But the good news is they got it right for another two years and then somebody else took over. But, um, and this lesson stayed with me. So when, um, when I uh, founded my company and started the business, we realized that in this day and age, to solve any significant problem in sustainability or the environment, you just cannot run away from technology. You need it. You need data, you need information, and you need technology. So we conversely embraced it. Now, of course, I was a bit lucky being an Indian, you know, able to hire from the Indian Institutes of Technology. So we had lots of resources that we could use. But uh, we've made metrics and analysis the basis of our insights. And I want to share with you uh, some of the ways in which we help my company, that is, just helps uh, other companies to understand the issues. The issues you're all familiar with. Three billion people live in agricultural uh, areas and areas, other areas where there's severe water scarcity, and it's been getting worse and worse, in fact, 20% worse over the last two decades. Uh, the CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project, did a survey recently where they said that 75% of all businesses surveyed by them said that water scarcity was a problem. So this is as significant as that. Um, we don't have the right availability other than just going out and measuring. And the good news is that um, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work, for instance, uh, the, the WRI system, Aqueduct, provides water scarcity data at the basin level. But actually, there's a paper by Huang et al., 2018, which has pulled together data literally down to the, to the 50 by 50 area, so literally a grid which consists of 65,000 squares around the planet. And we've digitized that. And my company is in the business of making economic estimates. So here is our map, which we've created. You can see that global map with the different shaded colors. Those colors represent the per cubic meter cost of drawing one cubic meter of water. So it goes from almost nothing in some areas to $18 per cubic meter and, and even higher in some areas. And you can see where the water scarcity has the most significant impact. Now, this is pure economic numbers. But the point is those dollar numbers mean a lot more in places like India, China, and South Africa than they would do necessarily in other areas of in, in the richer parts of the world. So that's a huge significance out there in terms of how you use water and whether you're monitoring it or not, and whether the people who are responsible for the overuse are aware of the fact that they are overusing, and whether their governments and their societies are holding them to account and asking them for exactly the kind of innovations and new technologies and better management systems that all of you whom I've been hearing and whom I've read about are involved in. So, the information that I, I, I present and what my, my company has been busy trying to, um, trying to share with our customers is information which drives people in the right direction in that sense. Um, as I said, measuring scarcity at a basin level is nice, but you know, large systems like the Rhone, I mean, the basin of the Rhone is massive. It's from you know, Switzerland all the way down to the Mediterranean. So we, we can't draw much comfort from that, but you need to measure down to the location. And, Measuring to the location was a challenge 10 years ago. Today, it's possible. We've done it. And, and this, is, this is the good news. And if I can run this, um, how does one run the? Sorry, this is, this is actually meant to be a, a live. There should, there should be a little PowerPoint slide separately that has been sent to you, which enables me to show the live demo as to how our system actually works. Yes, perfect. Now, if I can start this. No.
I'll need to, uh, can you can you activate this? Can you just start the, the there's a little on the PowerPoints. I'm sorry, can't do that. Anyway, anyway, so let me just describe to you what the system does. So basically, you input the data, and the the slide which we'll share with you, so you guys can look at it and see it afterwards. Literally, you put in the data scarcity numbers and uh, water scarcity numbers in terms of how much volume of water you use. You put in the numbers as in how much is is the, the recycled water or how much is the uh, is the uh, rainwater harvesting that you use. The system then literally takes you, and the example that is shared with you is for a company called Novozymes in Denmark, where when you see it and you go to the results page, and the, the demo will show that to you, you will see that we can have worked out not just the impacts in Denmark, which is one of the main locations for the company, because it's a biotechnology firm and it uses water for its products, but also in Tianjin in China. And whereas the effective cost to society of the excessive water use in Denmark is not very much, and most of it goes to the local consumers. It's only a cost of about what we call externalities in economics, the third party costs of doing, doing the business and drawing the water. That's only $300,000. Go across to the factory in Tianjin, we calculated that the answer there is $13 million worth, and that most of it is actually borne by the, the agricultural users in the area of Tianjin. That's the problem. Right? If you look at in terms of percentage, in economic percentages, the externality in Denmark is only 2.5%. Right? Whereas if you go across to China, it's 450%. So the cost that is being borne by the, res the consumers, in this case largely res uh, agriculturalists, is actually four and a half times what the market there, local market, is pricing water. It's a huge problem there. So these are some of the issues that come up when you look at the data. And uh, that's what I think the, the sort of uh, marriage of technology and, and uh, sustainability has, has done for us. And uh, it is not an option. We are not doing this because we are passionate about data. We are doing this because there's no other way of working out good solutions towards sustainability. I think that's the lesson that I've taken away from this. Thanks. Thank you very much, Pawan. Um, yeah, S sobering, <laughs> always. Yeah. These, this information is very sobering, um, but very important to hear and important that we continue to discuss and, and communicate it. Um, along those lines, Gerard, if you can also share with us then, in terms of the Global Business and Biodiversity Program, what, uh, what are you trying to achieve? Where, where are you with this? So, so our, our role as, as being part of IUC and the International Union of Conservation of Nature is really to influence society so that they really integrate nature, value and conserve it. Um, and the business community, um, if you go 10, 20 years back, uh, was finding nature an interesting topic but not really knowing on how to deal with it. And I'm still talking to very large corporations which still say biodiversity, bio what? So there is still a language issue. Now, the good thing in news is when we talk, start talking about nature, yeah, people can relate much better to that. And so, in our business and biodiversity program, we've just laid out three very simple steps. The first one is value biodiversity or value nature, if people prefer the nature word rather than biodiversity. And it's using the tools that, that um, Pavan just described. It's basically making sure that people understand there are impacts on biodiversity, but much more importantly, there are a lot of dependencies. Yep. And it's making them integrating the problem of nature, not as a CSR, as a corporate social responsibility or as a communication topic, but really integrate it and thinking about it, how, do, how much do I depend on nature and what can I do about it to actually be more positive? And that's very interesting because we now see an upsurge of a nature positive movement coming up as well. So that's very encouraging. The second line is what we call deliver biodiversity net gain. So it's actually being able as a corporation to demonstrate that you can actually be biodiversity positive. You can do things, even if you're a mining company or a construction company or an agri food company. And, and by actually having these very tangible projects, concrete examples, sometimes small skills, but hopefully they can be skilled up, then you can demonstrate that, yes, actually, I'm a good citizen as a corporation, and I can contribute to this overall movement to really integrate nature um, uh, more formally in our business models. And hopefully, it will also trigger some thoughts 
within, and let's not uh, be uh, uh, candid about it, the oil and gas uh, companies, for example, to really rethink their models as well. And actually thinking, well, do I need to continue to pump out fossil fuels out of the ground, or are there actually other solutions? And that's where the energy transition is so interesting, and, and we see a, a major shift. And then our third step is that invest in nature. Or now we want to focus it a bit more on invest in nature-based solutions. Where it's actually saying, well, I'm a part of a bigger game. I'm just one of the landscape user next to many other users. Where you've got the individuals, the citizens, the cities, the canton du Valais. And it's actually together that we need to look at what's the optimal use of this finite resources that our planet is. Now, of course, water and the water scarcity is a very good example where you get people to work together and think about it. Um, and it's, it's the same in some of the landscapes where there's a lot of loss of fertility and degraded land, and there you get the people. But actually, these conversations should happen everywhere and by everybody and at all different levels. And that's why I'm so excited to be in this type of events like today, because I'm talking to a lot of very large multinationals and I've got the chance to talk to their CEOs sometimes. But listening to startups, to SMEs, to smaller ventures that are coming with very innovative ideas, new ways of doing things, is probably what we need more of. And we need then to see how we can support you to actually go and convince, together with us, uh, some of these larger corporations on how they can help you scale up and actually broaden your sol solutions to a larger scale. So that's what the Business and Biodiversity Program is trying to do. Wonderful, thank you. And do you, do you think, Andre, then that bio, biodiverse solution, or excuse me, um, yes, nature-based solutions, <laughs> apply to organizations across every domain? I mean, can can they solve this many problems? Well, <clears throat> I mean, uh, maybe it's time to sort of uh, take a step back and not get too much into the the, the technology of it, and to realize the simple thing: uh, we as humanity have sort of di uh, disconnected ourselves from nature. And so the idea of reintroducing into the value creation mechanism is, is still, still needs to be explained, still needs to be, uh, to, to be uh, put into context. Um, we have chosen um, 300 years ago, at the beginning of the industrial age, to measure our performance as society based on short-term profitability. So uh, the models, we, we were talking about dependencies just now, the, 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 the models that we have built up are uh, what, my company is successful, my life is a success if I make loads of money shortly. And that, you know, I'm sorry to use very simple confederation <laughs> compared to what economists would talk about, but, but that is where the system starts getting in trouble. Because if you are measuring just one aspect of the complex phenomenon of the interaction between human and the planet, uh, and when I say the planet, I don't mean just nat natural resources, I also mean, of course, social and human systems, that's when you get into this, uh, this dead end, this, this sort of uh, uh, bottleneck that we are facing at the moment. Um, the pandemic has demonstrated that very clearly. We've spent um, the last 200 years concentrating on to becoming better and better at what we do, better in terms of measurement of, of financial return. Uh, so we specialized, we sort of simplified, we, we went with, with models, and suddenly comes opposite that vision of humanity a small little well, it's not even a living organism, you know, something, a virus. A virus can only survive if it has a host. It does not survive otherwise. And that virus comes, and we are on our knees. The whole system collapses. And I think this is very, a collapse politically, uh, socially, uh, naturally. I mean, it, so, so it, it's, it's, it's interesting to, to use that as a, as a starting point. And if we want to rebuild um, the system in a more resilient manner, we will need to change the way we interact with nature in a broader sense. Nature, again, not only natural resources, but also social and human resources. It's not uh, uh, chance happening that suddenly people are marching in the street and telling us, um, uh, you know, I'm part of a minority. Black Lives Matter, dare I say it, in, in Europe, gender equality. How come that we still have an unequal uh, approach to the social systems? It is because we are measuring the wrong thing. So the, 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 the World Economic Forum has published a statistic saying that half of the world GDP depends on nature, and therefore we should include that. I would argue that 100% of GDP depends on nature, but yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure that's a, that I could demonstrate that. But half we can definitely approve, and the, stat, the statistics are there, are there. So how are we going to be able to um, rebuild this economy? I, I remind you that governments across the planet have decided that to restart the economy, they're going to make huge amounts of money available. 
I don't know, my, my latest count is something, $14 trillion uh, by governments across the planet have been spoken to restarting the economy. Now, I don't know if you know what a trillion dollar is, I certainly don't, it's a lot of money. And, and the idea of introducing that into the system cannot be done with the same uh, spoiled system that we had before. We need to introduce new ways of creating the values that are indispensable. And that's why I'm so excited about the event of today, because we are able to demonstrate, yes, on a small scale, that um, uh, natural-based solutions, uh, nature-based solutions, sorry, are a way to produce uh, um, the, 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 the revenue, the wealth, we need, but spread in a more regional manner, in a more, in a more uh, um, inclusive manner. And I think that's a very important word. We must not underestimate the social impact of, the, of a business activity. And nature has a, a way of inventing this constant balance, this constant balance of different factors. I mean, uh, for, for years, uh, in, in, uh, in the NGOs that have participated about nature conservation, we've, we talked about take, taking nature and keeping it uh, protected. Today we realize that, in fact, you know, that, that uh, picture of nature at one moment changes all the time. It's, you know, nature is chaos. It, it's, it's, it's disorganized chaos. It's, it's a constant equilibrium rebuilding itself. So with our action as, a, as, a, as, a, as, as humans, we have destroyed that sort of mechanism which will uh, allow it to rebalance itself, and we need to help with that. So creating a business opportunity out of nature and using the natural system to help us to create a, 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 an inclusive and, and sustainable activity is, I think, more important than ever. And um, um, I hope that the governments who are going to give all these monies are going to give some green conditionality to them to try to introduce something a little bit more sensible into the way we, 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 we think about the future. So that's natural, nature-based solution as far as I'm concerned. It's much bigger than just nature. Yeah. Absolutely. First, I want to, to rebound a little bit on, on what Andre said and also a comment he, he made um, uh, with uh, Tobias this morning. That there has clearly been a shift in the conservation community. I lived it, you know, in the last 10 years within IUCN, where it was about conserving, safeguarding nature. And now there is a shift of, no, it's safeguarding society that we need to look at. And it's actually both. And, and, and that's the beauty of the nature-based solutions concept, you know. It is for the benefit of nature and trying to restore, of course, biodiversity, um, having a biodiversity net gain, but it's also really for the benefit of the people. And, and why your solutions all make sense and are, um, you know, respond because they are responding to a specific need, a specific challenge out there. And sometimes, you know, from a conservation perspective, we were forgetting about this needs aspect uh, that needed to be uh, uh, tackled. And, and that's the beauty now of the nature-based solutions concept. It starts. Uh, and it has the word solutions in there, which makes it then very attractive to the uh, finance world. But the problem is, for the moment, we're still not 100% able, uh, and we're working with a lot of different experts, on how do we translate all this information to make it digestible and understandable by the finance community. Uh, of course, there are some impact investments. Uh, there is the philanthropists that are willing to invest in nature because they see the value. Uh, they have been uh, part of some of these conversations. But the mainstream banker, the mainstream investor is still saying, yeah, but what's the nature equivalent of carbon? You know, can you give me a CO2 equivalent? And nature is not as simple. So we need to come back and work with them on actually uh, uh, clarifying some of these elements. And that's where, again, we need your ingenuity, your examples of projects that have demonstrated how nature or the inclusion of nature in the solution has actually been more profitable economically profitable with your stakeholder uh, engagement, profitable for the planet ultimately, because there are a lot of additional co-benefits that are out there that we still don't measure, the more societal co-benefits, but now we are also trying to put a value on it uh, and bring it in there. But the area of water is a brilliant area for that because the value of water now gets better realized. Pavan illustrated to us the value of water in the Rhone Valley is not the same as in some of very high water scarce uh, areas, yeah. but we can reconcile these things. And, and, it, and it can change. And it can the, change. The <laughs> sadness of climate change is that it is a big driver of different outcomes and impacts. And as both of you have pointed out, some of the biggest outcomes and impacts are going to be on freshwater systems. I mean, the, the, 
The sad thing is that some of the richest nations in the US, I heard a statistic just yesterday that 2.2 million people in the US still do not have adequate and clean drinking water. So, I mean, clearly, if we are unable as a society to deliver the most fundamental resource of human life, then clearly we need to challenge ourselves with thinking differently, thinking better. You mentioned uh, as one of the challenges, I think, Gerard, or maybe it was Pavan, um, this, one of the challenges, but maybe one of the things that really need to be looked at is how to help these organizations scale up. That's the, that is the big question. How do we, how do you support them? Is it through increasing green financing? Is it communication? Is it, you know, um, what, what is the best go-to mechanism at the moment? Is it measuring? Well, uh, yeah, well, I mean, you go first, but certainly measuring has a role. I mean, measuring has a role, but it's not the only thing that you do, right? So, but we have a fundamental problem, I think, and Andre both mentioned it and hinted on it, that we are, we are constantly so fixated on A, profits, and B, short term, that we fail to understand the difference between value and price. Price is what you pay. Value is what you receive. Nature delivers huge amounts of value to you every day, which doesn't come through any price-making system, doesn't come through any market. It's just nature. And our inability to understand this fundamental econ 101 difference between price and value is the source of so many stupidities around the planet. It is just unbelievable. It makes me sometimes feel that, you know, we should re name ourselves, you know, we should stop calling ourselves homo sapiens, which means wise person, but rather maybe, you know, homo stupidus, homo, homo stupidus or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I think the, the coming back, sorry, digression, but the measurement point is really important. We have to measure the total performance. If we look at any of your different projects, whether it's engineering or biodiversity or whatever it is, if we look at your performance purely from the point of view of how much extra sh profits did you make for your shareholders this year and stop there, then we won't understand the true impacts of the business model that you are creating. And to capture the impacts of that business model, you need to measure performance of the corporation in a much more holistic way, in a sort of four-dimensional way. What does this business do for shareholders? Sure, important. What does it do for employees, human capital creation, development training, and, and so on, and downstream? What does it do for nature? Is it adding or is it subtracting to the availability of nature's goods and services over time? In your cases, all of them, from what I can see, were adding, not subtracting, compared to the sort of standard approach that, that our economy follows today. This needs to be measured and accounted for and reported. So when you report performance in future, I'm hoping, uh, with the collective efforts of everyone, that the reporting of performance will mean four dimensions, not just profits for shareholders, not just um, impacts on, on human health and education and skills, but also impacts on society and impacts on nature. These are all measurable nowadays. So the, you know, the excuse that this is complicated, this is difficult. Yes, it is complicated. Yes, it's difficult. Get used to it, my friends. Life is complicated and difficult. So this is now the way forward. And I think the more people begin to accept that performance of the company is not just about profits and not just about short term, the easier it will be for us to bring nature to where she deserves to be, which is right up front. So, so to complement on that, uh, Pavan, I would say now is the moment for action. It has been very interesting that we've had a very interesting one and a half year. I mean, it's my first live event and I'm super excited because it, it just, just changes so much. I've done a lot of Zooms, a lot of, of internet meetings, but when you don't have an audience, it's much more difficult to pass on the message. Um, so now we need to get together again. And in, in the last year, we probably had a lot of time to think, a lot of time to reflect. Um, we probably sold a little bit some of our actions, but nature hasn't. That's also very interesting on what has happened and how nature has recaptured some of their some territories. Of space, yeah. So what we are doing in Switzerland, for example, is through the Business and Biodiversity Program with a few other partners, Engageability um, or Infinitude, we're trying to put together companies, but also uh, local players in Switzerland to actually think together about implementing nature-based solutions. And we are setting ourselves a target to actually develop 100 nature-based solutions in Switzerland, or at least linked back to the value chains in Switzerland, so that they can resonate outside the world. Just demonstrate the leadership of this country with all the ingenuity that there is, and being examples to others, so that we can demonstrate all these theories that we've got out there, all these measurement tools that are out there, when they're applied on the ground, they actually work, well, yeah. and they actually demonstrate this, this value. So we are really inviting you, and I'm inviting Andre indirectly, you know, to have an innovate for nature soon, 
where we can then start demonstrating or at least spark these nature-based solutions with the cities of Zurich, with the airport of Geneva, with the Canton du Valais on the Rhone area to actually demonstrate, yes, we are able to deliver nature-based solutions. These are all the benefits the way we demonstrate. And we're even able to get then some of the financiers on the ground with their boots to actually go and uh, finance these and then really help thinking about how to duplicate that further. Now, very interestingly, we've got already three or four very large multinationals with their headquarters in Switzerland that are already part of that group. So they will be then the ambassadors throughout their whole network being present in 60 or 70 countries in this world. So that's what we're trying to offer with the Swiss Base for Nature, leveraging on the Swiss expertise to, to a certain extent, but being a loudspeaker for things that need to happen uh, in, the, in the rest of the world. And it is very interesting that sometimes nature-based solutions and conservation actions, we always think about you know, the global south going in Africa, going in Asia, um, of course, you know, a lot of actions needs to happen uh, there. But we shouldn't be forgetting about our very well-developed and managed mm. world mm. and where the status of biodiversity for Switzerland is not good. Mm. And we really need to address that. So I just wanted to bring that down to very practical next steps as well. Absolutely. That's, the, that's also the objective of today. So, so thank you very much. Andre, Innovate for Nature. Well, I think that some, uh, the conversation about business is a crucial conversation here. Um, you know, we were talking about the amount of money that governments or elected people have, uh, have made available for starting the economy again. Um, the, 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 the future, uh, the next, at least the next decade, will be based on these uh, private-public uh, partnerships. You know, the governments are making money available, but they don't really know how to, so, to tackle the issue. Uh, we will need this entrepreneurial drive who, who will be able to sort of uh, uh, well-direct it to concentrate on to creating proper value, not just financial value, but mm. proper value that we can, um, uh, so not just price, but value as we were just discussing, so that uh, uh, big, you know, uh, business can be part of the solution, and I'm, I'm very, very much convinced that it is. Um, the, the thing that uh, strikes me is if I, t if I talk about the big companies that Gerard was just referring to, uh, today if you run a business just based on the principles of two years ago, uh, you are confronted with three uh, uh, headwinds. I mean, uh, your employees are asking you all the time, you know, why are we doing this? Is there something that needs, you know, uh, making money into the, the I don't know, uh, uh, into the Le Valais is not going to be enough. I need to know why I'm there. I mean, uh, secondly, the customers, I mean, the, the people who consume the goods that this company produces are all asking the same question. I don't want to, to kill the planet by consuming your product. Please help me. Um, you know, and, and now uh, the financial uh, community is more and more asking this question. We were talking about CSR before. If you go back to the ESG, the environmental uh, society and governance issue, I mean, this is huge. Today, um, if you launch a fund and you don't have an ESG logic, you are not going to be able to raise the funds you need. And that's a major shift, and that happened in the last two years. I mean, the G7 have just met, and the, the finance ministers have issued a communique where the word climate was mentioned 15 times. Not enough nature, but climate was mentioned 15 times. And that, that you know, that, that, that's insignificant. If you add to that, and we are here in the university, if you add to that the fact that everybody under 20 is absolutely no willing to compromise, not only uh, uh, do they want change, they want it now, and they're probably not, not uh, and it probably makes sense for them to do that. If you combine all this, how can you continue to pretend that the big corporation is following the needs of society and satisfying customer needs? They are not anymore. And so the challenge is really in, in, on that level. How do we adapt? the big corporate model to be able to, to, to be sustainable. So rather than talking just about nature, business solution, talking about the protection of nature or conservation, let's talk about durability. How do we build a human system that will allow us to survive the next generation? We are that close to disaster. And I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, uh, some young startups are coming with piecemeal solution, which we are going to, I hope, be able to integrate into a new way of functioning for society. Thank you. Uh, I just, uh, we're almost out of time in the panel, so I wanted to make sure that yeah. we had time for one or two burning questions. Anybody in the room? Have a, oh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, do you want to <laughs> run you, over you that mic? Did you? <laughs> All right, we'll get back to you. Well, I, I, time. I realize that we, we, we're slowly going away from water. Maybe you want to come back to water. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Michael. 
And um, you mentioned, uh, Pavan, the, the, the difference between price and value. And uh, Jean, I think you uh, said the, the difference between preserving society and preserving environment. And if I take the, the utilities, which are highly subsidized, and as a result, the, the, the negative side is that it has nearly no price. So the, the price is very low uh, compared to externalities, which means we waste a lot of water, for and example. A lot of waste, yeah. And on the other side, if we don't subsidize it, mm. we get to the point where, uh, as you mentioned, uh, people have no access to drinkable water or mm. hygiene. Mm. So how would you square that fact? And mm. Do you think there's a way to raise awareness um, in another way than just hitting on the wallet? Thank you. Yeah, there is. The Happy to start. Um, so we were commissioned by the um, uh, EU uh, Commission to work on a project that's called We Value Nature. And it's really a campaign on raising awareness of the importance of valuing nature. And of course, there is a tendency by the economic actors to Im immediately go to economic values. Um, what we are trying to do is to say, well, there are different types of values that need to be integrated in there. But what's really important is the societal value and the awareness raising on what is it in it for me in a certain sense. And as Andre was saying, it's very interesting to see also now really the employees and the consumers being pushing um, uh, for that and, and needing the, the, the fact to, to realize that values has got different forms and existing values is also an important element uh, in there. And what we realized is that effectively we were t saying the same, but using very different terms or jargons, or even more generously, using the same term, but meaning a completely different thing. And that's again where I'm still coming back to nature-based solutions or some of the efforts that have been shown. Why are these ideas so good because they've gone really through a stakeholder engagement. They've worked with the local people, with the indigenous people, with the local communities, and then with the actors that are coming in there to go there. I've got a small, small anecdote to tell, uh, if, if I may. I, I was privileged to be on a Vision 2050 exercise of WBCSD back in 2010. And we came with very big corporate boots to Mysore, which is just outside of Bangalore, and is actually the watershed for the Bangalore city. And we heard from self-help groups there that they had hydrologists, they had World Bank, they had so many experts come there with solutions. But none of them listened to them. Mm. And the moment that they started to figure out, you do this, you do this on this mountain, I do that, I've got cattle, I can give you this piece of land, that they came up with their solution on how to organize that landscape, it worked beautifully. It was still pretty close to some of the projects that were set out by the hydrologists of the World Bank and all these specific institutes, but it needed the people on the ground to actually implement that. And I think that that's where we're going to solve the issues of the utilities, you know, realizing the true and real value of water. And that needs to be explicit even more and more. And IUCN has put quite a lot of effort uh, in there and there's brilliant infographics that we can send you on that. But that's the n really the nut that needs to be cracked further is the value of nature needs really to be recognized by all and by all economic actors. And in specific response to your question on subsidies and what, not every subsidy is bad, nor should every subsidy be permanent, nor should it be done in a, in a manner that is a watering can approach where you basically water the subsidy across. So again, taking an example, Yarra Valley Water, which I know well, they do have subsidies for households which are identified through technology as being income stressed. So they actually specifically subsidize those households to be able to get cheaper water. And not only that, give them further credit as against a normal three month turnaround, they are given six, six months to pay their bills. And that's targeted subsidies and targeted credit to the households which are stressed to enable them to survive. And in the process, they insist that they educate them on better use of water. So you see, there are ways of uh, creating market-based mechanisms, technology-based solutions in weaving that into the construct rather than just boom, okay, we're going to make water cheap of everyone, including the richest industries who are wasting it. That doesn't make sense, right? So this, comp this whole idea that we have to work in partnership with communities with using technology to identify where the needs are, where equity is, is stressed, 
and, and where uh, resources are stressed, and then provide solutions. Markets should be an enabler. Markets should not be the be-all and end-all or the ultimate goal of everything. The final purpose is not to convert everything into one price, which applies for everyone. That's just mind-bogglingly stupid. Sorry, <laughs> repeat it. <laughs> We've got time for one more question. Frank? Thank you. Um, it's more a comment or a provocation rather than a question. Um, if I take this apple, um, how many of us, of us all, could say how much biodiversity this apple is containing? I come from Italy um, in, in a region where the apples are produced massively. And if I go there, when I go there, I don't find a lot of biodiversity. I find a monoculture, just apple trees everywhere. A lot of pesticides are used to, ha to have an apple very nice to see and probably very sellable in, if you go to the grocery. So um, it's a provocation or comment. So I think, yes, the corporates, should, we should incorporate in the system and ask them to take action. But we all, as consumers, I think, are in the same, on, on the same carpet. We also have, when we go to, to buy something, ask ourselves, how much biodiversity am I buying here? Because maybe if this apple wasn't so nice to see, with some bugs maybe, a little bit, but maybe it could have more biodiversity inside rather than this apple that seems perfect, but then the, the impact of this apple on the local community, on, the, that, re, on, on that valley is, is not so, 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 so nice. So thank you. I, I know we're out of time, but Frank, to reassure you, the big agri companies have realized this. And there is a big group out there, which is the One Planet Business and Biodiversity Group, which have really realized the agri-system is broken. We have forced or gone to a monoculture and only relying to feed the world only on seven crops. And that needs to be changed. We need to move to regenerative agriculture. That's the term that they use. Um, and, and it's very large, big corporates that are driving this effort. But it needs to happen with the farmers, because it's the farmers' practices that need to be changed. And that's, again, boots on the ground, working with the farmers to actually create net positive farming. But that movement is on the run. <laughs> so, uh, if, if, I mean, innovate for water, innovate for nature, innovate for the food, food. system. I mean, the food yeah. system really <laughs> needs really attention. Really seriously needs it. Yeah. I mean, somebody was mentioning the statistic, you know, the totality of the beef produced in the U.S. comes from two bulls in 1970. I mean, the fragility of that system is just absolutely incredible. But anyway, I just wanted to end up on a note of excitement. This is not all negative. This is all not. I mean, we are realizing the issue, the challenges in front of us. We want to go on doing something about this. And the Innovate for Water is about this. There is an opportunity there which we can seize. And if business seizes it in the right dimension, we are going to, 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 to improve the situation. And we are going to create this long-term thinking of a regenerative activity which, which is sustainable. So please, no, don't, don't get too doom and gloom. This is an opportunity. It's not just a cost. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Nothing left to say <laughs> other than thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today. To all of you for participating, it is now time for our coffee break, first one of the day. So I invite you to head out, mask on, please, grab a coffee, do some networking. Remember, left, right, left, no food, no drink, free to move around, right, there's drinks, but you got to pick a table and stay there. So remember those things. And of course, to all of you joining us online, you can now hit your virtual lounges and also do your own networking and probably have your, your coffee or your tea brewed from home. So, <laughs> all right, we'll see you everybody back in about 45 minutes at 11. Thank you so much.
been chilling, watching the ocean with you. Baby, up with a slow motion crew. And we up in the growlings when people change, but not us. And we just chilling, kicking it, kissed by the sun. Could be soaked to the skin in the monsoon. I know she got the good vibes when seasons change, but when.
trying hard, but you want to be my friend. Ain't no place to hide, ain't no one to run to. Here we go, here we go again. Call my bluff, I'm going to be here till the end. I'm the one you ride, I'm the one you ride to. If you
came crashing down all around this empty town i'm searching for the lost and found but you don't care you're unaware keep moving like the scars aren't even there it's in the air like a blazing flare Points in blaming you, you did not know
Took a swing at a wrecking ball and I prayed for my downfall and I found a way to reconcile Cause in my heart it's not worthwhile It's a bloody battlefield where some go down, others heal In the end it's all the same All you can do is play the game Give me out of broken hearts and start a 
Là on n'est pas live encore. Hein. On n'est pas live. Moi j'aimerais juste faire une petite annonce dans le micro. Ah, donc si je parle les instants aussi. So we are going to start uh, soon the, the session. Uh, I would like to ask the next speakers, uh, Igor and Luigi, to come and see me uh, because we need to prepare for the, for the next session in 45 minutes. All right, I am getting the signal now to welcome you all back from that short <laughs> break. I hope that you were able to network, connect, meet people, grab a coffee, that it was a productive time for you. And now we're going to move on with the day. Um, it's time then for another pitch session. This one is on innovation and impactful, innovative and impactful water technologies. And leading the session to my right, I've got Christian Surbrug, he is from Erbag, and today is representing Swiss Water Partnership. And since you're already set up, as are your pitchers, I can see, welcome everybody. I'm just going to let you take it away. I'll see you later. Yeah, thanks very much. So welcome to all. Thanks very much for being here for this next exciting session. Also for everybody who is online, uh, don't hesitate to, when we have the Q&A, to then also ask questions online. Uh, of course, it's a difficult format, but we'll try to get over it as, as, as well as possible under these circumstances. Um, so maybe to start off with myself, um, I'm from Erbach, so the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology based in Dübendorf, uh, next to Zurich. But today I'm representing the Swiss Water Partnership. And before I start handing over uh, to the pitches, um, I would like to just use this opportunity to quickly present the Swiss Water Partnership for those of you that don't know it, and, um, and then we'll move on from there. Okay, so the Swiss Water Partnership is uh, a group, I would say, of actors in Switzerland uh, all around water. Um, I think they're the main actors in Switzerland, but there might be some missing. So if you feel like you're also one of those actors in Switzerland, which are working on international water issues, uh, but also water issues in Switzerland, please do get in contact with the Swiss Water Partnership. It might be an exciting opportunity. And the idea is to really kind of build a community of practice, build a network, build a group, which has this Swiss expertise on water, uh, which can also propagate this into the world, uh, can also create a dialogue, can create a body of discussion but also um, a group of, of learning in Switzerland. So we are kind of organized, we have kind of three pillars of activities, as you see here. Uh, on one hand, this aspect of having a strong Swiss voice, but also this aspect of a dynamic learning platform, 
where we interact among each other, but also with external actors to kind of build our knowledge further. And then uh, this aspect of the water dialogue. Just to give you a few examples, um, so what we did, for instance, was this feedback, this consultation on SDG 6, on the water uh, SDG uh, for Switzerland. Um, also, we're very present in a lot of international conference, predominantly, of course, uh, World Water Week in Stockholm, uh, where we're always present with a booth and with sessions. Also, this year, we'll be having sessions and uh, different events during the year, uh, this aspect of dynamic platform. Um, when you look at our membership, what you see here is that um, it's, I would say, 50 around 50% is private companies, so uh, either consultancies, um, but also um, larger industrial companies. Um, and then a larger share is also nonprofit organizations, and then there is academia and some um, other groups, um, especially networks or professional associations, which are part of this community. Um, you might not see the details of this slide, which is not very relevant, but what, you want to, what we want to show here is the areas of expertise around water, and you see really that they're very varied and quite, and quite broad. So that goes not only from technological aspects of water supply or sanitation, but really to watershed management, to political aspects, um, to policy issues all around, all around the theme of water. Um, here, um, also, one aspect that we kind of are trying to propagate further as well is to connect uh, partners, but also to conduct study tours um, and also, of course, um, virtual exchanges, webinars, for instance, on, in, on the last uh, Water Day uh, in March, where we conducted a, a webinar um, looking at water, water issues, water quality issues, on one hand, in Switzerland, what are the challenges that are, we are facing, and then also internationally, and kind of see what kind of synergies can be, can be developed between these kind of two geographical contexts. Um, some key activities here, Stockholm World Water Week, a study tour with, the, uh, with Asian in, in 22, is, that's planned, uh, the World Water Forum that's coming up in Senegal, of course, in March, and uh, one special activities where we're really trying to reinforce our youth activities, where we engage with youth. So we kind of set a lot of focus on leadership for tomorrow. We would like to, I would say, foster and engage the youth in uh, projects, in giving them opportunities to also participate with a voice into this partnership and also into kind of structuring the pathway of this, of this community um, also for the future. So that was my very short brief on the Swiss Water Partnership. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, we have the Secretariat. Marisa here is, in, uh, is here. She's, I think, also online available for, on the table of the Swiss Water Partnership, as far as I know. So if you want to join online onto that table to ask questions, to get more information, please do so. So with that, I would like to continue and maybe just give you an outline of the structure of this session. So what we have are two times uh, five pitches, and in between we'll have a keynote presentation um, of the Solar Impulse Foundation, which will, which will be held uh, through, a, through a film. And uh, for the first five pitches, after the first five pitches, we'll have a, a, a short Q&A session of 10 minutes. Uh, before we then show the movie, and then we move to the next uh, group of five pitches, where again, at the end, we will have a Q&A session. So please remember your questions for the individuals. Um, depending on time, we might fit in one or two questions, but not more. So please reserve your questions for the Q&A session at the, at the end of the five-person block. So I hope that's all clear. And then uh, with that, I think we can just move on. And um, I'll quickly hand this over to you. Thank you. So our first speaker is uh, Camille Cruze from Himag In. Uh, so talking about next green standard solution for water treatment. So please, Camille. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Camille Cruze. I am a CEO of uh, the young company Imagine, based in Grenoble, France. Imagine proposes the next green standard solution for water treatment. 
Imagine addresses one of the major challenges of water treatment, how to go deeper in water quality. If current systems are really efficient to treat the main part of pollutants, water quality is still compromised by traces of pollutants called micropollutants. I am sure you know some of them if I said pesticides, drug residue, or heavy metals. Micropollution is an emerging hazard very hard to deal with because found in every water uses and found at very low concentration. We at Imagine focus first on the treatment of heavy metals such as arsenic, one of the 10 chemicals of major health concern according to WHO. The treatment of micropollutants is already quite a large segment, market segment, about 10 billion dollars per year, about one third of the market of chemicals for water treatment. Unfortunately, one of the common and current standard solutions for the treatment of these micropollutants is based on the use of activated carbon. But every time we produce one ton of carbon, we emit up to nine tons of CO2. Facing this issue, Imagine proposes to water treatment actors to move from this carbon economy to a more sustainable one by proposing a solution based that can answer market and societal challenge together. We propose the use of a magnetic iron oxide called magnetite as a ultra-fine powder. We propose a product that is widely known for its ability to catch a wide range of pollutants. Unfortunately, this magnetite is today not available on the market at competitive cost. This is where Imaging brings this technology to try to disrupt the market and propose a new process for this production. We develop a patented process based on a circular economy approach. We are able to produce this magnetite with the required properties for water treatment by using as raw materials industrial waste coming from the steel making and steel processing industry. We try to have a positive impact. Every time we, we produce one ton of magnetite, we are able to upcycle about one ton of ferrous waste. With this ton of magnetite, we can remove up to 25 kilograms of arsenic in wastewater. Imagine position itself as a supplier of this reagent, of this adsorbent material for water treatment operators such as Suez or Veolia. We together answer the need of end users that have to face heavy metals in their wastewater. As I mentioned before, we today focus first on the treatment of heavy metals present in industrial wastewater as very low concentration, up to few milligrams per liter. We target first segments such as steel making, surface treatment, or mining industries. We propose a product that will be used as a tertiary treatment in the water treatment process to remove the traces of pollutants before releasing the water in the natural context. Concerning the team, Imagine is today composed of three partners with PhD engineering background fully dedicated to the company. So I, Camille Crouze, as CEO, my colleague and partner, Philippe Boutet, as COO, and Céline Bono, in charge of the lab, as CTO. We also have a board with two senior researchers, experts in the process we are developing, and two entrepreneurship and marketing experts. Imagine is a young company created in 2019. On that year, we won the largest French innovation context for innovation called iLab. With this award, we were able to start the company, to build our team, and increase our production capacities. We are now able to produce about two tons of magnetite per year and use this production for sending samples to test our magnetite in different contexts. What we are looking now is to multiply proof of concept to demonstrate our solution with customers, and we want to do it with, in, with industrial companies or water treatment operators facing trace of heavy metals in their wastewater. Thank you for your attention. Feel free to ask me your question now or later. Thanks. So thank you very much, coming. So I won't, I won't go for questions now. As I said, please reserve them for the Q&A session. Uh, our next speaker is Michael Siegert. Uh, he will be an, he's online. Yes, I am. Hello. Okay, Michael, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity here today. I'm very excited, uh, although it's online. But uh, what I would like to use this chance for is to present this hydroel project that I'm working on for quite a number of years now, for 10 years, I should say. And uh, it's still a project. It will become a company in September. 
So this is also an investment opportunity. I would like to hi highlight this at the end of the uh, presentation. You will get some contact data. If you're interested in a good return on investment, uh, that is your chance. Next, please. So as mentioned, uh, we are a uh, resource recovery company. Uh, we are recovering resources in the form of energy. There is a lot of energy produced in the form of wastewater here in the Rhone catchment area, especially also in the canton of Valais. There's 35,000 tons of cheese produced every year in the Rhone catchment area in Switzerland. And you have to keep in mind that one kilogram of cheese produces uh, 10 liters of wastewater. And the solution to that problem cannot be that we all stop eating cheese. I wouldn't love to do that. But what we could do is we could incentivize the water treatment of course, what happens at the moment is that the uh, treatment plants, they are at their capacity limits and the cheese makers then don't know what to do anymore with their wastewater. So what they do is they truck the wastewater across the country uh, in order to find a few free spot in the wastewater treatment plant where they can accept this very energy rich wastewater. It's a very energy rich wastewater, I would like to say, uh, because it has 100 to 200 times more organic content than municipal wastewater. And if you were able to capture that, we would produce uh, one gigawatt hours per year of energy only from this wastewater, and we would save 300 tons of CO2 uh, using this wastewater. I think this is a great opportunity. Next, please. It's not only about cheese, it's about the food and beverage industry in general. Uh, everybody who produces this very rich uh, wastewater. Here's an example of a winery in Germany. They pay 250,000 euros every year only to get their wastewater treatment. But uh, this wastewater that they are producing is actually an asset. Uh, so they, they pay a lot of money in order to get an asset removed from their, from their books. And I think that's a shame because they could use it using our technology. What happens is that uh, the water that is produced goes into the clarifier uh, and then the energy comes into the aeration uh, where the organics are removed and uh, then the sludge is produced again. There's a lot of energy that goes into this uh, process before everything can be discharged safely into the environment. And we are going to reduce the energy consumption in the subsequent processes by plugging in our system in the very beginning. Next, please. So what we do is we do a microbial electrolysis. Um, that's not magic. It's uh, you notice from from high school most likely it's electrolysis. You put two electrodes in water. You put on the switch, and then you're producing hydrogen and oxygen. The difference here is that because it's microbial electrolysis, we have a biocatalyst that's producing CO2 from the organics in the wastewater. And as soon as you have CO2 and hydrogen in the wastewater, you're producing inevitably biogas because of the microbes that are around. So we're using that in order to have a process which I would call anaerobic digestion on steroids. Next, please. It's a huge market. Um, what you see here is 5% of the treatment costs in only these segments, uh, cheese, beer, and wine. And I think 5% is a realistic figure in order to capture. And that's also a message to the investors here. Uh, it's an interesting opportunity. Next, please. How are we going to tackle this market? What we are going to do is we are going to use the help of engineering procurement companies that are based on site. Uh, they know the customers, they know the regulations, they know the habits, and they know the pain points. And this is why we need an engineering procurement company. Locally, what we will do is we will supply them with our electrodes, we will license our technology because we have patents pending. The systems will be deployed at the end user. And that's also where the value is generated at the end user because um, energy and waste, uh, energy and water are extracted from the wastewater. This goes back, a part of it, uh, to the EPC, our partners, and uh, to Hydrel in the end. Next, please. We do have some traction, so we are here based in Val de Bagna at the wastewater treatment plant of the Altis Utility Company. We are very happy to have that opportunity because we learn a lot about the, the, the pains that uh, the utility company is facing and also about the uh, pains of the cheese makers here. I see them every day bringing their, their, their cheese way to the treatment plant and it's at the capacity limit. So we have a small pilot with a Valesian cheese maker in the uh, pipeline. Uh, we also have a, a bigger pilot with the Altus Utility Company. And we're talking about a pilot uh, with the German EPC uh, about uh, a, wine, uh, a winery there. Thank you very much. Next one, please. 
Who are we? Um, we are a company that is intended to make profit. Uh, so we will have a revenue in 2027 of about 20 million. And as more as we become, uh, the more profitable we become, the more wastewater we also treat. Uh, we'll treat about 4 million uh, cubic meters of wastewater, uh, save about 80 million, uh, 80 gigawatt hours per year. And we will also save, and that's the most important part here, I think about 20,000 tons of uh, CO2. And I think that's also my message to the uh, Fridays for Future here. Yes, we're capitalists, but we can also capitalize on uh, benefiting the environment. However, this is not for free. Uh, we need investment 1.1 million in the seed round and 4.7 in uh, the A round. Um, if you think that is something uh, that interests you, please get in touch. Next one, please. Uh, who are we? So we are a team of uh, uh, engineers and scientists who know the technology very well. However, myself, this is not my first attempt uh, to, to launch a company. I have another one, company running at the moment. Um, there's Pina, she has an MBA, so we are quite diverse. And I think uh, we are very well equipped in order to tackle the market. Next one, please. If this is interesting for you, reach out uh, to me or and um, we have a minimum ticket size of 100K. Uh, we'll have an exit planned in 10 years. And I think for, especially for the early investors, we have a very interesting return on investment. If that sounds something that you would like to invest in, uh, please get in touch. Thank you very much. Next one, please. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks very much. We'll take questions at the end, so please stay online and uh, keep, keep in touch. Um, we'll move straight on to the next pitch. The next pitch is by Olga Trukina from Retriva APFL. Olga, the floor is yours. Thank you. Pres Olga's presentation. Okay, there we are, all set. <laughs> Hello everyone, we are chemists, we are scientists, and this is why we are very much interested in, to, in solving serious problems such as water contamination or, extrac or extraction of precious metal from waste. So we developed a solution, which is a material which can do both. You can imagine its structure is like this, it's highly porous, highly crystalline, adsorbent material resembling a sponge. Metal centers are connected to linkers propagating in space. When such a framework is put together with a special polymer, this material can do very interesting things, such as extraction of gold from its soluble form from electronic waste and sewage sludge. We can accumulate quite a significant amount of gold in our sponge and this is why we believe it's very promising. If we further modify such a polymer chemically, this material can also be used to decontaminate drinking water from toxic elements such as lead, cadmium, mercury, and the others. So we thought such a material is, uh, can find uses in several applications, being few of them, metal refineries, electronic waste recyclers, and any other industry which is using gold anywhere in their processes and want to reduce carbon footprint. Given the recycled gold market is estimated at $5 billion per year by 2050 worldwide. So we thought to bring this technology from the lab to market and uh, we demonstrated that we can produce such a sponge on kilogram scale. Now, nowadays we are supported by EPFL InnoGrant for customer validation and uh, we are doing also market assessment. We aim for a pilot demonstrator with an industrial partner starting this year. Uh, we thought, how can we do it? We should probably found a startup, which will be likely called Retriva, and we will be offering customized gold extraction units for metal refinery applications. Also, we can target extraction of other precious metals, not just gold. Given the cost of sponge production, it's very low. In a competing solution, we outstand any existing uh, commercial adsorbent based on several performance metrics, which the capacity being one of the most important 
among them. And thanks to this capacity, we can say that with gram, one gram of sponge, we can concentrate one gram of gold. As such, we, uh, we believe we can be at least five times cheaper than any existing adsorbent for recovery of one kilogram of gold, for instance, by uh, bringing the precious metal back into production cycle, we help render, render economy circular, and we are also contributing to the environmental impact. With one gram of sponge, we can save one ton of rock from mining, of course, depending on the mining grade of the place, uh, which, however, can be translated into almost four tons of CO2 emission. We are a group of uh, uh, Professor Wendy Quinn, Laboratory of Functional Inorganic Materials, and Retriever is still a project until customer validation is completed. In terms of regulations, we believe we are at the right time with our solution because all these market players, they recently joined Swiss Better Gold Association and due diligence obligations for metal supply chain entered in force in Europe beginning of this year and probably Switzerland is going to be next. So please reach out to us if you are in industry dealing with precious metal loss or you are in industry which uses gold anywhere during their processes and you want to decrease carbon footprint. We, we are very open to know about funding opportunities to run the pilot and the circular economy accelerators. Also, any, uh, anyone who is expert in business who would like to coach us and participate in the project. We are still interested in developing a solution for water decontamination. For such activity, we are supported by Swiss Water Foundation to make a sponge which is, can be useful in the apparatus like this installed in Senegal. We are located in EPFL in Sion, just next to the river. This, I'm Olga, these are my contact details, and we hope to continue positively contribute to most challenging environmental problems with our smart chemistry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. Excellent. Uh, we'll just move on, keep going. Uh, our next speaker is also online. It is uh, Fabio Hütter from EvoDrop. Uh, talking about an effective water treatment systems for each point of use. Fabio, are you with us? Yes. I'm okay, the, word, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. My name is Fabio Hüter. I'm the co-founder and head of research of development from EvoDrop AG. Next slide, please. The history of EvoDrop uh, started at my mechanical engineering studies in 2017. Um, I founded the Ubuntu GmbH for uh, the water treatment sector. In 2018, I started my first application on two patents. That's why we needed the GmbH. Um, in December 2019, Ubuntu GmbH turns and becomes EvoDrop AG, so we changed the trust. And in June um, 2020, we established three patent boxes, also GmbHs for all five patents we are having now. The company value and expectation are, we have 500 clients, around 200 projects. Uh, we had a revenue in 2021 of 1.5 million. We are 100% self-financed and most important, 100% of the shares are held by EvoDrop. As you may see, um, the revenue in 2023 will be for 2.2 million Swiss francs. Next slide, please. The key activities from us, EvoDrop, um, are in the private households for drinking water and anti-scaling systems, in the gastronomy and food production for hygiene, safety, and drinking water stations in the office and commercials, also for the drinking water sector, and in agriculture for drip irrigation, and um, bio-seed um, and in the real estate we are also for the anti-scaling, anti-corrosion and filtered water. And the last key activity is in the sport and fitness institution <clears throat> where we have great success with the best football uh, association with FC Zurich and FC St. Gallen for hydrogen rich water which we developed. Next slide please. The management um, and the key 
uh, or the core team is me, Fabio Hüter, Dino Novia, Luciano Novia, and Joshua Fitz. We are also supported by nine scientists as an advisory board from PhDs in medicine, engineering, natural science, and environmental technologies. As well, we are having now, proud to, and honored to be say that, uh, elf employees in sales, logistics, and manufacturing. Next slide, please. The value proposition is that we offer um, the perfect water treatment with different technologies and patent for every purpose. Next slide. <clears throat> for the Rhone River Challenge, um, I used uh, one of our technologies called the Evo Adsorb. It's a special developed adsorbation material. We are 10 up to 15 times higher in the filter performance than standard and competitors activated carbon um, filters or adsorbation filters. Um, it's tested around over 614 different pollutants like pesticide, microplastics, heavy metal, um, bacteria, and pharmaceuticals and medication. Next slide, please. Here you see the difference in the graphics. We are mostly um, contaminating with um, Micropores, we are having 70%. The competitor products having just up to 10 and 20%. Next slide, please. The other product for the Rome River Challenge was the Evo uh, Hydrolysis. It's, um, we are having two patents on this. Um, also, we have three publications in the Journal of Physics, Journal of Chemistry, and the Journal of Microbiology. Uh, on killing fungi, bacteria, and viruses without any need of chlorine, heavy metal, bromine, or UVC lights. So clean water, hygiene water, without any um, environmental and human um, problems on health and uh, yeah, environmental problems. Next slide, please. Also, we have an impact on the lime scale. Uh, on rust means corrosion and also on the microorganisms. So the tubes and the pipes will be free and safe forever. Next slide, please. Also, we have, uh, as I mentioned before, an impact on the environment. We are split in a foundation or an association for an NGO and, uh, and a, not a profit organization. And with the foundation, we are active in 12 countries. We have around 28 projects. We helped with 4,500 4, people with clean water. We developed fountain or water wells with our water treatments. We plant around 250,000 trees. And with that, we compensated around 500 mi uh, 5 million kilograms of CO2. Next slide, please. Our needs is an investment minimum of 500,000 um, Swiss francs, for sure, shares only with detailed agreement. Um, we are also searching for strategic partners for development of new markets and regions in Europe, um, as we are a, um, a research and development country in production and not a sales uh, team. And also we are searching for sales partners in the field of water management and treatment. Next slide. Thank you very much. This was Everdrop. If you have any further questions, please um, come back to me. I will wrap you for every need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. <laughs> Thanks for that. And we'll move to our, our last pitch uh, of the first session, of the first part of this session, uh, which is Marc Villomene uh, from DLK Technologies uh, talking on Wastewater treatment. I think the presentation will be in French. Oui, thank you. Bon, bonjour, euh, mesdames et messieurs. Euh, au nom de DLK, ben, je vous remercie d'être présent. Pour des raisons de fluidité, je vais m'exprimer dans mon patois régional, le français. Donc, DLK Technologies, comment valoriser son traitement d'eau Donc, en fait, on travaille énormément pour l'industrie, horlogère et autres. Euh, donc, on propose quatre volets de traitement d'eau industriel. Vous avez en premier l'eau résiduaire générée par les process, où on va éliminer les métaux lourds, on va enlever les hydrocarbures, le pH, pour permettre de rejeter en station d'épuration, pour qu'ils puissent faire leur travail. 
Parallèlement, on a aussi la possibilité de récupérer les métaux précieux. On peut le faire en chimie, on peut le faire en résine ou des solutions alternatives. On peut le faire avec des évaporateurs. Il y a beaucoup de techniques qui permettent de le faire. Après, cette eau, on en recycle aussi une partie. Il faut faire très attention le recyclage. Certains pays comme les Allemands aiment beaucoup ça, mais c'est énergétiquement, ce n'est pas, pas génial. Donc, on évite de le faire le plus possible. Euh, purification de l'eau, ben évidemment, on a beaucoup de solutions pour avoir des eaux plus ou moins propres, euh, jusqu'à euh, 18 mégaumes, donc des eaux vraiment très, très pures pour la microtechnique ou des choses comme ça. Notre but est toujours, dans le traitement de l'eau, de faire des choses le plus écologiques possible, donc d'avoir une empreinte carbone le plus faible possible. Donc, nous sommes petits mais efficaces. Donc, nous sommes une dizaine de personnes, 100% indépendants, chiffre d'affaires entre 1,5 et 2 millions par an. Et évidemment, on fait beaucoup de... On investit beaucoup de mise au point spécifique par rapport aux demandes de nos clients. Nous sommes proches de nos clients pour les servir au mieux. Alors nous, on est Suisse de chez Suisse, on vend qu'en Suisse. Euh, on est basé dans Béjune, l'Arc Jurassien, et on se déplace sur Genève, Lausanne. Donc on cherche la proximité, la polyvalence et le sur-mesure. On a quelques clients avec nos bioréacteurs, euh, biomasse immobilisée, encore à Zurich et euh, Bâle, des choses comme ça. Mais le gros de notre clientèle est en Suisse romande. Donc, l'impact, ben, après 30 ans d'existence, ben, on a plus de 200 installations qui tournent, qu'on doit maintenir, qu'on doit faire fonctionner. Euh, le but, c'est ouais, que ça reste écologiquement intéressant, que ça réduise la maintenance. Donc, la plus vieille machine tourne depuis euh, sa mise en marche depuis 30 ans. Donc, on n'est pas dans le jetable, on est dans le, le durable, le plus possible. Ensuite, pour les nouveaux projets, il y en a. Euh, c'est toujours plus compliqué. Je ne sais pas les autres pays, mais en Suisse, ça devient vraiment très, très, très complexe. Euh, donc, vous avez DLK qui va avoir un, une interface avec le client. Donc, pour des petits projets, on a accès directement au client. Pour des plus gros, vous aurez des entreprises générales, des architectes, des gens comme ça, euh, qui vont confier la tâche à des ingénieurs, euh, qui, eux, vont sous-traiter à des sanitaires, des électriciens, des maîtres d'État. Vous avez bien entendu les investisseurs, internes ou externes, les autorités fédérales, cantonales, communales, différentes normes, exigences. Et nous, là au milieu, on doit en plus proposer des solutions, chercher des alternatives, incorporer dans le bâtiment. On travaille avec un certain nombre de fournisseurs qui viennent ben, au, essentiellement d'Europe. En Suisse, il n'y a pas grand-chose, c'est sûr, pour arriver à proposer des solutions qui fonctionnent dans le temps. Trop de personnes ne connaissent pas DLK et c'est ce que nous pouvons faire pour vous. C'est pour ça qu'on est présent ici. On a 30 ans d'existence euh, et le, la crise de Covid l'a bien montré. Je pense que c'est bien d'aller le moins loin possible. Si on peut faire pour des petits projets, travailler en régional, on gagne des kilomètres, on gagne euh, sur la rapidité de maintenance, on gagne sur le service, on gagne sur la langue régionale, on gagne sur la proximité. Donc euh, voilà, pour les contacts, ben, vous avez tout sur Internet. C'est moi, en général, moi, qui m'occupe des, des offres. Donc euh, soit le téléphone, soit euh, le mail. Voilà. Merci pour votre attention. Thank you very much, Mark. Well, definitely after 30 years, not a startup. But, um, <laughs> not exactly. Nice, no. nice to have you here. Um, so um, I would like to open the Q&A session. Also, for those people that are online, uh, please do not hesitate to write your question Uh, and then I, I hope I will get that question uh, from, from, on, from the online board. So we have some questions online. Do you yes, please. Read them? What, yes, go ahead. So the first one is for uh, Camille. Uh, so this is from Dima Almasri. How are you planning on regenerating the absorbent magnetite? And also, if it is to be used uh, in an absorption colon, how do you avoid the pressure drop from the magnetite particle use? Okay, so thanks for the two technical questions. So uh, concerning the regeneration, uh, this is something on which we work, but um, we have things coming from the two sides. So it's, it's possible to regenerate uh, our magnetite by switching the pH, uh, so to sorb and desorb. Um, but the main thing we have from uh, water treatment operators such as Suez is that in fact it's too complex for people on site to do it. So we, we do not know if we will sell it quickly or maybe keep it for later as a service. Concerning the, um, the second part and uh, being for putting our money tech in the colon, so the question is in fact that uh, of course yes we have uh, very small particle sizes, so when you put these very small particles in a column, you will have a lot uh, high pressure drop. Uh, what we are doing is uh, granulating our powder, and the second thing we are doing is putting it into a fiber or membrane to to have both um, adsorption, both adsorption and filtering uh, effect. 
So this is the two things we are doing at this time and what to, okay. what to propose. Thank you very much, Camille. Yes, and we have a second question that's for uh, Olga. Uh, so what's the recovery capacity uh, for your MOF for gold? It of course depends on the concentration, but with a standard procedure we've shown uh, take basically one gram of gold with one gram of sponge, which is 100 weight percent. So we basically double the weight of sponge by two. But at lower concentration, it can be different. It's under development now. So we are assessing. We have now from the lab, we have to go to exact uh, solution which exists in industry and uh, see what is the uh, uptake capacity there. OK. Thanks very much, Olga. Maybe I can just add a question. So how often can this sponge be used in a way? How, is it so once you absorb, then you? A very good question and oftentimes asked. So because we can take so much of gold and the mechanism is absorption and reduction. So we get all the nanoparticulate gold inside the sponge. Sponge should be destroyed in the end of the process. And because it's uh, so cheap in production, we believe. Okay. It's not a problem. Also, it contains iron apart from the gold, which is not a big problem to remove. Okay. Hmm. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have a question from the audience here present? Yes, please. Um, you'll just get the mic, just, uh, just a moment. Gentleman who was um, on screen, I think it was um, Hydrel, Michael, uh, on the question on the whey that you mentioned, uh, converting whey into energy. Um, have you also considered converting whey into um, fertilizer substitutes for uh, regenerative agriculture? Because it is sometimes used, I've observed, in different parts of the world. And that might have a higher value than trying to convert it to energy. Thanks very much for the question. Michael, that's for you. Sure, I'm very happy to answer it. It is definitely true, um, uh, whey is even used as a food. I remember when I was a kid, I could purchase this in the supermarket as a food. Um, however, it's not used at that anymore. Um, I should say it could be used as a fertilizer. We have no shortage of fertilizer here in, 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 uh, in this part of, of Switzerland where, where I live. Uh, what we will do is we will use the remnants. Uh, of the of the uh, way uh, um, uh, utilization of the of the uh, extraction of energy as a fertilizer that is actually enough as a fertilizer uh, to fertilize the fields around here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, Michael. I always thought by drinking Rivella, I would also be part of the recycling of whey, but maybe that has also changed in terms of the processes that they use. It has changed. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so that was a myth, I guess. Uh, um, Maybe I can just add on, you know, I mean, in your, in your digester, I, I would also have a question for you. Um, I guess you also, you're also producing a, a sludge in, in, in the digester. And uh, what happens with that sludge? Yeah, so we, we still need traditional treatment, um, which is not a problem for our system. We will most likely be based at local wastewater treatment plants because they're usually in the proximity also of the uh, producers of the wastewater and of the, of the food and beverage industry. Um, so we reduce the amount of sludge considerably uh, because we're removing the organics. Uh, however, there's still sludge there uh, and the sludge at the moment depending on what's inside the sludge either needs to be incinerated as it is happening right now because uh, of the heavy metal uh, content of the sludge. However, that's not the case with whey. Uh, so that sludge that I, that, that, that I mentioned that could be used as a fertilizer. Yeah, so it would be good to have that sludge in a way not in the, in the wastewater treatment because then mixing it with municipal wastewater sludge, then you, get the create, you have the problem of the heavy metals. And then exactly, kind of the limitation yeah. of reuse, I guess. Yeah. Exactly. OK, thanks very much. Uh, I'll maybe take one last question before we close this first part of the session. Is there one last question? Is there something online? OK. OK, that's good. So then uh, we'll move uh, to the next block, which is the presentation of Bertrand Picard.
uh, from Solar Impulse Foundation. Uh, so I kindly ask uh, the sp now speakers, you can, you can move down. Mm -hmm. And the, the next speakers for the next block, please, during the video, come up to the stage. Thank you very much. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Avec votre événement organisé à Lausanne, je m'étais dit, eh bien, au moins je pourrais participer. Eh bien non, je suis à Paris. Euh, donc désolé de m'adresser à vous euh, par, par vidéo. La dernière fois que nous nous sommes parlé, c'était pour célébrer le partenariat entre Waterpreneur et la Fondation Solar Impulse. Et au moment de ce partenariat, j'avais annoncé que notre but, c'était de sélectionner, d'identifier partout dans le monde 1000 solutions qui seraient financièrement rentables pour protéger l'environnement. Alors, les promesses, c'est bien. Quand on les tient, c'est encore mieux. Donc maintenant, je peux vous dire que nous avons réussi. Euh, il y a des solutions de waterpreneurs, beaucoup de solutions de l'eau, mais aussi des solutions pour l'industrie, pour l'agriculture, pour la mobilité, pour l'énergie, pour les constructions. Et en tout, nous avons atteint 1150 solutions, donc explosé la, la barre des 1000 solutions symboliques que nous avions euh, fixées. Alors, c'est des solutions qui permettent d'être plus efficients, qui permettent de protéger l'environnement, qui permettent de créer des emplois, qui permettent l'économie circulaire, qui permettent de l'efficience partout, même dans la gestion des déchets. Donc forcément, dans un événement comme le vôtre, euh, c'est un nombre de solutions qui vont pouvoir vous être utiles. Et je sais que certaines de ces solutions vont pitcher et se présenter euh, elles-mêmes à votre événement. Alors, la protection de l'environnement financièrement rentable, c'est quelque chose qui pour moi est très très important parce que ça permet d'inclure beaucoup plus d'acteurs. Tant que nous sommes entre nous, entre passionnés de la protection de la nature, c'est bien, mais ça ne va pas assez loin. Donc, j'aimerais réconcilier avec ces solutions l'économie et l'écologie, ramener le plus possible d'industrie, le plus possible d'investissement, de manière à ce que le monde politique se dise que si tous les acteurs se mettent d'accord de l'écologie à la finance, eh bien, on va pouvoir passer à la modernisation des, des réglementations. C'est très important, la modernisation des réglementations, parce qu'aujourd'hui, il est toujours légalement permis de mettre autant de CO2 qu'on veut dans l'atmosphère, autant de plastique dans les océans, autant de produits chimiques dans l'eau, dans les sols, dans la nourriture, et ça, ça doit changer. Donc, si on montre que c'est possible, si on montre que c'est financièrement rentable et que ça crée des emplois, je pense qu'on rallie beaucoup de monde euh, autour de nous. Donc, voilà dans quel esprit... Euh, je remercie Waterpreneur de la participation active de ses membres à ce défi de la Fondation Solar Impulse. Et bien sûr, un clin d'œil à mon ami André Hoffman, euh, qui, à travers sa, son association Intent, euh, permet à cet événement d'avoir lieu. Donc, bon, bon événement à tous et j'espère la prochaine fois euh, physiquement sur place. OK. Uh, I guess thank you very much, Bertrand Picard. We can give him a clap, although he won't hear it. But nevertheless, I think a very valuable and uh, exciting input. Uh, so with that, we'll move into the next uh, block, where we have two speakers here present and uh, three speakers online. And um, without any delay, I think we can just start. Uh, we start with Luigi Grasso from Binovate Technologies. Uh, what, talking about online and automatic solution for detection in real time of uh, bacterial contamination in drinking water. So, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so, good morning, everybody. My name is Luigi Grasso. I am CTO of Binovate Technologies, and uh, I'm very glad to be here today. So, at Binovate, we are specialized in microbial detection, automation, and smart monitoring. Our vision is to contribute to safe water anytime and uh, anywhere. Uh, so our work focuses on uh, developing and selling industrial solution uh, for the analysis of the water quality, and more specifically, for the detection of the bacteria that are present in the water with the scope to make sure that it is safe to drink. In fact, ensuring that the water is safe and healthy is one of the greatest challenges that the drinking water industry is facing, and this is only possible through a continuous monitoring of the microbiological quality of the water. 
Today, this task is mainly achieved using traditional plating methods developed more than a century ago and uh, the so-called heterotrophic plate count. While uh, required by most national regulation, this uh, method has more than one drawbacks. First of all, it is time and labor consuming. Secondly, uh, the time to result ranges between two to seven days, which is a bit annoying when one needs to uh, take fast decision in order to prevent the potential contamination. And finally, it can only detect a very small fraction of the bacteria that are present in the water, which is also known as the great plate count anomaly. So it is clear that uh, such industries cannot rely on this technique and it's why they urgently need a solution for a faster and more effective solution. At Binovate, we have developed such a tool and today I'm very uh, proud to present you our groundbreaking solution for the rapid microbial monitoring, the Bactosense. So uh, the Bactosense, it's a fully automated early warning system that can detect all the bacteria that are present in the water in only 20 minutes. It allows for a continuous monitoring of the whole water network. So instead of bringing the water to the lab, Binovate is bringing a full laboratory directly to the water. And the instrument is very robust and compact, so it can be installed anywhere from the water catchment and the water distribution network. And last but not least, I also would like to mention that the Bactosense was selected among this uh, 1,000, uh, sorry, 1,150 solution that uh, received this prestigious Solar Impulse Efficient Solution label that uh, Mr. Picard just uh, presented. In the drinking water industry, bacteriological monitoring was the last essential parameter that was not monitored uh, automatically and in real time. So Bactosense is filling this gap as it's a fully connected solution and it can be operated remotely without any human intervention for up to six months. And of course, it can be integrated in all the smart water monitoring system. The device can be applied in a wide variety of industry. Of course, it has been first adopted by the drinking water industry for water quality monitoring and optimization of uh, treatment processes. It has also uh, proven to be very effective for the food and beverage industry for both water quality and cleaning place um, monitoring. And more recently, the technology has been uh, acquired by big players from the pharmaceutical industry for the online monitoring of ultra pure water, which is the principal raw materi material sorry, used in um, drug manufacturing. So, we have a great product, we are in a huge market, estimated to more than 10 billion of euro, and we are having a strong market traction. Since 2017, uh, more than 150 instruments have been installed in 14 EU countries, with more than half of our 2020 sales being from existing customers, showing that we are uh, effectively gaining customer trust. Binovate employs uh, currently 25 people at three different locations, Lausanne, Zurich and Germany. Uh, we have a strong growth, we uh, have now a scale-up status and our aim is to establish ourselves as one of the worldwide leaders of the industrial microbiology. It is why we are now expanding our commercial activities to the whole world and we are currently looking for a commercial partner who would like to join our great venture and of course any stakeholders who uh, are willing to support us. So if you have any questions, I will be happy to uh, answer and uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eugenio. Uh, very exciting. Um, I think there'll be some, definitely some questions later. Uh, and a very exciting also market that you're looking at. Um, I would like to move on to the next pitch uh, by Emanuele Guillemino. Uh, Emanuele is online. Uh, from Advanced Micro Turbines. Um, which allow off-grid applications and data-driven management of water grids. Hello, Emmanuel, the morning. floor is yours. Hello, good morning, everybody. My name is Emmanuel Guglielmino. I'm the founder and CEO of Advanced Microturbines. Uh, we talk uh, in this speech about how microturbines can enable IoT application and data-driven management of water grids. Uh, can you please go to the next slide? Uh, 
We as a company were born as an academic spin-off a few years ago from the Italian Institute of Technology, the robotic department. And over the years, we patented and developed our family of products, which are micro turbines for energy harvesting in gas and water pipelines. Over the time, we got the SME instrument free to grant and recently the solar impulse label. And we are selling our products at present, mostly in Italy, but we are starting now to sell them abroad. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. So, our the, the challenge we want to address is basically in bringing off grid, so where there's no electri electrical grid, digitalization and enable an effective and efficient management of water network. Uh, capitalizing on IoT sensors and uh, control algorithms. Next slide, please. So what, what is our solution? Is a package composed by, uh, by our energy harvesting micro turbines and some electronics with sensors which acquires data. This data are processed in a way to uh, enable uh, an efficient and effective management of water. So we arrive to sort of digitalizing water. Next slide, please. So our solutions compared to other way of uh, providing electricity of grid is highly reliable uh, as it's something which doesn't require any maintenance. It's not a risk of theft, it's very, easy to retrofit and it's cheaper than whatever else is on the market. Uh, next, please. So as a technology, we are fully in line with what the, the, the United Nations goals with the uh, European Green Deals and also with the circular economy principles. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are in a huge market because, uh, you know, you have pipelines actually everywhere in the world. Uh, in, in Europe, we have estimated 8 million kilometer pipelines and assuming an average of a potential installation point, be a, a valve, be a fountain, be a, a reservoir, we have potential installation points every 10 kilometers, leading to a total available market which can be figured out in Europe of over 2 billion euros. And at the same time, this is a very hot topic. European Union is investing plenty of money in this moment in time for a project uh, and water infrastructure projects over 40 million euro. And many European directives are steering towards a more environmentally friendly and conscious use of water and the minimization of what is called non-revenue water, which means water that is actually uh, pumped, processed, but not eventually built. Next slide, please. So our business model, how we, we sell this product, we can even sell the complete solutions, retrofit solutions, and also, we are working on a software which uh, help uh, enabling predictive maintenance. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, we, uh, so as I said, we are, we are starting from Italy. We are now moving towards uh, neighboring countries, and we are trying also to, to reach Scandinavia next year. And at the same time, we, are, have a, we had some initial conversation with uh, Latin America, which is another huge market for ourselves. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, some figures of forecasted revenues and uh, what we are looking here are partners for you know, both projects and say, perspective prospects for using our technology in a number of applications. Uh, next slide, which is the end. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for, for your attention. And uh, this is it, we are open to uh, any collaboration with interested partners and stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emanuele. So we'll move uh, to our next speaker, which is also here present on stage, uh, Igor Martin from Hydromea on the submerged uh, drones. Yes, thank you. 
Uh, good morning. Uh, Hydromia is a, a PFL startup, which is based uh, just around uh, a corner here. And we are focusing on building autonomous drones for inspections of submerged assets. Here in the picture, you could see hydropower turbine that is suspended in air, which is an awkward position for a turbine to be because normally it should be sitting in water generating electricity, but it can be there up to three months because it goes through an inspection. And there are hundreds of thousands of euros associated cost with it, downtime cost. So imagine if we could actually put it all in one day inspection and drop the cost to 30, 50,000 euros with a drone like this. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve with, with the system. So we focus on building a platform of autonomous portable drones that could do inspections of these submerged assets extremely, at extremely affordable cost, reduced cost by up to 90%. It will also eliminate safety risks because people will not need to enter into dangerous confined spaces to do inspections. It is also a nice uh, ad hoc availability tool in case there is an emergency um, that uh, a client can take a look at what's going on underwater. And finally, in the offshore space, we believe that it will provide significant reductions of CO2 emissions. So when I say that uh, we're building a platform, and, and here is, a, by the way, a prototype of our drone, which uh, the world's first wireless drone underwater. Today, drones are all connected by a tether, and we, we were able to cut the tether. Uh, we did it because we innovated a number of key enabling technologies, one of which is um, a thruster. It's a unique thruster. It's the thinnest thruster in the world. We have patented this design and it allows us to make the size of the drone significantly smaller and more efficient. We also developed uh, what we call underwater Wi-Fi. Basically, to send data, to, to exchange data underwater, you don't have radio working there, not like in the air. So you have to think about new ways. And we came up with a way to send data using light. Uh, it can go up to 50, 100 meters max. So there is a limit on the uh, on the distance, but it can send a significant amount of data in a very short period of time. And finally, our team has been working with drones, uh, robots for underwater deployment for some time, and we actually did build uh, drones, you could see on the picture, and ran them in uh, seven scient uh, 11 scientific campaigns, most of them here in Swiss lakes, and even one under ice. Uh, these drones were collecting water quality data, oxygen, uh, chlorophyll, turbidity. We were also uh, be able to actually find a bacterial layer in the water, which is quite useful for certain uh, tasks. The market for inspection uh, of underwater submerged assets uh, is estimated to grow to 7 billion euros and our revenues uh, should reach 38 uh, million euros at that time. Uh, currently, we're focusing on hydropower space and offshore energy, but there are some other market opportunities out there for the system. Our business model is to generate um, is revenue from data. So we are a robotics as a service company. Uh, we will partner with service providers in different market segments. Uh, they will have our drones. The drones will collect data, will license software, or will charge per data sets after processing this data. And as we collect more data with uh, machine learning and AI, we'll be able to actually uh, work on predict predictive analytics. And uh, this is something that we could upsell to our clients as well. For a small company that we have, we've actually progressed uh, quite nicely over the, last, over the last few years. Um, we've spent half a year in Aberdeen, which is a mecca of uh, subsea offshore space, where we learned about all the issues that uh, offshore space has, and uh, we were able to uh, fine tune our product market fit there. Um, we've uh, launched a few products. You, you saw some of the pictures, some of the videos of those. So Wi-Fi system and the thruster are fully commercial products today that you can go and buy on our website. Uh, we also have a funded project uh, by an innovation hub of offshore in Aberdeen with Total, and we're developing this uh, drone system here to inspect uh, a highly complex uh, ballast water tanks on vessels, which is a huge problem uh, overall in the shipping industry. And we also have an LOI with GE Hydro to launch this drone for inspections of hydropower turbines. And finally, last month we showed, um, uh, we basically showed the, the demo of this drone underwater running around, sending HD video uh, without any wires, uh, which was quite cool. So we are here to really uh, give you an idea of what we're working on and we're looking for partnerships or use cases. So if anybody in the audience has some ideas how this system or any of our components that we have, I've talked about uh, could uh, benefit what you do, please talk to us. There's my co-founder on uh, virtual stage today as well, Alex Barr. You can speak to him uh, online. 
And finally, you see here uh, um, an image of uh, a few drones. What is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, six drones, or probably eight, running across the lake, collecting a plume, a data about the plume in the water. We can do it very quickly. Within two hours, we can map a, a relatively large area and provide you exactly what's in the water. So what we uh, kind of say to the industry is that stop modeling, start measuring what actually happens in the water with the robotics technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Igor. As a diver, I'm kind of very interested in, but it's also, that means it's a competition for the divers, right? So, I know. Uh, so let me move on. Uh, we have another presentation from someone that is online, Khaled al Medzayin from uh, Innovaya, um, talking about innovative and ecological water filtration system. Khaled, are you with us? Hello. Yes, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. now we can also see your presentation. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So hi, I'm Khaled al -Muzayen. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Innovaya. Uh, Innovaya is an innovative social venture specialized in water filtration and water treatment. Our mission is to preserve the world's most valuable resource by making water treatment clean, cheap, and predictable. We do that by building decentralized water treatment system that combines hardware, software, and sensor technology to treat water at the source. Next slide, please. We developed a unique process based on membrane technology, rubber sensors, and an in-house algorithm. There are three main reasons why this technology is transformative. First, it's highly effective. It's autonomous. The operating system can change the machine parameters real time as water quality varies and it can be managed remotely. This results in removing all suspended solids and microorganisms like bacteria or viruses, all while preserving the natural minerals present in the water. Second, it's cleaner. It uses no chemicals, no consumables for 10 years and produces minimal wastewater. Our patented process allows us to avoid chemical enhanced backwashes and regenerates membrane while extending their lifetime. Third, it's cheaper. We can deliver access to drinking water for 17 cents per cubic meter. It's three times cheaper than other decentralized water treatment systems. And the cost is comparable with water production total costs made by bigger water treatment facilities. These are part of the reasons why this technology has been selected by the Solar Impulse Foundation as one of one, the 1,000 efficient solutions to save the planet. Here you can check our first two machines that integrates this technology. The UNIO, made for surface and complex water to treat, and the AYA, which is here to secure tap water. Next, please. So I'm half Syrian and half Romanian. And after a personal experience in a refugee camp, I started to develop the idea and technology back in 2013. Uh, I met my two co-founders, Justin and Guillaume, uh, in Romania in 2015, and we decided to move the project to the next level. We created Innovaya at the beginning of 2018, and in 2019, we have been labeled by the Solar Impulse Foundation. In 2020, we have signed our first collaboration contract with a major water company, the SOR Group, Today, we are accelerating our commercialization. Next, please. Currently, we sell our product to our customers, NGOs, municipalities, industries, with an ongoing monitoring monthly fee. The ultimate direction we want to go is to provide access to our technology through GVs or co-development. For example, our agreement with the SOR Group is to co-develop solutions for their customers or we've acted in the Philippines in order to provide drinkable water to isolated communities. Next. We are tackling the SDG number six, clean water and sanitation, which is the, by the way, the only SDG which has a connection with the 16 others. The assessment we made with the Solar Impulse Foundation gave us these facts. One UNIO or one AYA can save up to 200 kilograms of plastic per day uh, 1.6 tons of CO2. So our impact goal is to reduce the water footprint of the industry and give access to clean drinking water to everyone by preserving the resource. We have already installed devices for more than 40,000 people 
and we have 10 ongoing projects within the industry. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, we are three co-founders, Justin in charge of drinking water access projects with our partners. She has an international cooperation background in Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe. Guillaume in charge of the administrative and financial part, also with an international background in finance. I have a pharmaceutical doctorate specialized in engineering processes, and we are a dedicated specialized team to change the paradigm of the world of water. Next slide, please. Here you can see our key partners and key clients, both from the water access sector, but also industry like the PRFAP group. Next slide. So in order to go further, we are seeking for partners, donors, and impact investors. We need 3 million euro for developing the software part, our digital platform that will help us scale up the industrialization of our devices and our marketing strategy. We have already secured 1 million euro. This round will bring us to break even in 2023. Next slide. Innovaya strongly believes the UNIO is going to transform the lives of many people. We are ready to introduce this innovation to the world. Would you like to be part of it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Khaled. Thanks for that presentation. And we'll move right next to the next and last uh, pitch, which is also online, from Jan Graber from Romag Aquacare on, on water treatment. Jan? Uh, hello and yes. welcome, everybody, um, to my short pitch about our company, Romag Aquacare. And thank you for joining me today. Next slide, please. So who are we? We are um, a relatively small company located in uh, near Freiburg in Switzerland. We have around 50 employees, um, additional nine trainees, and we made a, a turnover in 2020 of around 10 million Swiss francs consolidated. We have around 35% uh, of export shares from our wholesales. And uh, yeah, we are a family run business. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here is our organization chart. Uh, it's a classical chart followed after lines and function. And as I said, we are a family owned business. Next slide. Our turnover in 2020 was following. We have three business units. Uh, one of them is potable water. So drinking water, fresh water, which makes around 40% of our turnover. Uh, the second one is environmental technology, which makes around 50%. And then we have the smallest part, which is machinery and plant construction, which makes around 10%, which is mostly like pharma machinery and stuff like that, which due to obvious reasons with our customer, I can't go too much into details in this presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So the water cycle and Roma Aquacare. So we basically offer solutions for the entire water cycle, meaning from the collection of fresh water from the spring till the point where it becomes wastewater and is cleaned in wastewater treatment stations. Um, as I said, it's, it's a treatment of drinking water, it's distribution, also it's storage of drinking water. Um, rainwater cleaning, for example, on highways, um, if there is a lot of rain, uh, this water gets mixed with a lot of rubber, sometimes oil. Uh, and before you put this water back in the cycle, you obviously have to clean it first, because there is, as I said, a lot of rubber and oil and other things in it. Uh, we also do floor gates um, to, for example, provide uh, prevent uh, flood protection and stuff like that. Next slide. Uh, one of one of our main innovations, one of our biggest innovations, is the spring chamber called System Wabe. Um, it corresponds to the actual food law, and it reli reliably prevents external con contamination and pollution. And which is very important also, there is no direct contact with the drinking water reservoir 
or the drinking water storage. Uh, it's like all of our products made of made entirely out of stainless steel. Um, and obviously we use V4A, but the customer can can also wish other materials if he'd like to. Uh, it, it's patented the spring chamber. The patent was recently renewed in 2020, I think. And uh, its main its main goal is to collect water from a spring and to calm it down. Also, it de-aerates water, so it takes the air out of the water and it filters sediments like, like chunks or big rocks or stuff like that. So it's like a coarse filtration. Uh, also, it measures turbidity, which is a sensor equipped uh, in-house from us, but you can also replace the sensor or we can replace it with other sensors, for example, like temperature and pH and stuff like that. Next. Uh, our next innovation is, uh, is called CSOs, so Combined Siever Overflows. Um, it's a Romax screen with integrated control walls. Um, it's, it's the cleanest siever overflow available right now, actually, with four millimeters. And it has a capacity of maximum 7,700 liters a second, which is, which is quite massive, actually. It's also patented, and its goal is to prevent dirty rainwater to re-enter the water cycle. Next. Uh, our pressure doors, another innovation of ours. Um, they are used in water storage areas, water storage pools or reservoirs, or however you want to call them. They can withstand water columns up to 20 meters, which is is around two bar, or pretty much exactly two bars. And uh, its big advantage is there are no mechanical parts on the water side, meaning the, the hinge from the door is actually on the outside, even the door opens to the inside, meaning the hinge will never be in contact with water and is therefore way more safe to uh, corrosion and stuff like that compared to our competitors. Also, we give it 20 years of warranty and uh, yeah, only if we do the service by Roma once or twice a year. That's it. Thank you for your attention and uh, hear you later. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jan. Um, so I can open the floor again now for questions. Maybe we'll first take someone from the audience this time okay. uh, in preference before we go to the online questions. Is there a question from the audience? Maybe I can start with one question for, uh, sorry, for Luigi. Yeah. yeah. Um, so can you quickly explain your, your box? Where is it actually installed? Is it installed at the utility or is it installed at the well? Is it very decentralized? Yeah. And what would be the necessity if it would have to be installed in a way, very decentralized way? Or just kind of give me some more explanation yeah, on yeah. that. So, so basically, as I said, it can be uh, installed almost um, anywhere, really from the water catchment, so to, uh, to, to monitor the, the raw water, uh, then in all the water, the water uh, treatment plant after um, filtration processes or after uh, I know, disinfection processes, and then directly on the water network, either uh, close to a reservoir who uh, as close as possible to the, the customer. And what would be the resource requirements in terms of maintenance or even kind of, you know, services that yeah. you would have that this, even if it's very decentralized, I can imagine yeah. being at a pump somewhere, um, you know, what, what, what would be required so that you can really guarantee that it's always functional and reliable? Yeah, so basically uh, the instrument can measure uh, 1,000 times before any... Um, action is needed. So let's say that you measure uh, six times a day, you will last for a few months without uh, needed, without any service uh, that is needed. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. Welcome. Yeah, let's take another question from the plenum right here. Oh, yeah. We are, we, yeah, we can't share the mics. I think we have to use like a, a clean mic. Sorry about that. I didn't realize the, the complexity of COVID yeah, mics. I guess. <laughs> so, a uh, question for Igor. 
Uh, you mentioned that uh, obviously because it's underwater drones, the sensor is light. But is it light imagery? Are you looking for cracks? Or are you actually using laser-based uh, sensors to be able to figure out, let's say, corrosion or any different change in the metallic surfaces that you're inspecting? So our initial payload and visual, so we have a camera, a pretty, uh, uh, pretty sophisticated camera system and lighting system uh, to just identify the problem areas. We also plan to add a UT sensor for corrosion measurements to, to measure the, the, the metal uh, thickness. Um, and then it, it actually depends on uh, really uh, the necessity of a particular application, the beauty that we are not building just a drone, we have a platform, so we can relatively easy put things together for a particular application to address those uh, inspection needs. Maybe I can just add on to that a question of mine. I mean, I understand that you have various sensors that you can build into the drone, uh, and one of them is the camera, but also other sensors that measure um, and, and what you were mentioning on the light is more the data transfer, right? The, so that the wireless system, and, uh, as I understood. And, but how does that work when you have a very turbid, or rather turbid situations? I mean, I was, I was saying before, I'm a diver, and if you go into Swiss lakes uh, in summer, you're usually, you don't see very much, right. uh, unless you go very deep. But, um, can you, how, how do you kind of solve that issue? I'm sure offshore that can also be a big challenge. Yeah, so uh, you, you need to think about light as like if you're a diver, you go down from the surface of the water, down, 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 down. If you still see things around you, this means that the light still penetrates where you are, even though it's turbid. So it doesn't mean that you have to have a direct line of sight. It's important that the light just penetrates where you are. And, and that's, that's the beauty of the light. It actually has a very nice feature of bouncing back from particles in the water and get to the place where it needs to be. But indeed, the, the overall, the, the, the more turbid water is, the, 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 the harder it is for the, for, the, for the light to go through. So you will lose some of the speed or some of the, you know, for instance, you know, at, at, in a normal transparent water, we would send data at 10 megabits per second. Um, in a turbid water, probably it will drop to a couple of megabits per second. Yeah. So it's more if, then a function of speed of data transfer. It's that, range, it's range and speed, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, maybe we have a question uh, online? Yes, we have a few questions online. Maybe I can, can start with the one for Khaled uh, Inovaya. Uh, what type of membranes are you using? Uh, what is the daily water production capacity of your system? And did you mention uh, you don't use chemicals? What about the regeneration process? Yes, yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so the idea is that we use both uh, polymeric and ceramic membranes, depending on the fluid that we have to treat. For su surface water, we use uh, polymeric membranes. For industrial fluids, we use uh, more or less uh, ceramic membranes. And we use different uh, techniques like uh, uh, frontal, uh, frontal uh, filtration for uh, surface water and cross flow or dynamic cross flow for industrial fluids. Um, so it depends really on the fluid. The hardware part can be, can be we, we can change the hardware part. The software part, uh, which is with the process, going on with the process, and this is the patented thing that we have, is that we, we have developed uh, a, a process that doesn't need any chemical enhanced backwash. So we don't need uh, to use acid or bases in order to regenerate the, mem the membranes. Uh, our sweet spot in the treatment is between one cubic meter and 20 cubic meter per hour, but uh, because we are doing containerized systems, but now we are working on a project for 50 cubic meter per hour. Uh, so yeah, I, I hope it, uh, it, it answers the questions. Okay, thanks very much, Colin. I think it did answer the question. I hope. Next question. Yes. Uh, so the next is for Emanuele uh, micro turbines. How does the micro turbine deal with the low energy downstream water? With the low energy downstream water, actually, actually, what happens? The turbine to spin needs to have a pressure drop, which is already present in the process. Which means if you have a valve which is already there for whatever reasons to, ad to, to adapt the pressure to the users, 
there you have a pressure drop, which means energy wasted that uh, can be used for free by uh, activating the turbine. So then the water downstream the turbine just gets into the process and usually is bypassed. The turbine is mounted on a bypass, so the uh, water stream from the turbine is uh, connected again to the main line, so there is no uh, waste of water. Simply like a river, you have two diversions. A great part goes in the, 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 the valve or whatever pipe, and the small part goes into the turbine. Okay. Lost, hit, lost connection. Yes, so we, we, we lost you. Um, so we can take one last question on Hermit, which is for uh, Luigi Binovate. Uh, and maybe we can address also this question to Fabio. What is your biggest challenge for scale up? <laughs> yeah, the biggest one. Um, yes, now is, I think the biggest challenge is to build like the, the right team and to find the right partners to be able to smoothly develop all the, 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 the activities uh, related to commercialization, selling, servicing, and so on. It's a quite big challenge. Can I just add on a question? Do you, yeah. do you also have a demand for more um, information rather than, I would say, the standard bacterial loads? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, w there's a lot of discussion now in the pandemic. What you can, what what things can be measured in water? Um, is there? Do you notice that there is kind of a more demand for, I would say, specialized um, substances or bacteria? Yes. That you that you that you would need to be developing further. Of course, it's part of our R and D uh, activities. To so, so the back to sense now is measuring, uh, detecting all the bacteria that are in the water. And now we are developing a new solution that will be able to specifically detect pathogens. Uh, we speak a lot about Legionella, about uh, E. coli for fecal pollution and so on. So yeah, of course, this is a... Also, oh, at the moment, it's a total count. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, Igor, do you want also, also want to answer that question? You kind of your biggest challenge for scaling? Or you feel like you're already scaling enough? <laughs> no, no. The, the it seems like you're already all over. <laughs> we're, we're scaling up, yes. Um, I think, the, first of all, we're hiring. And the, the biggest challenge is to find talent, um, people who could be passionate about this. I mean, there, there are many, of course. But then that would fit uh, the culture of the company and uh, the growth of the company that, that we have. So welcome. If anybody is listening and really wants to get into the underwater drones, please uh, look up on our website. We, we do have some positions open. Um, another thing, of course, is that as we start to produce, uh, we need to uh, look at how do we scale up production side. And that's, uh, of course, is a, is a new thing. So it's, it's one thing to have an R&D department. It's another thing to build up uh, another uh, production department. That's something exactly what we're looking at right now okay. to catch up with demand. OK, thanks very much. Yes. Um, can, we, can we also have? Um, can we also have an answer um, from, from Emmanuel on that? Emmanuel, are you still here? Yes, yes. On the terms of scaling? Basically, basically, basically the issues are somehow the same. On one side, one thing is developing, working on R&D. And since we came from, a, let's say, scientific background, we will know how to, to, to deal with it, and we know how to also recruit people with this sort of uh, expertise. The other thing is moving on to manufacturing, especially a component like ours, which, has, which is a blend of components, some mechanics, some electrics, some electronics, which has to, to seamlessly integrate. So the whole challenge is finding the right suppliers, the, uh, um, find the right people that can not talk and deal with these suppliers with a very practical mindset. Uh, we have also to, to look up uh, around, to, 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 to continuously scan the, the, the landscape of manufacturing, to, to, to identify new manufacturing techniques to make the device uh, uh, scalable, because once it's producing 10 pieces, once it's producing 1,000 pieces. So we have all the issues about quality, replicabil replicability, and so forth. So uh, 
and, and the same goes for uh, internationalization. Uh, we are now focusing on some countries, uh, but we have in the pipeline ideas for other countries. But uh, as, uh, as a general rule, we prefer to stick first to some countries and get and have a sufficient, say, installation base of units before uh, uh, going as well. So it's uh, basically work uh, threefold. On one side, R&D to have always new products and new evolution with the products, both in terms of hardware and software. Uh, on the other side, the uh, manufacturing issues with all the issues related to, 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 to having a, a, a replicable, scalable product cheap enough in terms of no cox. And uh, on the third side, all what is sales and uh, global sales. Okay, thanks very much, Emmanuel. Um, Khaled, would you also like to comment on challenges of scaling, please? Yeah, the, 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 the main challenges to scale uh, for scaling is finding the right partners, I think. Uh, now, as I said, we are, we are, we are fundraising uh, 3 million euro. We have secured um, more than 1 million now. It's 1.2 million euro. So uh, it's, uh, it's also challenging. Um, yeah, we, we as we have uh, an IP-driven um, um, business model, we have to be pretty careful with uh, with the with the IP uh, and um, patents that we have to fill in every country that we will uh, uh, we will deploy our system. So, um, yeah, um, those are the main challenges for us okay. in the next three years. Thanks very much, Khaled. And last but not least, Jan. Are you still here with us? Would you also like, no, I think he, did he drop out? Jan Graber, are you still here? No, okay. Okay, so then I think uh, we're already a bit over time and I def definitely don't want to uh, eat into the time of uh, the networking or, or the, the lunch break. Um, so thanks very much for First of all, for everybody pitching, uh, the first group and the second group, I think we can give them a hand for excellent pitches. And of course, also for your contributions, for your attention. Um, I think this, for me, this was also a very exciting uh, session on innovative and impactful water technologies. And I think it's very clear that the market goes way beyond Switzerland. Um, I think everybody demonstrated that and uh, made it very clear that although the innovation comes, comes from this area, um, I think the, the way forward, the pathways for expansion, for scaling, for market is, is very much global. And I think that's super exciting for Switzerland, but also, of course, for the world to have these new technologies implemented. So thanks very much for your attention. So I'd like to close the session. Um, you know where the areas is. Uh, please make sure of the hygiene Oh, I'll pass the word right just, to you. No problem. I just wanted to pick up on what you were okay. going to say just now, so, the hygiene Leave the rules. word to you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Christian, for doing such an amazing job. Hands You're together. Welcome. Great, great job to participants online and live. Thank you for being with us. And back to your comments on the break coming up. Lunch, yay. You've got until 2 o'clock. Mind the COVID rules, please. Masks on as soon as you leave uh, the, the area. And as you go to your respective areas, be mindful of the separate kinds of rules going on. Left side, no food, no drink, but mobility. Right side, food, drink, pick a table, stay at it, scan it. If you did not already do your social scan when you arrived this morning, please do so as soon as you choose your table for lunch. And I believe uh, with that, we're good. We can let you go. We'll see you back here at 2 o'clock. Thank you so much.
again Trying hard but you wanna be my friend In a place to hide, ain't no one to run to Here we go, here we go again Call my bluff, I'ma be here till the end I'm the one you ride, I'm the one you ride to If you And left me with the pieces Ooh. Now I wanna burn all the bridges between us Oh, 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 oh,
crashing down all around this empty town i'm searching for the lost and found but you don't care you're unaware keep moving like the scars aren't even there it's in the air like a blazing flare
a swing at a wrecking ball and I prayed for my downfall and I found a way to reconcile cause in my heart it's not worthwhile it's a bloody battlefield where some go down on the sea in the end it's all the same all you can do is play the game I'm too sad to say I'm sorry, so lie and pretend that you're okay. Swear that you will stay. Keep trying for one day. Whoa, whoa. I'm sick of all these lies. Don't care if I can't
truth or lies You gotta get up, stop wasting time Yeah, I wanna run off and your blood And I'll tell myself it's fine to be alone Just to find somewhere that finally feels like home oh, oh, oh. I hate all this overthinking oh, 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 oh. The more I swim, the more I'm sinking Take me to a world of silver No more heartbreaks, tears, painkillers Take me somewhere unfamiliar 
Sky trying to make me see your stars The dark gets lonely Now I see violet I can feel silence And the dark's all that I see When your stars are burnt out And your heart makes no sound I'll find violet in your eyes You'll always be my night sky
Thank you. 
Single word. 
Trying hard, but you wanna be my friend. In a place to hide, in a one to run to. Here we go, here we go again. Call my bluff, I'ma be here till the end. I'm the one you ride, I'm the one you ride to. If you don't wanna change, in a place to hide. I just can't let you go Lord knows that I've tried to You said I was the only one No one likes being lied to You made this mess and left me with the pieces Now I wanna burn all the bridges between us
crashing down all around this empty town i'm searching for the lost and found but you don't care yeah i'm aware keep moving like the scars aren't even there it's in the air like a blazing flare Shadows in the atmosphere, charting the stratosphere. Yeah. I prayed for you and kept you near, in hopes you'd chase away my fears. I'm on my own, you made it so, and now I'm chasing nightmares. I used to grow and get through the great big leaves. Don't think you when you laugh at me. Hope for us because I believe. Points in blaming you, you did not know how. I thought you were the one for me. That's why I give you everything. How would you cross by the stormy seas? Or you meant the world to me.
a swing and a wrecking ball and I prayed for my downfall and I found a way to reconcile cause in my heart it's not worthwhile it's a bloody battlefield where some go down on the seal in the end it's all the same all you can do is play the game I'm too sad to say I'm sorry, so lie and pretend that you're okay. Swear that you will stay. Keep trying for one day.
and stuff and fights Turning truth to lies we Gotta get up, stop wasting time Yeah, I wanna run off and your blood And I tell myself it's fine to be alone Just to find somewhere that finally feels like home Attention, coupe le micro. So Javier Garcia uh, is online. Okay. Uh, après c'est Raoul, uh, mm -hmm. il est ici. Mm -hmm. uh, Laurent, il est ici. Mm -hmm. Il est ici. Hello. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonjour. Laura, elle est ici. Hello. Olivier est ici et un Oui, 
ici de se voir. Il y en a pour soi. Et vous savez le, le changer <coughs> ouais, ça. Euh, Raoul Raoul Pardon Donc ça, c'est pour changer Celui-ci ouais. Voilà. Après, il faut le passer. Euh, donc c'est... Euh, après, c'est l'orange. Euh, ouais. oui, bon. Je parle pas ce qu'il euh, c'est Ravière, après c'est vous. Ouais. Et après, après c'est Laurent. Bon. Ouais. Fabien. Laurent et puis non. Oui, oui. Bon, ça va. Si tu peux pas oui, oui, c'est bon. Oui. Oui, oui. Oh. Ah, oui, ouais. Je crois qu'on se prenne un moment. Je peux faire le point où on est, où on est arrivé, quand où on est. T'es content, toi So welcome back, everybody. Bienvenue. I hope that uh, lunch was good. Yes, show of hands, good lunch. Good food, nice. All right, so now we're all ready for the second half of our program today, which we're going to kick off with a new set of pictures from this one. They are from the collaboration and strengthening of local ecosystems, financing sustainable water solutions. So we've got seven participants in this category. As before, some are joining virtually. Welcome back, of course, to the crowd virtually. And some of them, as you can see, are here on stage with me right now. So first up, we are going to go with the virtual. We're going to go with Javier Garcia from Canton du Valais. Javier, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Awesome. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello, wonderful. OK, well, I'm going to let you go ahead and get started with your pitch. Let's hear it. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, bonjour, je m'appelle Javier Garcia. Je suis ingénieur civil et je travaille au service de l'énergie et des forces hydrauliques du canton du Valais. Next one. Comme vous le savez bien, partout sur la planète, les besoins en eau suscitent une concurrence entre villes, agriculteurs, industries, fournisseurs d'énergie et écosystèmes. En Valais, plusieurs sources sont à notre disposition, telles que l'eau issue de la fonte des glaciers, l'eau de la nappe, celle qui coule dans les Rhônes ou encore celle stockée dans les grands barrages. Next. En raison de l'importance fondamentale de l'eau et de ses interactions, toujours plus complexes, le Conseil d'État a décidé en 2012 de se doter d'une stratégie eau destinée à piloter et à coordonner la gestion de l'eau à niveau du canton. Un comité de pilotage a conçu les points essentiels de cette stratégie et tous les services du canton ont été impliqués dans son élaboration, de même que notamment la Fédération commune des communes valaisannes, Pro Natura et la Confédération. La stratégie a été adoptée en 2013 et en 2014, le Conseil d'État a lancé les travaux préparatoires. En 2015, un groupe de travail réunissant principalement les différents services de l'État a été mis sur pied. Next. Compte tenu des défis associés à une gestion durable de l'eau, la vision de cette stratégie était de créer une gestion intégrée de l'eau cherchant la protection de l'eau, son utilisation de façon optimale et la protection contre les dangers naturels liés à l'eau tels que les inondations ou les avalanches. Next. En partant de cette stratégie, de cette gestion intégrée, la stratégie doit permettre d'atteindre les objectifs suivants. Garantir que chacun dispose d'une quantité suffisante d'eau et d'une qualité appropriée pour exercer ses activités. Prendre en compte la multifonctionnalité de l'eau afin de promouvoir son utilisation optimale. Veiller à, que, veiller à la qualité élevée de l'eau rejetée après utilisation. Prendre des mesures pour protéger les lieux de vie des hommes contre les dangers naturels liés à l'eau. Prendre soin des lacs et des cours d'eau dans leur fonction des biotopes naturels et finalement veiller à ce que les futures générations disposent d'une eau de qualité et en quantité suffisante. Next. Pour atteindre ces objectifs, la stratégie eau propose huit lignes directrices et au total 39 mesures dont plusieurs prioritaires qu'on va voir de suite. Next. La ligne directrice A prévoit la création des conditions cadres pour une gestion coordonnée et prévisionnelle de l'eau. Cela passe par la création d'une plateforme cantonale de l'eau ouverte au public fin 2020. Cette plateforme a pour objectif de collecter et d'analyser l'ensemble des informations et données sur la ressource eau du canton. La plateforme reprend chacune des lignes directrices de la stratégie eau et présente bien sûr aussi cette stratégie. Next. La ligne directrice C vise l'approvisionnement suffisant en eau potable de qualité. 
L'analyse du comité de pilotage a montré qu'il n'existait pas de vue d'ensemble et suffisamment détaillée de l'alimentation en eau potable dans les communes valaisanes. C'est pourquoi il recommandait à l'administration cantonale d'élaborer cette vue d'ensemble systématique. Pour les communes, cela impliquait l'actualisation du cadastre des eaux potables, notamment pour l'approvisionnement en eau en temps de crise. L'analyse a aussi montré qu'il était nécessaire de garantir à tout moment et partout une alimentation en eau suffisante, tant en quantité qu'en qualité. Ainsi, l'optimisation de la protection des captages d'eau potable a été recommandée et mise en œuvre. Next. L'analyse a aussi montré que l'apport des polluants dans les cours d'eau était trop élevé. Le comité de pilotage recommandait donc au canton d'assurer une qualité élevée de l'eau. Cela passe notamment par l'assainissement des anciennes décharges, mais aussi par l'entretien des conduites d'eau usée et l'entretien et rénovation des stations d'épuration. Next. Un thème très important dans notre canton concerne les dangers naturels. C'est l'objet de la ligne directrice E qui préconise des mesures telles que les renforcements des mesures techniques et organisationnelles de protection, la définition des prescriptions en matière de construction et d'utilisation du sol dans les zones à risque, ou encore une amélioration de la disponibilité de l'eau pour des opérations d'extinction en cas de feu de forêt. Next. Où on est aujourd'hui le groupe de travail a été renouvelé en 2018 et représente tous les services cantonaux concernés par l'eau. Depuis, le groupe a lancé un projet pilote sur la région des Vagnes, a travaillé aussi à l'implémentation d'un monitoring pointu de la stratégie eau et il s'agit dans ces cas d'un travail conséquent qui permet de piloter l'ensemble des projets de manière professionnelle et pertinente, mais surtout de façon coordonnée. En 2021, le groupe travaille notamment à la modernisation de la plateforme eau et à réaliser une communication accrue auprès des communes et du public. Next. En conclusion, la gestion de l'eau est et restera un défi pour les vallées. La stratégie cantonale de gestion intégrée des eaux passe par une gestion par bas versant et avec l'intégration de la multifonctionnalité. Et pour cela, la concertation des différents acteurs est primordiale. Bien sûr, il y aura encore de nombreux nouveaux challenges à venir pour la gestion des ressources, dû notamment au changement climatique. Et la seule possibilité de réussite passera par l'implication non seulement du canton, mais de nous tous. Merci. Next et fin. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you, Javier, for that presentation. I just want to remind everybody that we will be taking questions as before at the end of the session, um, both from our online audience who is joining us and, of course, from those of you who are here in the room. Okay, next up, Raul. There we go. Raoul Abrecht, please, from FMV Solutions. OK. Moi, je vais aussi commencer. Um, FMV, seulement bref, um, une uh, société dans les mains 100% des Valaisans. Et c'était mon propriétaire, le canton du Valais, qui a parlé avant moi. Um, uh, J'espère que nous sommes très bien alignés, Javier. Le premier uh, slide, ça, c'est... Um, um, ça présente la situation qu'on connaît assez bien, le changement climatique avec les fontes du glacier et ses conséquences sur le plan hydrologique aura un grand influence sur la disponibilité de l'eau en vallée. Vous voyez ici euh, l'exemple euh, le, du glacier du Rhône et l'évolution du recul du glacier rhône gletscher dans les dernières, dernières dix années. Um, uh, le lac qui est uh, évolué, est, ça on parle aujourd'hui d'un volume d'environ de, de 5 millions de mètres cubes déjà. Et ça va augmenter encore dans les prochaines années. L'hydrologie, c'est toujours une question de l'échelle. Avec les yeux de force hydraulique, le focus et le périmètre, c'est plutôt le bassin versant d'un aménagement hydroélectrique. Et l'objectif, c'est l'énergie. On parle de puissance, on parle de énergie et les entités, c'est plutôt le mégawatt et les GVH. Demain, le monde va changer. Le focus du périmètre, c'est plutôt un bassin versant supra-régional avec des réflexions le fait que la ressource d'eau est multifonctionnelle. En Valais, il y a déjà aujourd'hui une grande capacité de stockage de l'eau. 1,2 milliard de mètres cubes est déjà installé. Vous voyez sur la carte, c'est toujours une question aussi de relation. Ça fait 1,5% de volume de lac Le Mans jusqu'à côté. Et le plus grand, c'est bien connu, c'est la Grande Ixas avec les 400 millions de mètres cubes. Tous les aménagements sont construits à cause des besoins d'énergie pour le pays, pour la Suisse. 
L'utile essentiel aujourd'hui, c'est primeur, ça c'est for la force hydraulique. Mais l'utilisation demain, la question est ouverte avec le réchauffement de clim, climatique et évidemment aussi avec la, les besoins de multifonctionnalité. Sous la demande du canton du Valais, FMV a réalisé une étude de base sur le potentiel hivernal de la force hydraulique. Cette étude répondent aux besoins de la Confédération de mieux anticiper les conséquences de la stratégie énergétique 2050 avec la sortie du nucléaire et une dépendance accrue aux importantes étrangères en hiver. Cette étude détermine les possibilités d'augmentation de stockage de l'eau, inventorie les contraintes liées à la protection du paysage, de l'environnement et de la biodiversité. Tient compte du calendrier des retours de concession, ces droits d'eau qui reviendront aux communes au bout de 80 ans. Et ce processus qui va intégrer les besoins des populations en eau commence à présent pour les trois prochaines décennies. Le résultat, on a un potentiel d'environ de, 650 millions de mètres cubes en vallée de plus d'augmenter, qui correspond à une production hivernale de plus que 2 TWh. Avec ces 10 TWh de production force hydraulique en Valais et les 3 TWh de consommation, le Valais est un canton de vo à vocation exportatrice. Il contribue donc à la sécurité d'approvisionnement de la Suisse. Notre entreprise, FMV, va tisser de nouvelles relations avec les distributeurs des villes helvétiques et d'autres partenaires en Suisse, tout en optimisant grâce au retour de concessions, ce que nous appelons à FMV l'usine hydroélectricité Vallée, qui devrait se construire sur la base des bassins versants suprarégionaux et tenir compte de besoins d'autres que ceux qui sont strictement énergétiques. Dès lors, il faut intégrer désormais dans nos réflexions le fait que la ressource d'eau est multifonctionnelle et qu'elle doit satisfaire aux autres besoins que la production d'électricité. Citons notamment les besoins en eau potable, en eau d'irrigation pour la population, pour l'industrie, le tourisme, l'agriculture, mais évidemment aussi pour la préservation des réserves naturelles, la protection des eaux et de, et de leurs organismes vivants et de la diversité des espèces, mais également les aspects liés à l'augmentation des risques naturels, comme la protection contre les crues. Il faut donc une gestion coordonnée de la ressource d'eau le chantier est énorme, car, mais, il, mais le défi doit être relevé. Désolé pour le dépassement. Wonderful, thank you so much, Raoul. Okay, next up, this one, Laurent, <laughs> is on the side. Horvat from Blue Arc. Merci. Uh, to the board first, uh, I would like to say thank you to the, to the team uh, the, that organized this event. Seriously, this morning was absolutely fantastic. Uh, and it's quite a challenge to, to, to do it. Uh, and there is something I'm very proud and happy. I don't know if you look at the uh, uh, Ronaldo. And we are a little bit like Ronaldo. We don't have Coca-Cola, we have water. Which is quite fantastic. Uh, Blue Arc. Blue Arc is based, uh, was created by six cities in Switzerland, in the Valais, uh, near Verbier. And the goal of Blue Arc was to help startups, SMEs, uh, citizens, to create water project. Therefore, if you, you do something on your side, on your laboratory, you can go in you know, one scale, uh, and we give you all access to, to, the, to the data and to the system. Uh, and what is very important, and this morning you, list, uh, you heard that some companies are taking data with a drone, with, a, with a, a device, and what is very useful today, these are the data. Why? Because we can take decisions with this data. And what we are doing at the moment, we are working also with uh, the FMV to see what kind of data we can put together on the water. And believe it or not, it's not very common, not in Switzerland and not even in Europe. Therefore, we work also with Water Europe to help us in this process. And we need to have, uh, in order to, co to compare data, uh, here you have a glass, and here you have the same glass. But if we don't use the same word, ver and glass, it's impossible to understand 
uh, therefore they cannot connect. This is the same. Uh, the, the example here, it's the, you have temp, it's not the same as temperature. Therefore, we are using the taxonomy that together we can use and we can exchange the data between the cities. Also, what is very, very important when we use the data is to put a sensor on, uh, first on a pipe, somewhere on, uh, with a GPS. It's located here in Lausanne. Uh, therefore, we can say uh, how many liters go from one pipe to the other pipes. So it's very important to put the data somewhere on the map. And what happens usually? Usually it's, uh, I have my own data and I don't share it with you. Uh, that's what happened with most of the companies because with startups, also with big players, uh, because the data, um, I would like to own the data. Uh, and what we would like to do, what we envision, is that we share the data between us. Why? Because when a startup needs data, therefore they can come to us and they have live data to use them and not to scratch their head and say, oh, uh, is it real or is it bad? Is it true? Is it false? Uh, and also what we are doing here, for us, we are cities. Therefore, we need help from SMEs, we need help from the data, but we need help also from the, the big players, so that FMV or, or the private companies, to work together. And what can, um, what can you do uh, for SMEs? Uh, if you are SMEs, you come to us, we, we can share the data with you. Uh, if you are academic or are students, it's the same. You work on your um, uh, office, a small office, on your labo, and you need to go one-to-one -one scale. It's easier. And for the citizen also, it's very important. We always forget to use the citizens. Uh, and they have, uh, we are citizens, by the way. All of us are citizens, and we have idea. Therefore, it's to bring also the, the feedback from the citizens. We're always afraid to go and to talk with them. Uh, this is my contact. Don't hesitate. I'm very happy to, to help you if you have uh, any questions regarding water. We also work with, not only we are based in, uh, in Valais, but we go all over Europe and all over Switzerland. That's our goal. Wonderful. Thank you, Laurent, for that presentation. Okay, now we've come to our lady of the afternoon, Laura Garot of Cluster All Solutions. Laura. Thank you. Do you hear me? Can you hear me or not? Um, you're speaking a bit softly, but okay. I think it's we okay. can hear you. <laughs> so, um, I don't have my... Can you help with her slides? There it is. So, hello everybody. I'm uh, happy to be here uh, today. So, I'm here to present you the Cluster Hall Les Evian. So, the Cluster is a, is an association working on promotion and economic development of the water sector and solution allowing the preservation of heritage and efficiency on the resources. So, we are working around four thematical axes, smart water, energy, plant-based plant engineering, and water and biodiversity. So the cluster was created in 2019, um, and then in 2020, we launched the first thematical committee uh, around our four axes. In 2021, we launched two uh, huge projects for us, which was the, I will speak about it a bit later, uh, which are the ESA La Blémont in partnership with the European Space Agency and the Campus Connecté du Léman in partnership with the Mister Ministry of Research and Innovation uh, in France. So in the beginning, we were 39 members. Now we are already 70 members. So how we generate money? Uh, most of our budget comes from public subsidies, so the, we are around 80% uh, of public subsidies now, but the aim is to reach uh, 50 by 2024. We are also, uh, uh, get, uh, in part of the project is also memberships, donations, mandates and call for projects. Our clients are our ecosystem, which means public authorities, companies, research centres and universities. Our main activities are organizing and managing the committees uh, I talked about before, facilitating project creation in our ecosystems and managing and coordinating projects. So I will quickly talk about three projects. So the first is a willow nursery. Uh, so we are going to create a willow nursery which provides willow branches for plant-based engineering works in a, ter in a territory. The second, uh, second one is uh, in partnership with the European Space Agency, which is the ESA Lab. So he will, um, they will provide us an ESA expert for project owner who has projects on satellite imagery. 
And the third one is the campus connected element. So this uh, campus is a third place when people can uh, follow uh, learn e-learning courses. And for the continuing education, it would be focused on water-based uh, jobs. So the, how it's organized. So we have a board constitutive of 12 members, a director, an executive committee, and then a steering committee. So the steering committee is constituted by the responsible of each thematical axis plus the team. So the team is constituted by two permanent positions, Bertrand Cousin, which is the direct, who is the director, and me as a project manager. We also have a student, uh, Clarisse Lefort, who is, who is uh, working on the Willow Nursery, as I, uh, I talked about before, as a study officer. So who are our clients? It's our ecosystem. So our ecosystem is uh, around, mostly around Lake Geneva in France and in Switzerland, but it's also going uh, through the Canton du Valais until Grenoble in France. And it's small and huge companies, but it's also research uh, centers, university, and uh, collectivities. Oh, sorry. We also have uh, institutional partnership who are really important, as with the European Space Agency, uh, Aqua Valley, France Cluster, and also the Ministry, as I said before. Uh, what we need, the cluster needs visibility in order to, uh, to increase and strengthen the network and to help facilitating projects. We also need bankable projects on which we could obtain mandates uh, for the management of this project. And we need partnership, as I said before, uh, to increase the part of private funding uh, our, for our association. Uh, the goal is to reach uh, around 100,000 uh, euros uh, by 2022. So if you have any question, please don't hesitate. You have my uh, email address and my phone number. And thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Laura. Just a reminder, questions we will be taking at the end. You can submit them even via the chat if you are watching us online. Or, of course, you can raise your hand when it is question and answer time. Okay, next we've got Olivier Ferrari. Yes. <laughs> uh, I hate to shock you there. Coninco from One Creation Solutions. Thank you. Great pleasure to be here. Hi, everyone. So align your investment with your value. Who we are, One Creation Cooperative is a privately owned investment company with an open-ended capital dedicated to impact since 2010. And I have a company under the name Coninco Explore and Finance has had the mandate to manage the asset of the cooperative since the beginning. And one named as a pioneer in sustainable finance engaged since 2003. What are we looking for? At first, we are looking for investor, clear. We want to offer these investors to be aligned with their investment value. Second, we want to preserve their wealth. This is very important, we have not to forget it. We want to build a better and fair world, and we want to leave a legacy for future generations. On the second size, more interest for some people here and company, we are looking for investment. We are sustainable infrastructures, impact-driven private companies, listed company tradi tradi transitioning towards COP21. Where are we investing? Our listed equity portfolio invests globally. Our private equity allocation has started in Switzerland and now expand in Europe and infrastructure projects are focused on Europe. Our investor, our associate, for a cooperative, we're speaking about associate. We have individuals. Today, we have pension funds, we have NGOs, we have professionals, corporations, we have family office, we have company, and we have municipalities. We can say we have the cooperative of parties, no. And here, to resume the, the movement on you're right, you have the investors, I had tell you before. They subscribe, they join a community. We are working to develop a community around the world. We invest in all the sectors who will have a positive impact on the environment. We are not here to accuse we are doing something wrong. It's not doing wrong. We are all actors of what was happened. We have to look in the future. We are looking in front of us. 
what we are looking, company who will have a positive impact on the environment and will generate revenues. And with the revenues, we were able to give dividend to our people, to our associates. But one point, innovative for, innovate for a regenerative world. We speak about that this morning. We focused, the Earth is the only planet that we have so diversified in the solar system. ESG, in 30 months, everyone is, in the world is becoming ESG. That's wonderful. A little bit critical. The SDGs girls are an agenda. And what we have, we have the limitary boundaries. This is very important to understand each company we are looking for, what are their impact from the things they need to, to realize and to sell and to implement and how the consumer are involved, our impact and the limited boundaries. One limit, for example, we need 1,000 years to recover where we were 10, 20, 50 years ago. And that's very important for us to go through that, to have data to help us to understand the company we're investing on. For example, a diversified portfolio private equity that we have, we have today's 13 company, and uh, we are very proud. One is, uh, was chosen by the foundation of uh, Bertrand Picard. And just to show the impact on the environment, especially on water, Astrocast as the name indicates, is a satellite, is communication, but we were able to survey ocean, we were able to survey forest, rainforest, and everything else, it helped us. Mabon Etoile, we are reducing the packaging, we are using tools that we use normally one time, we were able to use until 50 to 70 times and more. Sterilux, we are in the medicine, Sterilux, we sterilize instruments that were used only one time at the hospital or for veterinary and others, no, we can use them that they, they won't be able to use with less than 4% of the water we needed to use uh, before. And TRS, TRS, like the name in the uh, indic, is tire recycling solution. We have billions of tire around the world, in river, in lake, in ocean, and we have to reduce it, and we are close to uh, an eco-circularity economy. The eco-circularity is really the future that we can launch. We have no more waste. Forest has no waste. Everything is something that we can use, and at the end of everything, everything we produce is used. We have to integrate it to reuse. A glass is not becoming a glass tomorrow, but we can do a lot of things for the future. We give return to our investor. It's not two, three, four times the, the investment. No, we are, we are with the company, we follow them, and we give return to our investor. So you have the website, you can join us if you want. Great pleasure to be with you here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier. And for our next guest, we're going to go back online. I'm looking for Lorenzo Niola of Hatch Collab. Lorenzo. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, for, for being here. And so um, I'm Lorenzo. I'm from Hatch Collab and the head of ecosystem development. Next. Hang on just a second. OK, now we're with you. Go ahead. Okay, so we founded everything four years ago in Geneva with the aim to, to support a niche of entrepreneurs uh, using technology for, uh, for the SDGs. Um, we are in the profit with purpose space. Next. Um, as we know, like Europe is leading the way in terms of sustainability uh, and also Geneva. G Geneva will be the, the, the sustainability capital all over the world. It's almost several NGOs, foundation and corporate headquarters. Next. Why Hatch? Uh, we are here because we are uh, offering a different services and support for entrepreneurs. On one side, a residency program. On the other, a lot of knowledge transfer and tech support within our network. We built a network of uh, more than mm, 3,000 members, and they are here to help entrepreneurs and founders and companies to grow. Next. So these are part of the mentors that we have in our network, in our community, in our family. Uh, they are coming from 11 countries, very diverse background, and from several uh, uh, countries again. And they are able to help. And these are the, this is the secrets of, of our program. Next. These are our team. As you can see, different people from different backgrounds across for-profit, non-profit, sustainability, and more. Um, next. These are some numbers behind us and our reach. So we were able to, uh, to scout and to reach out more than 2,000 impact-driven startups and companies. 
Um, we uh, choose 29 to be supported in our program. Our companies raised more than $105 million and they were able to increase the valuation before enjoying our program of more than 70%. Next. These are some of the events uh, that we joined when we were speaking and also some uh, press articles around us at European level and Swiss level. Next. This is the, the numbers about our pipeline of companies. So where we are looking for a solution in which country. So of course, as I said before, Europe is leading the way in these terms, but also other continents where we are. And DAC uh, is, is predominantly uh, in this space with the highest number of solutions. Next. Looking at our uh, distribution of companies uh, and, and SDGs uh, in our pipeline, as you can see, the combination of uh, clean water, uh, the SDG 6, 14, 13, 12, and, and 11 are combined, are, are, are covering a, a very important range. And this is where we want to have more entrepreneurs that are solving and tackling these goals. Next. Next, some case studies. Uh, this one is uh, a company that we are helping at the moment We're using drones to attack material pollution of water, such as plastic. They work with several fast-moving good companies and corporates and governments and NGOs uh, across Europe and Asia. Next. This is a, a collaboration we had with a, a global foundation around refugees. So this is another way to collaborate with us. Next. Next. This is the sample of software that we can have in, in our solutions. So uh, we can detect and help solutions around water, specifically in the safe space, in the sanitation, in the health and hygiene, but also democratizing uh, and focusing on circular economy. We can improve the current water framework. Uh, there are a lot of tech solutions that we are discovering every day. Um, also, uh, we are promoting within our activities and programs and collaboration inclusivity and biodiversity first, but also it's important to attract, engage, and retain talents in the water space because the, the, the industry have to grow and, and to innovate and have more impact. At the same time, collaborating with us, meaning also driving responsible digital transformation. Next. These are some numbers from our last event that we had uh, two months ago. So many people reached from so many countries and a lot of interactions. Next. Uh, what we can offer at the moment is an accelerator program for up to eight, 10 ventures per year. They will be selected about, uh, based on the tech solution they have and the impact. And we are starting selecting now for the program in, that we start in autumn. Next. These are some of the partners and uh, ratios we have on, on the field uh, within our network from large NGOs, large corporates, and academia. Next. So why we're here, we're here because you're looking for new companies, entrepreneurs and startups in the tech and water space. And on the other, we're looking for partners to support these companies in giving them access to market and access to capital. Next. Thanks a lot. This is my contact. Happy to reach out later. Very nice. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. And for our final presenter in this pitch session, we are going to stay online and invite Simon Yonkur. Are you with us, Simon? Yes, hello everyone, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. Um, my name is Simon, I work as a project manager at Sevas, and I'm going to talk about the Swiss Water and Climate Forum. Next, please. As Sevas, we are the center for entrepreneurship in water and sanitation. This means that we support water entrepreneurs uh, on all stages. Ideation, incubation, acceleration, and scale up. We've been founded in 2010 in Switzerland, but by today, we've gone global. We work with all, in over 40 countries and help to uh, scale up and make it reality out of more than 300 enterprises and companies through our different support services. Next, please. So as Sivas, we're also uh, convinced that climate change and its effect on the water cycle does not care about the divisions that we've set up as a society. It resents um, silos, sectors, and political divisions and political parties. Next, please. We also think that usually the debate about climate change and the water system 
happens on a very high level, global to national level. This is not a bad thing. We just think that these efforts must be complemented by a push to try to understand what it actually means on the regional and local level, to understand where we can actually um, get into action. Next, please. So this is why we want to launch the Swiss Water and Climate Forum. This is going to be a pilot event happening on the 9th and 10th of September 2021 in Villisau Lucerne. So this is not a conference, it is a larger scale project incubator to tackle climate and water related challenges at the regional level in Switzerland. We want to promote resilience to climate change through the promotion of projects that are uh, related to these, to these issues. So why in Villisau, you're asking? Because we want to move out of the usual and traditional hubs where these kind of events usually start and move into the context where this kind of uh, innovation is most uh, urgently needed in the Swiss regions that are currently, in terms of regional development, in need of these innovations. Next, please. So what we want to achieve is this double-sided integration on the horizontal side and on the vertical side. The horizontal integration is uh, referring to the reach out, the outreach to all sectors, private sector, public sector, civil society and research. We want them to bring together during the forum and help create an environment where people that usually do not collaborate with each other collaborate and create something together. So the vertical integration refers to this focus on the regional and local level. We want to understand what is happening uh, in the debate uh, on the global and national level regarding water and climate. And we want to find local answers to these global questions. Next, please. So this is our road to impact. Uh, although the forum itself is a two-day event, it is actually embedded within a two-year cycle of activities. So we have this input phase where we work together with focus groups, experts and regional partners to create a basis upon which this two-day design sprint then will happen with all kinds of different stakeholders. So at the end of the two days, we want to be ready to implement and support eight to ten projects that are sustainable, innovative and help increase climate resilience in the Swiss regions. So you as a participant, you can come to the forum, connect with people you, you would not have connected otherwise, and you can create and develop project ideas that you can directly implement and catalyze change through it at the end of the forum. Next, please. So these are the partners that are currently involved. This is a network that by now is growing every day almost. Um, we are still very, very open to people who would like to engage. And we try to do this as, as, as open as possible and trying to understand what are the needs and interests of the different actors. Next, please. So this is also the main message or claim I would like you to take uh, home is engage. You're uh, very, very welcome. And we're very thankful if you like, follow and share uh, information about the Swiss Water and Climate Forum. We are more than happy to have you as a guest and participant at the, the forum to collaborate and create together with us new and innovative, innovative initiatives. But also, you are free to contact us and discuss ideas. Just to give you an idea, our focus groups are working on different uh, topics. So agriculture, youth, entrepreneurship, governance, um, working on initiatives uh, revolving around resilient crops, eco footprint in agriculture, but also political solutions for, uh, to increase youth participation. And also topics about transparency across supply chains when it comes to water use in the industrial sector. So next slide, please. We hope to hear from you soon. Um, engage with us and hopefully together we can find local answers to global questions. Thank you very much. Simon. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Okay, so now it is time for some questions from our audiences. Uh, Frank, do we have anybody online? Not yet, or we do have somebody in the room. There we go. The microphone is coming to you. George, Max, are you ready? Um, uh, oh, you don't have the, the, okay, so. That's okay, so Frank is coming to you. I come to you, yeah. <laughs> With the microphone. Oh, there it is. Wait, we've ah, got it. Here. Now we've got it. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I would have, have a question to, 
to Blue Arc. Um, can you make an example on how this data can be given access to mm. startups or SMEs uh, about water data? Uh, I know for experience that these the kind of data are very, very difficult to access. Uh, sometimes uh, there are um, privacy issues. Uh, people, especially companies, are very reluctant on releasing data. Sometimes also the public is reluctant, and even though you should release the data. So, can you give some examples? Yes, of course. Um, when you would like to create a digital twins, a digital twins is that you recopy the, uh, the, the infrastructure on the, on the computer. Therefore, we have smart meters that we installed, and we have the data from the, uh, the, the amount of water that we are sending into the, the pipe. Therefore, what we do, we, first we anonymize the data, uh, but to the startup, there is one startup here at the APFL, and what we did, we gave them um, the one part of the in Verbier, and we give them the, 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 the details, but not, uh, they don't know the, the sensor is, belongs to Laurent, uh, it's anonymized, and therefore they can work on that. Uh, and you're right, usually it's extremely difficult to, to get the data. Um, we have data from uh, sensors coming from the company Beep, I cannot say. Uh, it's the hell of the work to get access to the data. Even if we acquire, we bought it, the data belong to us, and it's impossible to extract them from them system. We are locked. And therefore, what we tend to do now is to unlock this data, discuss with these suppliers, um, and say, uh, look, if you would like to continue to work with us, and you would like us to acquire more of the sensors, uh, you need to do something. Uh, and therefore, what price? we... What price? What, a cheap? Uh, zero. No, it's, when you start to negotiate, we need to buy, I don't know, 10,000 sensors. You say, no, the data belongs to us. Uh, do we agree or not? <coughs> and if they don't, there are other customers. And usually, they are big companies because the, the shareholders love to have the data, uh, private data. Therefore, for us, we say, okay, if you would like to work with us, we do something that we can give back to the, to the citizens because we also would like to give to the citizens the data. Our vision, our goal is that when you turn on the, the tap, uh, the water on your uh, house, you should have the quality, the exact quality of the water in, uh, that you are drinking. Today, this is not the case, but let's imagine in the future that in 10 years or 15 years from now, it is possible. Therefore, we have a lot of uh, entrepreneurs or um, people that come to us, we have a system. Therefore, we try to work with them. There is, uh, I, 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 I should, um, we have a lot of people coming, because Verbier, it's a ski resort. And they have a chalet in Verbier. Um, usually, they don't go every day to Verbier. They go once per week or they, once per month. Therefore, there is the water that is inside of the house. Usually, the quality is bad. You know, because it's stuck for uh, one week, two weeks, three weeks inside of the house. Therefore, you are not supposed to drink this water because the quality is not good. Therefore, what about having a system that when, if you have a chalet somewhere, uh, there is a system, you turn the, 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 the water and the light is red, and when the light is green, you can drink it. Interesting, interesting idea. <laughs> you have a chalet in Verbier. <laughs> I do not have a chalet in Verbier, but I had not thought of um, the water being bad after, of course, that the house is empty. Oh, sure. Okay. All right. Who else we got? So we have a question, uh, maybe online, that we can take, uh, and this is for Javier. So I will ask it in uh, in French. Uh, Javier, déjà la la première question, uh, qui sont les utilisateurs de de la plateforme? Et la deuxième question, c'est quelles sont les collaborations avec les les autres cantons uh, en Suisse uh, par rapport à votre stratégie? Oui, bonjour. Vous m'entendez bien? Oui. Ok, parfait. Alors, euh, tout d'abord, la question des collaborations. Alors, euh, tout au début, la stratégie a été faite en 2012 et puis elle a été faite par rapport au but cantonal. Donc, il y a une soixantaine de pages avec toutes les mesures à mettre en place au canton du Valais. Et de ce fait, la stratégie, elle est, disons, pour l'amener à bien interne. Ce qui n'empêche du tout de collaborer, mais pour certains projets ou pour certaines coordinations, pour des sujets comme l'assainissement, 
como las eclusas, como la gestión de la fuerza hidráulica, etc. Pero la estrategia es la misma en el interno del cantón. Es que no quiere decir que no podemos colaborar con otros cantones, pero nos colaboramos realmente, como se dice, por proyectos, no por el ensamble de la estrategia. Y puis la primera pregunta, sí, la plataforma O. Alors, la plataforma O elle a été faite pour tous les acteurs possibles, c'est-à-dire autant pour les communes que pour les publics en général, que pour les écoles qui pourraient trouver certaines informations pour les étudiants, etc. Mais le but en fait de cette plateforme n'est pas de créer une nouvelle base de données cantonale ou une nouvelle base de données comme Bloir, Caméra de Fer, mais d'avoir une entrée où on arrive à trouver toutes les données possible et qui se trouve après à gauche et à droite sur d'autres bases de données. Donc c'est vraiment les points d'entrée, surtout pour les cantons, où on arrive à trouver certains infos, même pour les bureaux d'études qui disent, mais en fait les cantons de Valais, est-ce qu'il a des données météorologiques ou des données de débit sur RMH Oui, non, comment Et puis c'est ça le but. Mais après, il y a aussi tout un but informatif pour savoir où on est avec cette stratégie, est-ce qu'il y a des projets phares qui ont été mis en place Oui, comment, de quelle façon et idem pour les projets de recherche. Les projets de recherche, malheureusement, on a plein, parce que les cantons du Valais, tu as les, les châteaux d'eau, comme on dit, de l'Europe. Il y a beaucoup d'universités qui viennent ici, qui veulent faire son projet, mais après, ils partent. Et on n'est même pas informé de ce qu'ils ont fait, les buts, les résumés, les données, etc. Donc, le but est de vraiment, à nouveau, centraliser tous ces infos sur une plateforme pour pouvoir vraiment donner un retour à, à la population en Valais. Do we, have, do we have any more questions from the audience? Anybody else have anything they'd no like question. to ask? Otherwise, I have a question for, for Olivier. Oh, please. Uh, what is more difficult, uh, to find the right investors or to find uh, the right investment? <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to find not the right investor, to, to convince investors, because the cooperative is a non-speculative system, you know? Uh, it's like Migros, like Raiffeisen or Coop, but it's as disruptive. To find the right investment for one investment we are doing, we analyze 30 to 40 companies. And uh, I'll say, these are figures, 50%. In fact, you have a good project, okay? You guys arrive, present, but we have no market. And, and he's convinced that he's right. He's convinced that he, ha he has the, the world in front of him, but there is no market. And very hard to say no, because the idea is incredible, or it's too early. The 50% the, 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 the of the, the 50 are sold. Uh, the problem, the price, what they are looking for, their investment, is so high that we don't go with him, because it's unbelievable. No, please, go on the floor. Uh, we are not in uh, IT or we are not in project uh, life science. Uh, we are more linked to industrial project and the margin and to be a, a licorn if you go in the stock exchange is not exactly the same. And that's another project, you know. Uh, we arrive to do something, discuss to them, and in the last 25%, sometimes it's just the IP. What is the IP? D did you have a specific IP or you don't? And the problem, if you don't, It's very difficult also because we, we, it's a race that we have against the environment, against what happens now. So that's, that's more difficult to find the right project. Any question in the audience? Yeah. Can you give the, the mic please to... Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for, for the interesting discussion. Question for, for Lorenzo. I was wondering, do you incubate and help startups to engage with uh, public actors to create potentially public-private platforms? So, for example, we have Le Canton du Valais today. I was wondering if it's maybe partners you're considering going forward. Thank you. Uh, yes, we are strengthening collaboration between also um, public and local administration and governments. Um, we have also companies in our portfolio that are serving governments and local, uh, and local administrations. So yes, uh, we have companies working with cities, with uh, uh, regions, with uh, public administrations. So yes, both in Europe and in other 
regions such as Latin America and more. We have a strong network of, of, of members in our community, and we try to, to have these communities to grow, to speak the same language with different players. Because sometimes it's also a matter of different languages and, and, and speed, because usually startups and, uh, and small companies are, are acting faster than public or local uh, administrations. But yes. Anyone else in the room uh, has question to the... Got in the back. Ah, there is one at the back. So you, you are, all of you are into collaboration and into um, uh, yeah, trying to, to bring people together to solve issues. Um, first of all, do you see potential collaborations between yourselves? I mean... Uh, on, on the stage and, in, and online, and, and also maybe between yourself and the previous pictures that, you, that we've heard this morning and, uh, and in the previous sessions. Hmm. Yes, I can. Of course, I think this is... Um, uh, il, uh, you may look that we are competing each other, but it's not the case. Uh, uh, and as a matter of fact, this, this morning I spent my time just sending emails to the, the companies that were already um, incubated in somewhere because uh, I have some ideas that, and I think the, it, it would be great if our role would be to remove some of the hot potatoes we're going to give to your kids. Uh, and if I can help someone else, uh, my colleagues, I would say Lorenzo, for example, friends from uh, uh, Simon, I would be delighted. I think this is my role to do it. And there, is, there are always... Yeah. And for us, as example, we are in the Alps. And there is absolutely nothing between the, in the Alps, the cities in the Alps. For example, Davos have exactly the same problem than us, and in France or in Italy, we are the same. Therefore, we are doing a network in the Alps. Um, and I'm sure that Lorenzo is doing some business in South America or in Europe, but not in the Alps. Therefore, maybe we can share the expertise and experience that we have. Um, and this is the same. You work uh, with a lake, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe there is something that we can use and we can share. Uh, and as I say, we are not here to, I would say, to compete for the ego, uh, but uh, to remove some hot potatoes um, that we are serving to our kids. <coughs> you can hang on to that. You can keep that. Did yeah. any of yeah. anybody Laura, else want to add? Yeah, Laura, or Laura also. Yeah, to give you a quick answer. Sure, we save why municipalities and others, and today is, uh, I shared a lunch with someone and uh, we have defined a meeting, a video conference, and I think we have something to go ahead really impacting. And I will just say a sentence. We have to build a world we will never see. That's the main defile, defi that we have in front of us. And um, we have to connect, and I've seen a lot today. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Laura. I completely agree with what I've said before. And, uh, Wait. Uh, doesn't work? Okay. Thank you. So I said that I completely agree with what you said before. And for example, in a cluster, some of the pitchers are already members of the association. So this is a good example that partnership and collaboration can work. And I think after, this, after today, we will have uh, more collaboration and uh, uh, and we will strengthen really the, the network uh, around these problematics. Maybe, maybe, yes, okay. It's function? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, I think, also thanks to all of you for, for these um, uh, excellent ideas. Uh, I, it's very important. Um, uh, in, if I speak from uh, FMV or bien Je prends la parole de FMV, c est, c est, ça c'est le monde de l'infrastructure, it's infrastructure. And I speak for, as um, water power, ça c'est the installation buildings, huge, and uh, from history, it's a huge investment dans, um, in history, mais aussi uh, <laughs> uh, um, in future. Um, 
mais euh, pas c'était c'était construit dans le monopole. Hmm? The privacy, the privacy doesn't matter at all the, the same time. Huh? But I'm sure that we have to collaborate together, all of us, the regions, the different regions. Le Valais, et ça c'est un, oui, un bassin versant assez important, comme on a vu et lu et entendu. Um, but il y a, il y a encore des énormes challenges pour futur qui, qui viennent um, de nous, ça c'est clair. Et c'est seulement la collaboration qui va nous aider. Et je pense aussi à un élément très important, ça c'est qu'on n'a pas de problème de data, pas d'assez data, on a problème de trop data. The data management, it's not a problem. Um, uh, um, uh, de, de, pas d'assez, oui, um, c'est, c'est plutôt le problème de, de comment on, on gère les data, la gestion data. Et c'est la question de ce passe, comment on peut gérer les, dat- les dates ensemble. Et c'est plutôt la question de data sharing, le futur. Et je pense que c'est important aussi pour tous, et évidemment aussi pour les, les privés, les entités, de travailler ensemble. Euh, Raoul, juste une petite question. Est-ce que vous pouvez préciser la gouvernance euh, des forces motrices valaisannes, euh, peut-être pour le public Alors la gouvernance, c'est comme dans toute la Suisse, euh, la même chose, l'énergie, la propriété d'énergie de toutes les sociétés d'énergie, c'est dans les mains publiques. Et en Valais, ça c'est le FMV, euh, force motrice valaisan, qui est 100% dans les mains euh, valaisan public, c'est-à-dire le canton qui a la plupart, la majorité, et la minorité, c'est dans les mains des communes. Mais ça, c'est exemplaire. Et aussi pour ça, j'ai dit, dans l'époque, c'était, l'infrastructure était construite par des mains euh, publiques. Hein. C'était les cantons en Suisse qui ont construit les grands barrages. C'était le monopole qui a payé. Mais maintenant, il faut trouver le bon chemin. Je dire aussi, il faut trouver peut-être des, des, des business plans stables pour futur. Parce qu'il ne faut pas oublier que... Euh, si on construit d'infrastructures, ça, ça, ça c'est toujours une longue histoire. Hein. On cherche aussi des investisseurs qui sont d'accord de payer pour 80 ans. Ou bien que je, ça, ça, c'est la, la patience hein, qu'on cherche. <rire> Et ça, c'est un peu le challenge. Mais encore une fois, le, le governance vient plutôt par là parce que c'est quand même un, un besoin public euh, de la société, de notre société. Et pour ça, nous sommes très, très tachés, très liés avec euh, les cantons, les communes et le fédéral en Suisse. Any question in the audience? Anyone? We still have time um, to take some questions. There's no question on Hermit, I think. Hermit also uh, in the audience, uh, please. There is a question on Hermit. Can you say it? Or oh, wait, I can have a look. Uh, what is the question? Une quest- Alors, c'est une question pour Laura. La participation des corporates comme Danone et Vian, la gestion des discussions et des collaborations entre les parties prenantes. Euh... <rire> Je D'accord. lis juste la question que. <rire> euh, c'était bon. Ben on... Je vais essayer de parler un peu de la gestion des. C'est pas très clair. Donc, la gestion des discussions et des collaborations entre les parties prenantes. D'accord, donc nous, et la participation des corporates comme Danone est bien. D'accord, donc je peux vous parler un peu de manière globale. Donc euh, nous on fait des, des commissions où chaque membre peut participer. Et ensuite, euh, s'il y a des projets précis, donc n'importe quel de nos membres peut amener un projet au sein, euh, au sein du cluster. Ah, ok, bon, j'ai parlé en français. Euh, peut, peut apporter des projets au sein du cluster et ensuite on, on fixe les, euh, les acteurs qui pourraient répondre euh, à ce besoin. Et ensuite, on les fait se rencontrer. Euh, là, voilà. Donc ça, c'est, euh, si, je pense que ça répond à une partie de la question. Et donc, en fait, c'est comme ça que toutes euh, les entreprises et les collectivités et aussi les universités, centres de recherche peuvent se rencontrer. C'est que euh, grâce à nous, on fait vraiment le lien. Et euh, une petite PME peut rencontrer euh, une euh, multinationale comme un centre de recherche, comme euh, un organisme de formation. Tout dépend du besoin en fait, qui est demandé pour le projet. Je ne sais pas si ça répond à la question, mais oui, ça n'était pas très clair. 
Euh, je ne sais pas, c'est la question que, que je viens de voir. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions dans la salle Ouais. C'est moi qui ai posé la question là, sur les, les interactions. Et euh, je voudrais la, la préciser. En fait, je crois qu'elle concerne euh, en tout cas trois des, des speakers. Euh, je ne sais pas si je suis assez prêt. C'est euh, l'eau euh, se trouve à l'intersection euh, des territoires, des acteurs économiques, euh, politiques, ainsi de suite. Et donc, euh, et, euh, au moins trois des, euh, des speakers, je ne sais pas pour Olivier, mais euh, vous êtes euh, au cœur de ces débats euh, pour combiner les actions, qu'elles soient constructives. On a eu une votation euh, il y a quelques jours euh, qui est euh, une illustration de, de ce débat et comment avance le, la, la, le, le sujet en fait, euh, de la gestion des pesticides par rapport euh, aux nappes phréatiques, ainsi de suite. Donc on est dans le concret. Est-ce que vous pouvez euh, donner des exemples de comment vous arrivez à construire ces collaborations de façon positive, en embarquant vos parties prenantes Parce que c'est votre travail de tous les jours. Peut-être, euh, Laurent, est-ce que euh, euh, tu es dans le concret, sur un territoire euh, géographique euh, euh, relativement précis Après, on pourrait peut-être euh, avoir l'éclairage euh, plus large du, euh, au niveau du... Euh, allez. Je peux vous donner un exemple réel avec l'irrigation. Nous avons demandé aux farmers, nous avons demandé aux farmers, quels sont vos plus grands problèmes Et le numéro un à tous les farmers était d'irriguer. Parce que ça prend toujours. Pourquoi Parce que dans les the Alpes, parfois uh, les fields sont extrêmement small. And one of them has 350 fields. Therefore, he has to take the, all the stuff to 350 to irrigate. And if he does not irrigate, he cannot produce enough grass. And he said, this is, I, cannot, I, I need to use my mom, she's 84 years old, to, to do it. And this is the same with all the, the, the farmers. Therefore, we say, if we help you to irrigate, uh, and you don't have to go to each uh, Are you okay? And they say yes. Before we went to, um, we, we have every year we have some challenges, and one of those challenges can you help the farmers and also help us? How much water do we have? Do we need? Uh, and a consortium uh, from students, SMEs, startup came with a very nice solution. Uh, they say, okay, we will measure the amount of water that you have in the river how much water you have uh, on the citern, and how much water do you use, but also how much water do you need. And what we discovered is that uh, to grow the, 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 the crops, you need the exact amount of water. It's like us. If you drink too much, your belly is like this. If you don't drink too much, you're going to die. And the flowers and the plant are exactly the same. And what uh, usually we discover that they we put 50, 5-0% of water above what could be healthy for the, for the flowers or the crops or the, uh, the, 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 the plants. Um, and therefore, we use less water and we decrease the time the farmers are going to irrigate. Therefore, it's good for us. Why? Because we have less and less glacier and even if we're in Valais, we have, um, in some location, the glacier just simply disappeared and we don't have water. And during the winter, we have less and less snow. It means that during July and August, there is zip on the source. And these farmers have to rely on, on the water. Uh, this is exactly the same I heard uh, here in um, uh, the Lac Clément and uh, Neuchâtel. The farmer need to have more and more water. The farmer need to take the water from the lake. Neuchâtel, um, because of the global warming. And I'm quite old. When I was 10 years old, uh, my teacher at the, the class told me, you know, one day we will not have enough water in Valais. And I laugh. And 40 years after, I say, mm, 
here we are. Therefore, this is the, um, to answer your question, we go to the citizens, we go to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the people and say, what are your problem? We go to the cities, what are your problem? We go to the, 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 the companies and we ask them, what are, and how can we help to solve? Usually it's you buy a product and it's sold, and usually it does not exist. This is also what I mentioned before, it's that um, the solution that we will find uh, in, the, in Verpier will not be the same solution than here in the Lac Léman because the, the amount of irrigation is different and the crops they are, we are using in Verbier is not the same than in Neuchâtel. It's complementary. But the solution that we will find will be... Um, uh, uh, we can recopy. And also, uh, after I can... Um, we, they asked the question, what is the, the collaboration between the state, between the canton? And I will say, uh, in Switzerland, we work in silos. And if a canton does something, the other, another canton will do exactly the same study, uh, and the other canton will do it. The other, so, and so, and so, instead of you reusing what, therefore everybody is reinventing the wheel, um, instead of collaborating. And I think that's if we can break these silos, instead of using one million for 26 studies, which are exactly the same, we can use this one million to, do, to go much deeper into the reflection and to be much more impacting. Then. Nicolas, je vais le dire en français. C'est juste un peu plus easy. Deux propos. Nous devons investir dans la technologie. OK, il y a une votation qui a été refusée. La technologie est là aujourd'hui. Je vais prendre deux exemples. Un, je suis à l'aise, on n'est pas investi dedans. Il m'en voudra peut-être. Non, ils ont bien voulu. Eco Robotics. C'est une société qui dit, voilà, j'arrive, je vais mettre par technologie le polluant chimique exactement à l'endroit où il est besoin sur la plante. Et c'est la plante qui va l'absorber et ça ne va pas être le sol. Donc, on n'est plus dans un arrosage fou. Donc, on a, on a aujourd'hui ces technologies. Je vous prends un deuxième cas de partenariat public-privé. Nous avons une commune dans la région. On pouvait construire un écoquartier. Mais malheureusement, la taille des égouts ne permettait pas d'absorber l'eau de ce nouveau quartier. Eh bien, il, a été implémenté, il sera implémenté dans les immeubles. Une technologie où toute l'eau, je ne parle pas de l'eau de pluie, je parle toute l'eau de l'immeuble usagé, va arriver dans un système où il n'y aura plus que 10% de cette eau qui va repartir aux égouts et tout le reste va être utilisé pour les besoins de l'immeuble, arroser les gazons, arroser les jardins qu'il y aura autour de cet immeuble. Donc on voit typiquement là, en partenariat public-privé, une considération de la technologie, une considération du capital. Mais voilà, nous avons besoin de capital à long terme. Et ça, c'est la grande difficulté parce que toute la finance... J'ai créé un département bancaire de gestion de fortune en 1983, j'avais 21 ans. Un truc fou. Ben, le problème, c'est qu'entre temps, la finance, elle a passé de à disposition de l'économie. Elle est devenue à sa propre disposition pour créer l'argent par l'argent. Et ça, c'est la difficulté qu'on doit contourner aujourd'hui. Mais il y a les moyens. Et là aussi, il y a un partenaire public, puisque nous, on a des municipalités qui sont des associés pour aller de l'avant. This doesn't. Oh, yes, it does work. Allô, oh, allô. Ça fonctionne. <laughs> If you wanted to add to that, sorry. <laughs> Raoul. Alors, peut-être encore un élément aussi là-dessus. Les bonnes expériences, um, je pense, je ne vais pas répéter, mais en, um, en Suisse, il y a quand même un, un fédéralisme. Et avec ce fédéralisme, il y a quasi dans les DNA, il faut travailler dans une façon participative. Et, um, je fais seulement un exemple. Um, chaque fois, quand on a une nouvelle concession, il faut trouver des solutions. Les trou des solutions sont terrain. Faut, euh, les énergies renouvelables, ça c'est clair, ils sont sur, sur le terrain, c'est clair. Alors il faut travailler avec les communes, il faut travailler avec les propriétaires, il faut bien expliquer qu'est-ce que le plus-value aujourd'hui, demain. Il faut intégrer, je dis ça aussi, peut-être il y a des, des, des NGOs aussi, aussi, aussi à la, dans la salle. On connaît aussi la, la, les, des projets qu'on travaille avec des, des groupes de suivi, des groupes de travail accompagné avec les collègues, de, je dis ex, explicite, explicite, des collègues de, des NGOs, de VVF, Pronatura. Et à la fin, on travaille ensemble de trouver la, la bonne solution. À la fin, c'est toujours aussi une pesée des intérêts. Il y a l'économie, il y a l'énergie qu'on cherche d'optimiser, mais par contre, il y a, évidemment, il y a aussi l'écologie qui est de plus en plus importante. Et 
Il ne faut pas oublier, il y a aussi l'acceptance. Et l'acceptance, pour nous, ça c'est quasi le, la porte d'entrée. Et on n'arrive jamais de trouver l'acceptance des, des peuples, de, de, de gens qui, 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 qui sont sur terrain, mais s'ils ne sont pas intégrés dans, dans ce processus. Au moment où on a quatre différents projets en vallée, avec quatre différents groupes de travail, qu'on travaille ensemble de trouver la bonne solution. L'idée, c'est toujours, on arrive à la fin une, de, de trouver la bonne solution et on n'essaye pas de bloquer un projet qui est en train de se développer. Voilà. Mais c'est dur. <rire> So maybe we can ask also the, this question about collaboration to, uh, to Simon, uh, because uh, Simon, uh, what you're trying to do is uh, to put together, together a lot of uh, actors with this uh, Swiss Climate uh, Forum. Uh, so if you could just explain the, the strategy and maybe what could be done you know, uh, to, uh, on, the, on your part of Switzerland and on our part also of Switzerland. So can we, how can we join forces maybe? Yes, so in the end, it will, to my view, it will always be, have, it has, has to be a case-by-case case, uh, solution, no? but I mean, we're very much convinced that uh, we should start by trying to understand if we can actually reach a common understanding of the issues at hand, um, because if we, if we don't achieve this kind of common understanding, it's going to be really difficult to uh, agree on a solution, right? So, but uh, we think that everyone is interested in the in the, in this at least at the basic level about um, solving the, the the challenges that come um, uh, ahead of us and we also think that everyone is interested in reducing costs and i think there's still many 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 inefficiencies when it comes to um, um, the way we do things as uh, an industrial complex as a water complex as a public sector and so forth and i think This is the, the, these are the focus points that we should um, uh, really concentrate on to try to understand, okay, where is our society uh, working in an inefficient way? Uh, where are we wasting resources? Because where we're wasting resources, we're wasting money. And I think we, if, we can, uh, uh, if we can find ways to save money, it's going to be much easier to align people. Um, this is at least one thing everyone is going to agree on and it's not a political debate, so to speak. So, um, yeah, it's a, a bit abstract uh, uh, response there, um, but I think that's, that's more or less the philosophy that we're trying to push through, through uh, the Swiss Water and Climate Forum. All right, thank you so much, Simon, and thanks to all of you for being on our panel today. Thank you so much. Round of applause, everybody. Lots of takeaways and just in time for our next coffee break. Speaking of collaborating, you've got another 45 minutes or so to do some networking and collaborating of your own. And we'll see you right back here at four o'clock for the last part of today's sessions. All right, we'll see you soon.
trying hard, but you want to be my friend. Ain't no place to hide, ain't no one to run to. Here we go, here we go again. Call my bluff, I'm going to be here till the end. I'm the one you ride, I'm the one you ride to. If you don't want to change, ain't no place to hide. Just can't let you go Lord knows that I've tried to You said I was the only one No one likes being lied to You made the sense check, check. and left me with the pieces Now I wanna burn all the bridges between us
Feel the rain crashing down All around this empty town I'm searching for the lost and found But you don't care, you're unaware Keep moving like the scars aren't even there It's in the air like a blazing flare Points in blaming you, you did not know
The midnight man. Yes. I live in the night and in the day. And Dracula. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm a house vampire. <laughs> Vous, vous ouvrez la, la PDF ou le... Enfin, on préfère PDF, mais... Okay. Je vous ai envoyé les deux, c'est pour savoir. Quand, quand, quand euh, hier, c'est hier. Ah, hier. Ouais, 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 hier. Parce qu'on a des gens qui, qui ont pas même... Ah, non, 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 je vous ai envoyé la dernière. C'est pour ça que je me demandais... Euh... Non, 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 pas de last minute, j'aime pas ça. Yeah. I mean the last second. Yeah, exactly. ouais. Yeah. <rire> Puis ça a été, là, les, les pitchs ah, oui, très bien, ça a été... Très bien marché, la technologie pour la plupart. Pas de bug Oui, ça va, on a des petits, mais okay. parce qu'on sent que j'ai un peu long. Mais... Mon petit tablette. Pas de souci. Okay, ça, c'est le programme. Hein? Oui, c'est le programme. Vous êtes section, session 4, voilà. Donc, Water Resource Management. Boom, là, là. Yes. Très bien. Donc voilà, j'ai ici une version du 17 juin 2021, donc euh, hier. Hier, yeah, ouais. Hier, à quelle heure, heure Mais ouais. il m'a beaucoup attendu. Okay. Non, non, c'est pas ça. Bon, il va faire oh, une heure, mais on va, on va, on va, on va voir. On va regarder. Je vais tout de suite te dire. I prayed for my downfall and I found a way to reconcile Cause in my heart it's not worthwhile It's a bloody battlefield where some go down, others heal In the end it's all the same All you can do is play the game
look up all these lies Don't care if I capsize Oh no Empty hearts and neon lights The playing with my mind Gotta get out of here tonight
walks across the pavement, hoping it will cave and swallow me whole. Wonder why my mind keeps on spinning. This is how I live and to me what it's all. Why am I like this? Something's always a miss. Can't put my finger on it, but it's there. Wait for it to subside, but my mind won't apply. Waiting for the clear. Check, 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 check. <risos> Ops, <risos> Samash. <risos>
Did someone ask me to unmute? All right, we're going to get started very soon here with our last pitch session of today's Innovate for Water Lausanne. So I'd invite you to take your seats, settle down, close the doors, and we'll, we'll get started in just a moment. All right, how was that last break? Good, good stuff. I saw a lot of networking, a lot of chatting going on outside. I hope it was very productive for you. Welcome back to our last session of the day, to all of you here with us, and of course, everybody joining us online. Great to know that you are back out there and spending the next couple hours with us as we wrap up Innovate for Water Lausanne. Now it is time, as I said, for our last pitch session of the afternoon, and we've got another fantastic group of presenters that will be led today by my colleague, Stuart Orr, who is from WWF International. Stuart is a leader of WWF's freshwater practice at Worldwide Fund for Nature. He has spent his career devising and testing innovative approaches to freshwater conservation by engaging business and finance and focusing on emerging themes such as water, food, energy nexus, economic incentives, bankable financing, and water-related risk. With that, Stuart... The floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. I know this is the end of the day. I hope you're a little bit energized to get through this, uh, but it's great that you're still with us. Thank you so much, and thanks to those online today as well. We have seven more speakers. All of them are excellent uh, presentations, startups with very innovative ideas. It was great uh, spending the time to look over their bios and what they're going to present you today, so please pay attention. And think of your questions online and in the room, because at the end, I will be coming back to you uh, for those questions so that we can get some more out of these guys. So today's st session is water resource management and protection, water management in corporate supply chains. Uh, we're going to be looking at things from flood protection to digital twins to smart sensors. And we're going to kick off uh, with our first speaker, Javier here from Aquaforti. The floor is yours, Javier. Thank you. I think I need the microphone. Yes, you do. <laughs> my bad. I told you I would forget. Uh, there, there goes my... Uh, there goes my... Good luck. Thank you. Well, thank you for this invitation to this very constructive uh, event. So thank you very much. And I will start my presentation. Well, at this point... Um, Discussing or talking about a water stress situation is a little bit redundant. I think that we all agree that there's a huge water issue that we need to address. <laughs> and this water situation is even affecting uh, Switzerland. That's why for us, sustainability through innovation, it's part of our core model. And it's actually one of our main challenge because we come into agriculture mainly, and we're gonna talk about agriculture specifically. With a, with a new paradigm, and uh, we need to permanently educate our customers, the growers, food companies. So this is our main challenge, actually, to, to, to show them that there are more sustainable ways to solve the common uh, or some of the main common issues in agriculture. So aqua for the company has three main business units. One is agriculture, the other one is it's, it's in buildings and industry, and the other one is animal health. But considering that agriculture represents the biggest challenge 
and sustainability. Uh, agriculture currently in precision irrigation represents around 80% of our activity. So what is Aqua4D? Aqua4D is a water smart technology that will change the way water behaves in the soil and the way water interacts with any mineral or organic material present in the water. And it's, as mentioned, they mentioned in a few uh, presentations before and in another seminar that it was yesterday actually, usually many of the techniques to restore degraded soils or to irrigate with saline water, they use a lot of, they create a lot of wastewaters or you need to use uh, many non really sustainable practice like, like using a lot of water to, to wash out the soils. And Aqua4D is a technology that will restore the salt saturated soils due to intense agriculture, due to droughts and so on using less water in the process. And that's actually why recently we're opening, in the last, especially in the last two years, many projects just on water saving, while before was usually restoring soils, and very nice to, of course, have this uh, soil uh, water savings uh, at the same time. So we have a share value program, and in within this sharing value program, one of the main things for us is identifying growers challenge. So I will just go quickly through this as an example. For example, we work with the Almonds Board in California, where they have this challenge of reducing 20 percent the water demand. So how do we work? Usually it's a standard aqua 4 project as we work with them. This is hardware as a service. This is our, our philosophy. So we usually open a, a comparison plot together with aqua 4 and we start measuring the changes that aqua 4 is creating in, in the interaction water soil plant and adjusting. And we measure. We measure conductivity, we measure water penetration in the soil, we measure water retention in the soil, we adjust. We use different kind of technology, we measure the plant behavior, we check for, with our robotics and so on. So for us, again, it's hardware as a service. We install this technology, we create these changes, we measure and we adjust and we provide data. And again, after the result, this is just one of the examples, for example, in soil moisture, at the same time productivity, because we're going to improve the growing environment of the plant by improving the soil health. These are, for example, some projects in, uh, in North America. As you can see, they can be even powered by solar panel, because, by the way, Aqua4D use produce more energy than it used in its production. The system itself is totally sustainable and we bring sustainability to food growers and agriculture and, and companies. These are some projects in Africa where we're very active as well. These are some projects in, in South America, one of our main markets. Actually, we are currently present in more than 40 countries, 43 countries specifically, but of course our focus are arid and semi-arid areas like Chile, Peru, California, Central Asia. These are some projects in Asia as well. And this is very interesting landscape project. We are now start to, to equip some important you know, football clubs here in Europe. So they, they use 30% less water in maintaining the, 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 their, their training fields, the main stadium, this is super interesting. And of course, we're working in some other places also by maintaining the green urban, urban areas, by keeping them with less water. Um, some projects in Switzerland and in Europe. So I don't have much time left. So we're currently working, taking this into a larger scale to save more water and we're funded by the European Union. Uh, we contribute with 11 of the 17 sustainable goals. We're a certified solar impulse uh, company and we collaborate with many entities. Actually, we are one of the main partners of the Swiss embassies around the world with their Swiss water program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Well done. And you almost stuck to time. Uh, the next person is going to be joining us online. My Brits, are you with us? Hello. Hello, how are you? My Brit is from Alva World. My Brit, the floor is yours. Thank you. So at Alva, we have developed a range of high protein vegan foods that are super sustainable, super tasty, with our unique microalgae golden chlorella. Next. So we started four years ago. Uh, we come from two very different backgrounds, Mina and myself. I'm for the financial industry and she herself was the head of protein R&D at Nestle. And together we are building the sustainable company um, to, to really have the best types of proteins that require the least resources. Next. 
We're also very, very proud for what we've achieved so far and all the help and recognition that we're getting. Uh, here are just some examples. Next. So really the problem is that we've got a big shift happening. People are moving more and more towards sustainable foods, vegan foods, but one third of Europeans who no longer consider themselves necessarily meat eaters are not really satisfied with what is on the market. Next. The current solutions that are out there, for example, the Beyond Meats and Impossible Foods are still not ideal solutions. Um, they're generally genetically modified. Uh, they're unhealthy with very, very long ingredient lists with a lot of ingredients that not even I recognize and are not actually that sustainable. Microalgae, on the, on the other hand, we know is an exceptional source of nutrition. It's naturally high in protein but it has the problem of this very strong algae taste and this very green color. So next. What we've developed is we've developed a very unique golden chlorella. So it's a chlorella which is 100% natural and it's naturally yellow. It's naturally um, rich in, in omegas and carotenoids, ob obviously all the amino acids, and therefore a superfood and can be incorporated into food. So what we're doing is we're shifting out of supplements into the food industry so that we can have a much, much bigger impact. Next. So going on the healthy side of it, we've developed this range of high protein vegan foods that are all high in protein, meaning over 20% rich in magnesium, potassium, zinc, vitamin B, and obviously have to taste good. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a spot in the food industry. Next. The next is the sustainability, which is what we're really here to talk about. Um, as far as today, from the full life cycle analysis that we've done, we have the most sustainable protein available today on Earth. Next. We require an average 44 times less water than for the production of beef. Um, so on average, also with arable land and with CO2 emissions, we're talking about roughly 4,000% less than for the production of meat. Next. Our production is a fermentation process. So we have a trade secret on our strain. We feed the uh, algae with, with waste sugar. It is fermented. It is fermented in the dark, so it doesn't have the chlorophyll. After that, it's washed, it's dried, and it's packaged. So it's 100% natural. There's no transformation done, and we can use uh, re renewable sugars and waters. Next. We cover 11 of the SDG goals. Um, next. Then going on to the taste. So to really be in the food industry, it's got to be tasty. And this has been a big part of the disruption in food tech. Next. So we've created many, many recipes as well with the ingredients. So with our range of products, we have finished foods and we also have the pure chlorella that people can incorporate into everyday foods without changing their habits, without changing their palates uh, so that everybody can enjoy the, the chlorella. Next. It's not only a superfood, so rich in magnesium, potassium, zinc, vitamin B, all of those super high benefits of minerals and vitamins. It is also an excellent natural binder and therefore also very good to work with plant proteins, but other with other types of products to help the binding facilities, which uh, plant pro uh, proteins generally have issues with. Next. We see ourselves as the next step, the next trend after plant. Plant have had their space, plant has opened up a lot of doors, but it can still be done better. And this is where microalgae sits in as the next trend coming on and possibly before the lab meat kick in. Next. Um, our sales so far, so we are in, in large... So Menov and Co-op, but also in Sunstore, uh, we've gone very much online as well during COVID uh, and our sales have tenfolded over the four years. Next. And we have a very experienced team 
Um, our CFO has worked in many smaller companies and big companies. Our logistics is a pharmacist. Our sales director is a medical doctor who has a lot of sales experience. Uh, our marketing director has worked also in large and small companies. And our R&D director uh, is an expert in everything to do with microalgae. And he is now developing not just the golden chlorella, but also a white chlorella and moving into the red chlorella so that we can use it in dairy applications, but also in meat applications, which is our next project. Next. Thank you very much. Thank you, my Britt. Very, very, very uh, informative. Appreciate that. Um, next, we have a chance to learn again, and hopefully I will learn, what a digital twin is. Uh, Matteo, Dalmico, yes. Uh, yes. you oh, okay. are next. Uh, from Water Jade, the yeah. floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening to everybody. It's a pleasure, really, to be in presence after so much, so much time remote. And uh, my best greetings, I come from Italy, from Trento, and so it's a pleasure. I'm the CEO and founder of MobiJS, and I'm here to present the digital twin of the catchment uh, of the watershed, Water Jade. How much water is there, and when will it become available? These are the questions that many, many ma water managers are asking, especially like hydropower companies, water utility, they need to plan the production. And of course, to our target this question, probably the catchment approach would be the best, I think, the best, the best way to do. However, what we look in our experience in, this, in industry, still historical data are used to feed very simplified spreadsheets. So some, somehow the, the, the historical data are reprojected to the future. And with climate change, this is becoming very insecure and risky, and prone to risk like interruptions, damages, or inefficiencies, or even penalties in the market. To solve these issues, is we have developed a technology which has its core in a, in a, a collection of hydro and meteor data, an analysis of hydro and meteor data, and these are feeding a physical model. Uh, the physical model has the capability to, to follow the whole water cycle at catchment scale, uh, high resolution satellite data are then used to um, to um, let's say to integrate possible missing in situ data and to offer scalability and finally a layer of AI is to is used to uh, improve the accuracy of the system and so here comes our vision I hope to reply to your question in my experience what I see a lot of utilities hydropower and also water utilities have their own digital twin. But it starts from the gate of the company and goes to the households. Mm. But what happens for the catchment? This is where we come. We want to integrate the digital twin of the company with the digital twin of the catchment. And how do we do this? Through a web platform where the customer can log in and see a variety of services already implemented once you have configured your system, the hydraulic system, where the plant is, the geomorphology, the data analysis, then you can access to monitoring services, for instance, for the snow, for the river discharge, or for reservoir level, and then forecast services in the short, in the, in the, in the long run, and also decision support system. So that we impact, we, we think that this solution is going to impact hydropower companies and what are utilities to for the monitoring, for the optimization of the, of the production, for handling the stream events, and planning maintenance. And this, of course, has to do with SDG 6, <laughs> and in particular SDG 6.4. 6 what can we do for the Rhone River? Well, the Rhone River, the Rhone Basin, is characterized by no presence in, in the winter. And this can be easily done the monitoring of the snow can be easily done with the system. But also in water inflow predictions, the red dots are hydropower companies that are located along the, the, the river basin. We can support these companies to inflow predictions for their plants. The benefits, we control the whole water cycle. So from the snow in the mountain to evapotranspiration to also a water table, we have uh, compared to, uh, let's say, state-of-the-art technology, twice as much accuracy, and this also, the, the benefits is also for the company to have a better consultation with the public. 
If we look at the competitor map, we see a kind of a cluster. So there's no compart, there's no GIS compart, has one cluster, then the hydro hydraulic is another cluster, and also the decision support system is another cluster. So what we would like to do is to implement all of this technology. And we sell the service like uh, 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 the, the, the prediction like a, a say service, and we would like to go for the decision support system with a data as a service and software as a service. Uh, we have already strategic partnership. We are providing these services to more than 20 plants in Italy, hydropower uh, companies, like the second, the third, and fourth largest hydropower company in Italy. And also we have a proof of concept in Spain and in Portugal for water utilities. And we, are, we have strategic partnership with, a, a, let's say, software developer for water utilities and turbine producer. Uh, this is our team. Uh, together with me, there is a, a team of young scientists and developers that are eager to go to the digital concept of the, of the catchment. And what we are looking for is one million investment in three years plan to improve the software engineering the front end for the DASS, the river monitoring, and the marketing and sales. So this is all for my presentation. If you really think that gold, the water is the new gold for this century, we think that with a digital twin, we can have the power to extract this gold. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Matteo. That was excellent. Appreciate it. Uh, Ramzi Buzerda from Drupal. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ramzi, CEO of Drupal. Maybe you know Drupal before. Drupal is the internet of water. And why we have to build this internet, I will tell you more now. Next. You have to, you have to, uh, Thank you, you. With, a, with a grain. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. So, basically, today you use every second on Earth a water asset. It could be a water treatment system, it could be an appliance, or it could be sanitary wear. Every second on Earth, but you don't know what is happening with those assets. From the vendor, from the service operator, from the end user. And the aim of Drupal is to connect those assets in order to monitor them, predict their maintenance, and enable water and energy savings. Because all those water assets rely on water usage and water quality. Today we have built a system, which is the small communication smart module that we can connect on water assets, either because we need a sensor, then we will plug a sensor on this, or there is already a sensor inside that asset where we can understand, read, and send insights to our cloud in order to manage the data and provide services. Why we have done that? Because simply all those assets rely on pressure, flow, temperature, conductivity, pH, and many other parameters. This simple module can understand those parameters and send them to the cloud. Actually, it's not about sending data to the cloud. It's about leveraging those data to provide services that will change the way we understand water usage. Because water usage is more than gold, it's actually life. Because water usage is the most intimate information of your behavior in the daily life. We have integrated this hardware in our SaaS business model. Basically, we give this hardware because the barrier to transform those old assets into smart assets is the barrier to change the legacy and to migrate this legacy. To cope with that, we give the hardware. You pay only for the service. And today we are really proud, after three years, to say that we will achieve almost 500k ARR by the end of this year and to land 30 key customers around the globe. 
As you can see, we are already able to provide tangible impact and value for our customers. It ranges from vendors like Kurita in Japan, from property managers or owners like Lombardier, private bank, famous private bank, maybe if you are in the liquid business of banking, you maybe know private banking. And of course, I'm proud here also as Altis to uh, use their testimonial. And we started exactly here on the campus where we were able to identify the energy that we can repurpose from water coolers in cold rooms for restaurants. And we have enabled already there strong value for them. Of course, alone you go fast, together you go further. And I'm really proud to lead such amazing team with medtech experience, with global corporate experience, with smart metering, and also banking because you always need cash. We have already set different strategic partnerships like Cluster O. Hello, Bertrand. And of course, my ask today is to connect to the Internet of Water because we have already closed our seed round and we plan to raise a three million round by the end of the year because we would like to go in the US market to open a branch. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you are interested, happy to connect. Bye. Thank you very much, Ramsey. <clears throat> very good. Um, next is uh, another person joining us from online. Ari, are you with us? I am here. Can you uh, hear me? We can hear you. Ari is from Cinefis. Uh, Ari, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to thank everybody for their attention. So I'm Ari Kamburis, one of the co-founders of Sanafis. Uh, you can put the next slide, Julia. Uh, Sanafis is a company that we launched in 2016 uh, with the goal of democratizing technology to um, as address some of the problems that uh, are uh, inherent in sustainable development. Uh, next. So before I go into what we've produced, I would like to ask you three or four questions. If you're a vegetable farmer and you were able to reduce your consumption of water by 20% with an increase in quality and an increase in shelf life, that would be something that would probably interest you. And if you were a field crop farmer and by planting at the optimal moment and managing uh, your irrigation systems, if you could gain 15% on your yield, that's probably something that you would be, uh, you would be uh, very interested in. And uh, if you were a winemaker or wine farmer and you were able to reduce your use of phytosanitary um, products by 25% uh, and having less pollution in the, in, into the soil, that's probably something you would want to look into as well. And finally, if you were an organic farmer and you were able to optimize the use of your auxiliaries, the bumblebees, the lady, uh, the, um, the mini wasps that eat other wasps and all of that sort of kind of stuff, or your, your fetal treatments, your biological fetal treatments, that would, that would probably be interesting to you. Uh, next, uh, Julia. And so what we came up with was a system of connected sensors, a, a sensor that measures the temperature and the humidity of the soil, the temperature and humidity of the air and the humectation of the leaf, the humidity on the leaf. And we send all that over a low range radio network that's called SIGFOX. And then the client or, or cooperative can consult all of the data in an online application. Next. So we're working on the problem of optimization of water resources, reduction of uh, sanitary, uh, phytosanitary treatments, improving the quality of the production, the quantity in some cases, uh, refining the annual predictions by trace, tracing the um, climatic cycles. cycles. Uh, you may or may not know, but uh, even Meteo, Fr Meteo France is having difficulty doing predictions of, more than, of what's happening in the weather more than three days in advance. And finally, managing the, your budget constraints. Next. So the questions that I asked you were not hypothetical questions. They are, in fact, 
the results of three and a half years of deployment uh, in the fields here in France. So we have vegetable producers who have reduced their water consumption by 20%. Uh, with a better quality, and they've actually changed the manner in which they, they irrigate. Uh, in uh, corn and soy crops, we have an improved yield between 10 and 15 percent because they plant at the optimal moment, and they manage their water differently than they used to. Uh, in the vineyards, we've got a 25 percent reduction of phyto treatments, and in uh, biological uh, organic farms, we've got an increased efficiency um, when they gain two or three days, for example, when they leave them, when they release uh, the bumblebees for the pollinization and they've got better disease prevention because they can more uh, accurately apply the leaf treatments that they're using. Next, please. So our value proposition is based on environmental factors, financial factors, as well as organizational factors. Next. Uh, we're talking about a global market for sensors that's about uh, 2.5 billion euros in 2024. Uh, and the French market is, is uh, forecast to be uh, 22, 225 million euros in 2024. And we're also talking about a uh, population of clients who have pretty well integrated the new technologies uh, into their farm practice. Next. Uh, our business model is that basically we are two to three times less uh, costly than the competition. So for 424 euros, excluding that, you've got the equipment, a transmitter with two sensors, the data transmission, and the web application. Next. Uh, and what we've got in the pipes is a distribution deal with InVivo in France for 2022, uh, 2022 and a European <laughs> distribution with Copert in 2022 as well. And what we're looking for is other distributors and partners to grow the market share. And I think that's it. Thank you. you go. Thank you very much, Thank Ari. you very much. Thank you. Right on time, well done. Uh, our next speaker is also joining us online. Ian Padilla, are you there? Hello, I'm here. Hi, Ian. Uh, Ian is from WeGo, and uh, the floor is yours, Ian. Thanks. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, John Padilla. I'm CEO at, at WeGo. And uh, what we're doing at WeGo basically is exploring um, remote sensing satellite data analytics with machine learning, specifically to help uh, the energy actors, energy traders and producers to better trade um, and produce energy uh, in a more um, optimized way. If you can go to the next slide. Um, so basically, we are moving into, into this new world, which is completely uh, clean, or we want to be completely clean. clean. And this, this is coming with a challenge, right? In the past, it was really easy to predict uh, future um, energy production from coal, from oil, uh, from, from uh, different sources. But right now, it's uh, more and more complex uh, because of these renewable energies, right? It's really difficult to know how much wind, uh, sun, or water there is going to be tomorrow in order to produce energy. This is creating lots of uncertainties on the market. Um, energy price is uh, reaching um, record in terms of volatility, and uh, it's, it's spiking as well in terms of, um, of load, which is creating lots of... Um, unprecedented um, imbalances for our electric utilities, traders, and grid operators. Um, these for WeGo represent a, 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 an opportunity that we want to capitalize uh, the following way. Next. Um, so our weapon of, of choice in order to help all these actors better predict future energy production from renewable energies, it's the combination of remote sensing satellite data with uh, machine learning. Um, next. So basically what we do is that we combine several different satellites from the European Space Agency and NASA uh, with um, primarily radar and optical sensors in which we are going to apply our proprietary deep learning uh, models. And what we're going to have as an outcome is environmental variables that are the key in order to understand future energy 
um, uh, forecast. And in this case, uh, the, the environmental variables that we're considering are primarily water and snow for hydropower. Next. So um, the core technology of WeGo is how we're using machine learning in order to extract these key uh, environmental assets. So what you're able to see here is on the left, you see uh, the download um, radar data set from, from a satellite that using our deep learning model, combining with 250 million data point samples, we're going to produce the, uh, the image that you see on the right, which is um, a snow depth product from WeGo uh, which has 93% accuracy, uh, which is something unpredicted uh, till now. Next. So obviously these, these data, um, which is water and snow data with such um, accuracy that we can provide to our partners and to our clients, it's being used to optimize hydropower production. Right? In this case, what we are providing is usually two use cases that this data is, is being used for. The first one is to optimize short-term discharge. So what we can do is that detect as soon as snow is becoming wet, as soon as snow is starting to collapse, uh, we can inform um, our, our clients uh, that this is happening so that they uh, effectively uh, swap their operations on the dam so that they can capitalize on, on this um, edge information. This would be for short term, so this usually uh, we can help um, our clients understand this with five to ten days in advance. But what, what we're doing as well is um, seasonal forecast um, as well, primarily through our partners, um, which they are going to be um, ingesting our snow depth, snow water equivalent data that we produce directly from our satellites in order to understand what is the future water availability and therefore the future energy production uh, to be able that we that to be able to ensure a proper trading strategy of these of these water, which means how we're going to um, set up our power futures, um, how much energy we're going to leave for the spot market, how we're going to protect ourselves from imbalance, um, helping them uh, increase and in up to ten percent the energy produce uh, production and helping them improve um, uh, five percent the pricing of that of that energy. Next. So um, we have a really simple um, business model, which, which uh, goes per, per power plant uh, or per, per area that wants to be um, monitored that ranges from usually $5,000 to $20,000 uh, uh, to be monitored. Next. The market that we are uh, trying to capture is, is obviously the, the hydropower market to begin with. Uh, we're focusing in uh, the 20 plus thousand uh, power plants that are um, around, um, around Europe. Uh, basically, if we would uh, use our data analytics, we will help these electric utilities into optimizing this energy production through, um, a, through uh, this, this product will help them generate an additional 26 terawatts of, of energy without zero investment in new infrastructure, just by better usage of, of WeGo data. This um, uh, market opportunity for WeGo will represent around $100 million um, uh, dollars in estimated annual opportunity. Next. So this is the team uh, behind behind all these, uh, myself and Daria, which by the way is on site. So don't hesitate in, in bumping into her. She's the expert in all uh, the technical aspects of, of the company. So we're both leading uh, WeGo. Uh, Daria with me, she's an expert in special technologies. Um, uh, she has been, uh, she comes from, from the UN and she has been working for the, um, for the Portuguese government, um, doing primarily machine learning and just special technologies. Myself, I come from, from CERN, which is um, around the block. Um, uh, I have a background in software engineering and I have been part of, of Hewlett Packard as a business consultant as well. Together with us, we have Gonzalo, Tom um, and Hugo, which are our solution architect, earth observation specialist and environmental science um, um, uh, professionals that are helping us primarily in putting all this data together, uh, building the machine learning algorithms, building the supply chain from, from satellite to the final data set and connecting all these with our partners and, and clients. Next. 
You're quite over so, your time. Uh, Sorry, uh, well, I'm, I'm, here are a few references of different projects that we have been working on um, and the different proposals that uh, we're working on at the moment. Next. And the final goal for our collaboration is that we're raising uh, a million Swiss francs, which is already six, at 60% um, confirmed, and that uh, we're obviously looking for partners, collaborators uh, that want to test this data in their watersheds and in the hydropower plants. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jan. Sorry to push you, but we've got a tight schedule. So thanks for, thanks for that. No problem. Moro Nardocci, uh, last but not least from Seeds, are you with us? Moro. Is Moro with us? Yes. Ah. yes sorry, I was, <laughs> sorry, I was connecting. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm ready to start when you are. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Fantastic. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mauro. I'm the co-founder of Seeds, and I'm going to present you today is our Blue Barriers project. So, the way we transform ocean plastic into wealth. Uh, just as an introduction, most of you already know about 10 million tons of plastic enter the oceans every year, killing millions of sea mammals, seabirds, and fish, and entering what in the food we eat and in the air we breathe. So, I mean, this is a, a drama for everybody, but the good news is that 80% of this plastic comes from rivers, so it can be stopped. Unfortunately, stopping it is not enough, because most of the times for the municipalities along the river, stopping all that plastic means just getting a lot of waste that they didn't have before. So unfortunately for them, the best solution is just to let it go. That's why we need to, to transform what we collect into wealth. And this is what we're gonna see today. Next chart. So our blue barriers are a simple, but yet super effective technology for stopping collecting plastic and then transforming into new virgin, virgin plastic and energy. We are 100% effective in collecting river plastic. We have no impact on river life, nor boat navigation, and we can create local job opportunities. How we transform all this plastic and waste into value? Unfortunately, there's no silver bullet. Uh, this depends on the local infrastructure and depends on the local specificity. So for each project, we select the best technologies to, trans to get the most value out of the waste. Before we get into that, let's go to the next chart and let's see a little bit how we got here. So we have been founded in 2018, so we're quite recently we got uh, our first proof of concept in an artificial river with the University of Florence. Uh, we uh, registered an international patent and then we tested it on actual river in Northern Italy, confirming that we stop about 100% in standard condition and 92 in flooding conditions. During 2020, as you can imagine, most administrations have been defocused from uh, the environment, but we kept talking with our customers and we realized how important for them is to transform these uh, waste into value. That's what we have focused in 2020. Now, 2021, we have a strong traction back, seven projects under discussion, five sponsor, one already client and three distributors around the world. Let's go to the next slide so we see what are the general technologies that we envisioning to use to transform this plastic into value that is already high quality plastic that can be sold already a, a local market exists for low quality plastics normally for we envision for the future we will use pyrolysis but there's no yet uh industrial level pyrolysis technology ready so for the moment what, what we envision is we could use it to generate energy uh, in locally present plant, like the, the, the plant for producing cement or producing glass, or molding it to, into construction materials. We, we, from our test, we, go, we will collect, we expect to collect also a lot of organic waste, and this also can generate value, and we are collaborating with the University of Monena to test gasification to transform it into energy. Moving forward, all this value can generate a, a recurrent stream of revenues that can repay the installation over time, basically over, overcoming every adoption barrier and accelerating the global scale up. 
Our business model is very simple. We sell the barriers and maintenance public administrations. We make money on the recurrent value that we generate for the administrations. And we also have a series of sponsor or corporates that care for the oceans. And so they participate in our um, partner program. Moving forward. How we measure we impa our impact, we are not just satisfied like everybody else in measuring the tons of plastic collected because we don't want this plastic to end in landfills. That will be uh, 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 nothing, right? So what we want to understand is we want to optimize the plastic we recycle, the plastic we get value from. So we want to measure also the money, the, uh, the dollars that we generate for the local communities that are the one most affected by this plastic pollution, and how many local jobs we can create. Moving forward, we have put together with a small team. Uh, we're expanding strongly now, but we, have, we are a global team with uh, great experts in UK, Belgium, the US. Uh, so we are putting together, thanks to technology, a great team of experienced people, people with passion that are going to achieve this objective no matter what. Going forward, we have already a lot of collaborations. This is a small world. Um, we are collaborating with the Ocean Cleanup. We are discussing a potential collaboration in improving the barriers they're using for their interceptor. Race for Waters also is, a, is another Swiss organization that is very um, collaborating very strongly with us in order to identify the best technologies for transforming what we collect. We have few clients. We already um, have been certified by the Solar Impulse Foundation. And we're discussing also potential distribution of what we collect on a global e-commerce platform. Moving forward. So what, what are our, our needs? Actually, I mean, funds are important, but what is more important for us, a small organization with a great existing solution is more about connection with decision makers and make them aware that these solutions are affordable, effective, and can in some cases even repay for themselves. So this is the most important one, but also clearly donors, sponsors, and potential partners and technological partners will help us because this is a global issue so big that nobody can solve it on its own. So everybody should do its, uh, its part and we're going to crack this and limit the impact of plastic waste on the oceans. Thank you so much. It was great to be with you. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Mauro. Um, unfortunately, only one of my speakers was on time, but I've been given 10 extra minutes, so you've been saved. Uh, audience, questions, any immediate questions coming from the audience here? Think about it. I'll come back to you in a second. Anything online right now? OK, so let me start with you, Javier. Let's, Let's try to be brief in our responses if we can to try to get as much as we can in the extra time we've been given. Javier, great presentation. Can you tell me a little bit more about the business case? Because water savings aren't necessarily financially beneficial, but what are the other savings that your clients are receiving that make it affordable? Well, first of all, thanks. Hello, yep. hello, yeah. Well, first of all, first of all, in many places, water it is expensive. So just saving water has an impact in, in the wallet. But in most cases, it's energy, first of all, energy related to yeah. the water cost, because less water, less pumping is less energy. Yeah. And there's a huge impact also in CO2 emissions. Resources in general, because we also improve the fertilizer. So there's always, regarding to the irrigation, especially if there's a fertile irrigation process, we reduce the amount of, 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 of fertilizer and chemicals in general. And, uh, and as I mentioned in the presentation, we have a share value program where it's very clear where we have an impact in both farm management, but also in brand added value by having an efficient process. And it's very important that with Aqua4D, we, we are gonna improve the overall efficiency of the irrigation process. And when you just, when you start using the exact amount of water you need, the exact amount of, of nutrients, there's no waste. Right. And when there's no waste, you are efficient in your resources and at the same time, you're contributing to the environment. Terrific. Thank you very much, Javier. My Brit, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Good. Thank you for your presentation. I have a vegan daughter, 
And I showed her your presentation, and she pulled it out of the cupboard and showed me that she had bought some of this product. So I have tasted your product, or I've eaten your product. Can you just tell me a little bit more, though, uh, and again, uh, as quickly as you can, a little bit more about how this is actually fermented? I mean, what kind of scale are you talking about here? How big are your facilities, and what is required to actually produce this? Yes. So uh, we're an InnoSuite project uh, and a Horizon 2020 project. Okay. Um, and so we do all of the R&D uh, together with HISO in Sion. Um, and we have, uh, we've been um, encouraged to move to Fribourg, where we are building up uh, a larger scale production facility. Uh, we currently have, though, two partners in Europe as well who can help us uh, when we need more. Uh, than the five tons which we can produce uh, at the moment because we we re need to really reach the 50 tons within the next yeah. the next year. That's the number, 50 tons. Okay, thank you, my Brit. That's very helpful. Uh, Matteo, fantastic. I now understand digital twins. That's much clearer. I appreciate that. Thank you. It strikes me that there's a lot of other people that would be very interested in what you're doing. Insurance companies come to my mind. Can you tell us more about some of the other interested parties or potential clients yeah. that you might have? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, actually, when you say insurance, uh, I have to quote that we had a pilot on the River Rhine that in 2018 came to drought and in Germany caused a lot of uh, damages to many industries that rely on the water for cooling the plants and also for logistics. Just the BASF a huge German company uh, lost 70 millions in 2018 just for this problem. And so these companies are likely now going to insure themselves. Right. And of course, this kind of solution can help you know, this company, the insurance company, you know, to, to, to produce reliable models to, to target also this kind of, of, of extremes that are m very likely to be more frequent in the future. Fantastic. That's great, thanks. Uh, Ramsey was the only person on time. Thank you so much. Everyone I was very was worried there for a while because you were way behind, but you did very, very well. Uh, tell us a little bit more, Ramsey, about uh, the, the internet question is intriguing to me. I mean, you, the way you're sharing data and you held up this little instrument. Just, just tell us a little bit more about, about this. Yeah, that was my purpose. Um, indeed, this, this simple module actually can read analog and digital sensors. Yeah. It has embedded intelligence inside and can communicate in different ways with the cloud. And this simple module can retrofit existing water assets if they have embedded sensors, so like a softener, for example. Mm -hmm. Operator for a softener has a problem with salt bags. It's simple as that, but they cannot predict when they have to bring salt and to fill again salt. With our solution, they don't miss this opportunity again and they control the water quality over the time. Terrific. Thanks, Ari. Uh, oh, no, I'm going to Ari. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ramsey. Yeah. Ari, you still with us? Ari? I had to just turn you on. There uh, I go. Okay. I had to turn me on, actually. Thanks. <laughs> so, Ari, uh, your presentation was, was great. And I suppose from all the startups that I see, a lot of them are in you, the sector that you described. It's a very competitive space. So could you tell me a bit more about the financial, uh, almost the same question I have for Javier here. What, where are you finding the financial savings for your clients that is making what you can provide um, desirable? In terms of, um, well, when you look at the cost of uh, phytosanitary treatments, uh, you're, if you can reduce that by 25%, in some cases, you're saving up to 25,000 euros per year. Right. And uh, for the example, in, uh, for the uh, vegetable farmers, the financial, uh, when you reduce 20% of your water consumption, in France at least, the water prices, uh, you're moving from 11,000 euros uh, for um, uh, an exploitation that has about 15 greenhouses, uh, you're reducing it down to 7,500 euros. And so for small farmers, these are very impact. Uh, very impactful uh, financial uh, reductions. Right. Okay, very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Um, Jan, are you with us? Hello, I'm here. Good, good. Thank you. Uh, very interesting presentation. I'm, I'm, I'm learning more and more about AI all the time. We've tried to apply it to biodiversity in the field I'm in, but I'm, I'm learning how hard that is. But I, I can see the application that you've described. 
But you, you also, I, I have a similar question that I, that I had to Matteo. What are the other beneficiaries of what you're doing and, and the information you're collecting? You, you spoke a lot about the hydro sector, but again, I would imagine there's quite a lot of other sectors that could benefit from this. Do you have other clients in mind? Yeah, yeah. So we, we are exploring uh, definitely lots of lots of different use cases. Um, we have been uh, in touch with, for example, traders that are using this kind of data in order to feed their, their models, uh, because not only from the renewable energy production understanding, right, but as well from the consumption, uh, energy consumption based on, on the, the uh the differences in snow, etc., and from there uh, we can move to um, other, other, uh, for example, sectors like in, in agriculture. We have been exploring things like winter kill insurances, which literally are insurances that are protecting crops from um, from snow and below zero temperatures. Um, things like uh, dynamic um, uh, car insurance prices, uh, for example, in countries like like in Switzerland. Cars that are exposed to snow, they they have a higher percentage of an accident, right? So the fact that we could monitor uh, the snow, the, the average snow that a car will will drive to, uh, that can help into dynamically pricing okay. the risk of that car. Okay, terrific. Thank you. I know I'm at time, Frank. I've got one last person. Can I just go mm -hmm. to Moro for one question? Yes, thank you. Moro, you've got less than a minute, but we're very intrigued by your plastic idea for rivers. Um, it seems to me that your use of the collected plastic going into revenue streams should be connected to, to municipal waste as well. Do you have a model for working with municipalities for waste that hasn't entered into water systems to turn them into new revenue streams? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is a great point. Indeed, I mean, river waste is only one part for municipalities and municipalities are the ones that are normally the ones that are closer to the territory depending on the, the geography it's the regional authority that manage the, the rivers but most cases are yeah. smart municipalities that intervene so indeed in the collaboration that I mentioned at the end for selling the river waste online on a global e-commerce platform, we are actually addressing smart cities so that we basically manage two different flows for the waste management, the urban waste and the river waste, because they will be sold at different prices, right. but we are trying to give them one solution, so one-stop uh, solution for them. Thank you, Moro. Appreciate it. Please join me in thanking our seven guests today. And our fantastic moderator. Thank you so much, Stuart. Very nicely done. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, don't forget to put your mask on as you leave the stage. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are reaching now the end portion, please, of the day. And uh, to close it off, we have a lovely moderator who's going to be joining you now on stage for the Panel, the last panel, which is the protection of water resources, the importance of technological innovations, better transparency, and governance across the value chain. And for that, I'd like to invite up Victoria. Please come up, come up. Smaniotto from the Solar Impulse Foundation. Welcome. Okay, with almost 10 years of experience in the clean tech sector, Victoria now leads the outreach team at the Solar Impulse Foundation, so boosting the adoption of profitable solutions to protect the environment. Now in her current position, her experience in ecosystem building and community management in the clean tech sector, especially in Canada, yes, extensive experience true. there, allowed the foundation to create strategic partnerships with clean tech hubs globally, supporting the foundation in reaching its goal of identifying those 1,000 efficient solutions around the world. So with that, Victoria. The panel is yours. Thank you, Anna Maria. I see that the mic is working. I will switch now to French because I've been asked to run that panel in French and I will ask the panelists to join me on the stage. So with us today, we'll have Eric Vallette from Aqua 4D, Aqua 4D, pardon, je vais réussir à passer en français. <laughs> Jonathan Normand, um, qui est le président de B-Lab Switzerland. Et puis, uh, Monsieur Sébastien 
à, excusez-moi, <rire> exactement, à Potello, euh, qui est le chef du service de l'eau de la ville de Lausanne. Donc, merci beaucoup d'être venu et de m'accompagner sur ce panel aujourd'hui. Je vais passer euh, quelques secondes juste à vous reparler de ma fondation. Et, évidemment, vous avez vu Bertrand Picard, pour ceux qui étaient là ce matin, faire cette petite vidéo. Il, il regrette vraiment de ne pas être là avec nous. Comme il le disait, il le souhaitait vraiment. Il était à Paris aujourd'hui, donc il ne pouvait pas. Euh, donc la Fondation Solar Impulse a pour mission effectivement d'évaluer des solutions qui sont à la fois protectrices de l'environnement et qui sont efficientes, donc qui permettent d'avoir vraiment un aspect de, de, de coût, de, de, de savings, pardon, d'économie de coût pour les clients et c'est vraiment ce qui fait la différenciation. Vous avez vu aujourd'hui euh, quasiment une dizaine de solutions qui ont présenté aujourd'hui ont le label Bicorp. Euh, Bicor. <rire> ça, ça, ça y est, je commence à faire la promotion de Bicorp aussi, mais euh, pour le coup, le label solution efficiente de la Fondation Solar Impulse. Euh, J'en profite pour vous dire qu'effectivement, vous avez vu qu'on a atteint nos 1000, donc il y a deux mois, et Bertrand en parlait tout à l'heure. On a aussi annoncé à l'atteinte de ces 1000 trois outils très clairs pour aider les entrepreneurs en technologie propre à atteindre le marché plus facilement, à savoir un guide. Donc une fois que vous êtes labellisé, vous allez pouvoir en fait être facilement retrouvable par des utilisateurs potentiels, donc des, euh, des grandes corporations qui auraient envie d'avoir accès à vos solutions, parce qu'ils ne les connaissent pas toujours. Hein. Le, le but, c'est de vous donner de la visibilité. On va aussi faire des publications pour amener les gouvernements à comprendre qu'il y a des solutions. Donc j'entendais par exemple un des derniers pitchs, le besoin c'était que les, les parties prenantes publiques des gouvernements comprennent que les solutions existent, qu'elles sont efficientes et qu'elles peuvent les aider. Donc ça aussi c'est pris en compte dans un des outils qu'on développe. Et puis deux fonds, donc là pour l'accès au capital, encore là dans vos slides, need, la plupart du temps on voyait qu'il y avait un besoin de financement, d'accès au capital. Deux fonds sont donc, euh, ont été annoncés il y a un mois, un pour des compagnies plus early stage avec BNP Paribas et Aliad et un fonds pour des compagnies plus matures euh, avec Rothschild. J'en ai fini pour ma présentation, maintenant je vais passer la parole à mes panélistes, c'est comme pour vous qu'on est là aujourd'hui. Euh, on va essayer de faire ça en gardant euh, l'idée de la journée, à savoir, présentez-vous, oui, mais en suivant deux axes. Quel est le problème de départ des parties prenantes avec qui vous travaillez Et puis la solution que vous apportez euh, en réponse à, à ces problématiques. Alors on peut commencer par euh, vous, s'il vous plaît, Eric. Merci Victoria. Donc Eric Valette, je suis le directeur de l'entreprise Aquacadé. On a déjà eu une présentation juste avant avec Ravier. Donc on, on en agit sur le traitement de l'eau euh, pour modifier certaines propriétés physiques de l'eau dans plusieurs euh, applications industrielles. Donc notre plus grande activité, c'est dans le domaine de l'agriculture pour avoir une plus grande précision de l'eau d'irrigation. Donc euh, aujourd'hui, il y a un gros challenge au niveau mondial, c'est la protection alimentaire. On a une problématique d'augmentation de la population, de changement climatique qui est aujourd'hui assez connu avec plus d'inondations, de sécheresses, etc et une baisse de la qualité de l'eau, une baisse de la qualité des sols et un manque d'eau. Et donc aujourd'hui, on se rend compte qu'il y a une équation qui est assez compliquée à résoudre et il faut arriver avec des nouvelles technologies pour arriver à produire plus en utilisant moins de ressources. Moins d'eau, moins d'engrais, moins d'énergie, moins de produits chimiques. Et c'est exactement là-dedans que l'on se positionne avec Aqua 4D. On va modifier certaines propriétés physiques de l'eau pour permettre à l'eau de pénétrer plus facilement dans le sol ce qui permet d'avoir une meilleure rétention en eau dans le sol, de faire des économies d'eau, d'utiliser moins d'engrais, au final d'avoir une plus grande résistance de la plante, un meilleur développement racinaire qui va permettre d'améliorer la qualité et la production des cultures. Au final, nos clients sont les agriculteurs, ça leur permet d'avoir des, des plus fortes productions, tout en sécurisant et en ayant des plantes plus résistantes et en s'affranchissant de problématiques de bouchage de leur réseau d'irrigation, de salinité, que ça vienne de l'eau d'irrigation ou des sols, et, et d'un manque d'eau qui devient de plus en plus crucial dans certaines régions du globe. On a une filiale en Californie. Aujourd'hui, la sécheresse en Californie est extrêmement critique. Donc, ils ont déjà le couteau dans la gorge. Donc, on arrive avec un positionnement intéressant aujourd'hui. C'est le cas au Chili, en Afrique du Sud, dans, dans pas mal de régions. Et on se rend compte, et ça a été déjà annoncé aujourd'hui par certaines euh, personnes qui ont présenté, que même en Valais, qui est le château d'eau de l'Europe, on commence à avoir cette problématique sur les mois de juillet-août où on n'a pas assez d'eau pour l'irrigation, voire pour les écosystèmes et les rivières. Voilà, donc des marchés où il y avait vraiment une, 
une problématique pressante parce qu'ils avaient déjà euh, touché euh, le, le bout du mur là et que évidemment ça faisait du sens d'aller chercher vos solutions. Maintenant on voit qu'ici aussi on y arrive, mais même euh, sans qu'il y ait vraiment euh, peut-être autant ce problème majeur, euh, il y a une certaine aussi euh, leadership hein, de, en Suisse à aller chercher ce genre de solution pour être tout de suite beaucoup plus efficace et en tout cas avoir des projets qui soient euh, peut-être plus durables. Donc euh, je comprends, je comprends cette votre présentation. Est-ce que Jonathan vous voulez présenter un petit peu Bilab et puis euh, vos parties prenantes et la solution que vous proposez Alors je vais essayer, merci beaucoup, bonjour à tous. Euh, en fait avec Bilab on a quelque part une, une proposition de, de, de repenser l'infrastructure de marché. Et en fait le, plus simplement quel est le permis de conduire hein, dans cette économie, donc dans une approche de, de changement de système. Et donc on, on a construit une certification que vous avez mentionnée mais aussi tout un autre point d'engagement qui permet en fait à ces porteurs de solutions de se voir avec un permis de conduire, hein, je prends cette analogie-là parce qu'elle est simple à comprendre euh, et pas parce que je préfère les voitures à d'autres choses, euh, thermique ou pas, euh, mais ce permis de conduire pour l'économie de demain et pour cette accélération, ça fait le pont aussi avec euh, le, le message de Intent hein, sur, sur cette accélération. Euh, oui, il faut construire des ponts, il faut connecter les gens, mais donc si on veut faire cette accélération, il va falloir pouvoir qu'on puisse identifier les acteurs qui vont opérer dans cette nouvelle économie, qui vont opérer ces nouvelles solutions. Et puis c'est ce qu'on fournit avec, d'un côté, hein, j'aime toujours l'image de l'oiseau de, de Bilab avec notre théorie du changement, c'est sur une aile, une des solutions, des standards de développement, de mesures d'impact et de vérification avec la certification. Et puis de l'autre côté, la prise en compte des parties prenantes dans des solutions de gouvernance euh, donc qui couvrent l'homme et la planète, les humains et la planète, dans des statuts juridiques. Et quand on combine les deux, mesures d'impact et puis gouvernance des parties prenantes, bien là, on a en fait un élément crédible qui permet de positionner l'acteur, le porteur de solution. Et on voit en fait que dans les processus de dérisking, dans les processus de due diligence, on a plusieurs des, des, des porteurs de projets que vous avez vus dans, durant cette journée qui sont effectivement Bicorp et qui ont pu obtenir du dérisking dans, par exemple, typiquement l'accès à l'investissement, euh, ou dans les processus de due diligence ou de marché public, euh, en fait, se faire accréditer plus facilement, parce qu'en fait, ils ne sont pas simplement une solution technique qui répond à des enjeux euh, spécifiques, mais ils ont une gouvernance qui permet de les inscrire dans le long terme, de façon crédible, authentique, euh, pour porter leur projet. Donc c'est un peu ce qu'on amène avec le mouvement Bicorp, avec, euh, avec Bilab, euh, d'un côté des outils, d'un autre côté des porteurs de solutions, et je suis super heureux de voir qu'aujourd'hui, on a beaucoup des acteurs présents, euh, comme One Creation, euh, Conoco, ou encore euh, Watalux, euh, Alver, euh, qui, qui est dans le processus de certification, et d'autres, euh, qui amènent en fait, quelque part, ces solutions, mais pour les rendre opérables à, à large échelle, et donc là, quel est le, le sésame qui permet en fait, de faciliter cela pour répondre à l'accélération Donc c'est un peu notre mission. Et puis, euh, voilà, je me, on rebondira sur tous les enjeux de changement structurel dans l'infrastructure de marché, j'imagine, après. Et donc c'est vraiment le, le mot d'ordre, c'est d'amener de la crédibilité euh, à ces porteurs de solutions. Et pour ceux qui veulent comprendre très, très simplement la différence entre un label Efficient Solution de la Fondation Solar Impulse et un label Bicorp, nous, ça va être vraiment juste sur la solution, donc vraiment ce que vous disiez, vraiment juste la technologie et à quel point cette technologie peut être facilement implémentable dans une situation donnée et, et apporter des bénéfices euh, financiers à ses clients. Vous, vous allez vraiment regarder l'ensemble de l'entreprise et puis intégrer en plus, les faire intégrer dans leur statut juridique euh, une nouvelle redevabilité finalement, euh, ce que la Fondation ne fait absolument pas. Donc c'est vraiment deux choses différentes, mais très complémentaires. On a d'ailleurs très envie de collaborer ensemble après ce panel. Euh, et ce qui m'amène à vous, Sébastien, alors le, pro le problème de vos parties prenantes, qui sont multiples hein, quand on est une ville comme la ville de Lausanne, et puis les solutions et peut-être quelques innovations même que vous avez mises en place euh, au sein de la, la ville de Lausanne. Oui, merci Victoria. Bonjour tout le monde. Donc, je m'appelle Sébastien Potello, je suis le chef du service de l'eau de la ville de Lausanne. Donc, c'est vraiment un, un service communal, euh, mais qui agit sur toute l'agglomération, voire au-delà. Donc, le service de l'eau euh, alimente en eau potable à peu près 250 000 euh, habitants, euh, des entreprises aussi, et puis alimente aussi des communes. Donc, au final, c'est presque 400 000 personnes qui peuvent boire de l'eau de, de Lausanne. Euh, de l'autre côté, on s'occupe aussi d'assainissement, donc euh, évacuation des eaux et puis exploitation de la, de la steppe, euh, station d'épuration de, de Vidi, qui, enfin, voilà, qui, qui est pur l'eau de 250 000 équivalents habitants. Donc un, un cycle de l'eau qui n'est pas si évident en Suisse, parce que souvent les choses sont séparées entre la gestion de l'eau potable et la gestion de l'assainissement. Donc une petite innovation depuis 2016, c'est de regrouper ces deux activités dans le même service. Ça apporte pas mal de, de plus-value hein, en termes de, de conception des ouvrages et d'approche des problèmes. Et je dirais par rapport à ça, euh, euh, ce que j'ajouterais aussi en préambule, c'est la chance énorme d'avoir le lac Léman à côté de nous. On a cette énorme réserve d'eau douce 
qui est de, de plutôt bonne qualité parce qu'elle nous permet de faire de l'eau potable euh, relativement facilement. C'est vrai que de, de ce point de vue-là, les, les, les pénuries d'eau à Lausanne, euh, on ne les voit pas encore venir. Par contre, il y a toute une série d'autres enjeux qui sont, euh, qui sont là. Il euh, y en a beaucoup, donc je pourrais passer pas mal de temps. Euh, mais c'est vrai qu'on euh, a notamment des, des questions de qualité d'eau quand même. Euh, Lausanne euh, ne prenait pas d'eau du lac jusqu'en 1930. Donc euh, jusqu'à cette date, c'était que des sources qui alimentaient Lausanne, des sources qui sont pour certaines à plus de 50 km d'ici, qu'on exploite toujours. Euh, une des problématiques récentes, euh, c'est la pollution de certains captages, notamment ceux qui sont aux zones agricoles. Et par rapport à ça, ben voilà, on a maintenant une, une problématique de devoir traiter des eaux de source. Et on essaye d'innover. On a euh, mis de l'argent, on collabore avec pas mal de partenaires pour essayer de traiter... En l'occurrence, il s'agit d'un pesticide, le chlorothalonil, qui a contaminé certaines sources. Et on essaye d'innover pour trouver des méthodes de traitement qui sont efficaces et puis qui sont économiquement euh, envisageables. Et comme... les... oh, pardon, pardon. excusez-moi. Ah, Allez-y, j'allais vous... rebondir ah. justement. Comment vous trouvez, comme... où est-ce que vous allez chercher ces innovations-là quand vous avez une problématique identifiée Alors, on a déjà une bonne expérience. Le, le, le service de l'eau, c'est 200 collaborateurs et c'est notamment un laboratoire performant qui analyse notamment les micropolluants. C'est aussi une équipe études et construction, donc avec des ingénieurs qui étudient. Et puis après, c'est des partenariats avec les grandes écoles, avec des entreprises privées qui fournissent des solutions. Et puis, on essaye de développer une solution en général en se basant sur des technologies qui existent, hein, du charbon actif, de l'ozone, des choses comme ça, de la, de la nanofiltration. Mais on essaie de voir de quelle manière mettre ces solutions en œuvre pour avoir quelque chose qui réponde aux, aux attentes. Alors, Quelque part, c'est de l'innovation. On, on le regrette presque parce qu'on aurait préféré continuer d'utiliser ces sources euh, euh, sans qu'elles soient polluées, évidemment. Hein. Mais on est bien obligé de, de, de trouver des solutions. Euh, depuis les, les années 30, alors je disais, on prend l'eau dans le lac Léman. Donc euh, aujourd'hui, c'est plus de la moitié de l'eau qui alimente l'agglomération la, qui provient du lac. Euh, nouvelle problématique qui est apparue il y a quelques années, c'est la moule quagga. Euh, Jusqu'à maintenant, on avait des moules zébrées, mais qui n'allaient pas à plus de 30 mètres de profondeur. Donc en-dessus des crépines, en-dessus des prises d'eau. Maintenant, on a des moules qui vont jusqu'à plus de 100 mètres de profondeur. Donc, on se retrouve avec une colonisation de, de, de cette moule euh, indésirable, mais qui envahit vraiment le lac Léman euh, et qui colonise les conduites qui vont chercher l'eau au lac. Donc, si on ne fait rien, on va se retrouver avec des, des, des conduites qui sont bouchées. Il y a déjà quelques prises d'eau au lac, pas dans les installations d'eau potable, mais qui sont, qui sont colonisées. Donc là aussi... Euh, euh, un enjeu important et puis euh, pas mal de recherches pour trouver de quelle manière arriver à répondre à, à ça et trouver des solutions. Donc là, on est sur euh, euh, une, euh, un projet de, de construction de nouvelles usines de traitement d'eau potable à Saint-Sulpice, tout près d'ici, hein, au bord du lac, qui alimente une bonne partie de l'ouest lausannois. Et puis le, le projet doit être adapté. C'est un projet qui est, qui est bien lancé. Les crédits sont votés. Le, 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 toute l'étude de la chaîne de traitement avait été faite. Puis là, il y a une nouvelle problématique qui apparaît. On est en train d'adapter le projet pour qu'on puisse nettoyer la conduite, mettre deux prises au lac au lieu d'une, pour pouvoir intervenir. Donc voilà, des, je dirais, on est, on est sans cesse en train de devoir répondre à des défis comme ça, trouver des solutions en partenariat avec des entreprises, avec des ingénieurs, avec des grandes écoles. Euh, oui, enfin, ouais. je terminerai encore juste par rapport à, à des innovations qui ne sont pas techniques. Hein. Je parlais de l'organisation ouais. du service. Euh, il y a aussi l'approche des problèmes. Si je prends un exemple, jusqu'à maintenant, quand on prenait une source, on s'occupait uniquement de, de prélever de l'eau pour, pour faire de l'eau potable. On a maintenant quelques captages qui, qui, qui ne répondaient plus aux exigences actuelles et qu'on ne va pas conserver. Euh, et là, on est en train de renaturer un captage. Ça veut dire plutôt que de laisser ce captage abandonné, on le remet à la nature, on recrée des biotopes, on recrée des, des milieux naturels de source avec une biodiversité très, très importante parce que c'est des milieux qui ont disparu à presque 90% en Suisse parce que soit on capte l'eau pour de l'eau potable, soit on assèche pour l'agriculture, etc. Donc euh, voilà, aussi une approche qui, je dirais, euh, est bien plus large que celle euh, simplement d'approvisionner en eau et de, et de collecter, épurer l'eau, mais aussi une approche, euh, euh, je dirais, euh, environnementale beaucoup plus, beaucoup plus poussée. Je pourrais dire plein d'autres choses, mais je crois que j'ai fait un peu... <rire> Merci. <rire> mais je vais, je vais faire du pouce, comme on dit au Québec, comme on l'a dit, hein, j'ai du... <rire> fait une, une partie de ma carrière au Canada. Euh, faire du pouce sur ce que vous venez de dire, donc sur l'aspect collaboratif aussi, et puis les, les nouvelles approches pour répondre à des enjeux, parce qu'en fait, quand on, a, on essaie d'amener une, une innovation sur le marché, il y a des enjeux à ce niveau-là, de qui prend, d'où vient la gouvernance, qui, prend les, qui est redevable, qui prend les décisions. Euh, vous me parliez un peu plus tôt, quand on préparait la session, 
d'une, de justement cet enjeu, vous pouvez peut-être en dire un peu plus, et puis surtout aussi d'une des bonnes pratiques que vous avez pu voir dans l'un de vos projets. Oui, donc il euh, ben, y a une partie, euh, un gros challenge qui existe aujourd'hui, c'est les différents acteurs qui existent. Alors je parle toujours moi du milieu de, de l'eau et de l'agriculture. L'agriculture, ça représente 70% de l'utilisation de l'eau au niveau mondial. Et aujourd'hui, on arrive avec des problématiques où, au niveau des gouvernements, on va donner des objectifs de, de réduction d'économie d'eau. 5, 10, 15, 20 peu importe. Et souvent, ça va être mandaté à des données à des agences, des agences de l'eau régionales, qui vont avoir pour objectif d'arriver à ce résultat. La problématique, c'est que souvent, ces agences ne parlent pas ensuite avec les utilisateurs finaux que sont les agriculteurs, les, les coopératives, les instituts techniques agricoles. Et du coup, on a cette problématique où les utilisateurs qui pourraient faire le plus d'économies, puisqu'ils sont responsables de 70% de la demande en eau, ne sont pas dans la chaîne de, de valeur. Et donc ça, c'est un gros, un gros problème. Et on se rend compte qu'au final, on demande à l'agriculteur de faire des efforts sans qu'il y ait l'ensemble de la chaîne de valeur qui soit, qui soit réunie. Et, et on parle aussi de tout ce qui est retailer, les, les coop micro, etc. Tout, toutes ces entreprises qui ont aussi une marge importante dans la chaîne de valeur, mais qui ne participent pas aussi au financement. Parce que le financement, c'est un autre point qui est, qui est crucial aussi. Et, euh, et souvent, donc il y a eu là, récemment au niveau politique euh, la votation sur les pesticides, mais on demande beaucoup à l'agriculteur qui lui a une marge relativement faible. Et c'est vrai qu'on doit arriver à avoir tous les acteurs de la chaîne qui arrivent à communiquer ensemble pour avoir des actions collectives et un financement collectif de manière à pouvoir mettre en place des nouvelles technologies comme l'aquacadé, comme les capteurs, les drones, etc. qui permettent d'être efficaces, de mettre exactement le volume d'eau souhaité, la quantité d'engrais, de phytosanitaires, etc. Mais on doit accompagner et on doit pouvoir discuter avec l'ensemble des acteurs. C'est ça, et... ils connaissent non seulement les solutions, parce que bien souvent on leur met la, la, la responsabilité, mais difficile pour eux de savoir ensuite vers qui se tourner. Et puis derrière, après, c'est le côté modèle financier et que ce soit pas toujours euh, effectif, enfin, que ça soit bien réparti ou qu'il y ait des, des modèles euh, un peu innovants. C'est ça. Donc, euh, un, qu'ils puissent être au courant de toutes les technologies mmh. qui existent, qu'on les aide à les mettre en place, qu'on les aide au management, parce qu'il y a un management de l'irrigation, de la fertilisation qui va être différent ensuite. Nous, on accompagne à chaque fois nos agriculteurs sur chacun de nos projets, que l'on mette en place des solutions de financement. Et euh, ben je, re, je, je donne le relais ensuite à, à Jonathan, euh, qu'on mette en place aussi des certifications qui puissent, qui puissent aider dans ce sens. Et puis l'exemple peut-être que l'on discutait tout à l'heure, c'est au Chili, il y a une certification qui se met en place, certification ASUL, qui, qui va justement donner des incentives, une carotte aux agriculteurs qui, qui vont mettre en place des nouvelles technologies, des nouvelles manières de faire euh, pour faire des économies d'eau. Et derrière, ils ont des réductions d'imposition. Et donc c'est vrai que ces certifications ont un point intéressant et il y en a de plus en plus qui commencent à arriver. Alors maintenant, il faut un cadre important sur ces certifications, mais ça va aider à donner de la crédibilité, une reconnaissance et un support à ceux qui mettent en place ce genre de, de méthode. De mesures plus innovantes. Justement, Jonathan, vous voulez un peu plus parler de comment la certification Bicorp, donc développée par Bilab, peut aider à ça, à une meilleure gouvernance sur tout le long de la chaîne de valeur de, de, des entreprises Oui, volontiers, sans, sans, sans faire un focus sur, sur la certification Bicorp ou d'autres, mais en fait, cette dynamique qui se trouve entre les différents acteurs, hein, on, on parlait en fait de, de, de ces différentes parties prenantes, donc on a, on, a, on, a, on a les pouvoirs publics, on va avoir le privé, on va avoir peut-être même des fois la société civile ou d'autres organisations, et comment est-ce qu'on crée quelque part dans ce, ce besoin d'accélération pour mettre ces solutions en place, euh, trouver les financements pour euh, les, les développer, comment est-ce qu'on crée en fait un, un cadre qui permet en fait de faire cet accès, de supporter cette accélération hein, Si on prend, on regarde l'agenda 2030, les objectifs, quoi. si on écoute ce que nous dit la science aujourd'hui, l'accélération voilà, n'est pas juste un mot, c est, c est, en fait c'est une nécessité. Et donc euh, comment est-ce qu'on va créer en fait ce, 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 ce grand framework, ce grand cadre qui permet de le faire et certification en fait peut être un de ces accélérateurs que ça soit pour l'adjudicateur public afin de pouvoir trouver l'opérateur pour mettre en œuvre oui. parce que l'idée de plus que simplement trouver les solutions comme je le disais mais c'est aussi de trouver l'opérateur qui va dans le temps avec sa gouvernance s'installer euh, durablement euh, et de façon bénéfique pour, euh, pour pour réaliser le projet et puis après on, on voit qu'il y a maintenant aussi euh, bah, typiquement pour l'investissement on fait des projets PPP hein, public, privé, dans ces partenariats, mais on va avoir des sources et donc des besoins de dérisking hein, pour valider ces projets, ces investissements, euh, des fois croisés entre le privé et le public. Et comment est-ce qu'au milieu de ça, on met une gouvernance qui s'assure que l'opérateur, si quand il est privé, va, va délivrer la mission correctement bah, C'est ce qu'on amène avec la certification Bicorp. Mais 
peut-être plus largement sur ce qui a été dit euh, en, en préambule. Je crois que la, 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 vraie, euh, la, la vraie raison d'être aujourd'hui, on a par exemple en Suisse euh, une nouvelle loi sur les marchés publics qui est rentrée en vigueur en janvier 2021, euh, qui intègre pour la première fois, à côté du prix de la qualité, euh, la, la, la notion de, de prendre en compte la dimension sociétale et environnementale. Euh, donc, c'est de la prendre en compte, hein. on n'est pas dans quelque chose qui est trop euh, contraignant. Mais donc là, on est quand même dans un... C'est un excellent signal, hein. il y a un changement de paradigme qui s'opère, il y a ce qu'on appelle en fait un soutien à un changement structurel. Les marchés publics en Suisse, on parle de 42 milliards, hein, c'est 10%, 11% du PIB suisse, pour prendre un exemple très local et très concret ici. Euh, on peut faire d'énormes changements. On peut, et donc, si on veut faire cette accélération et qu'on a les capitaux et qu'il y a ces changements structurels qui arrivent, effectivement, il faut pouvoir équiper avec le bon permis de conduire l'opérateur, le porteur de solutions, euh, pour le mettre aussi en réseau avec d'autres, euh, et peut-être aussi sur, la même, euh, sur le même pied d'égalité, quelque part. Alors, parce que l'idée étant que, euh, faut que ça soit aussi dans un, que ça se perde dans un marché libre. Et, et idéalement juste, je dirais, en mmh. ajout. <rire> Si on continue sur l'idée de cette loi sur les marchés publics et d'approvisionnement et comment on va pas seulement parler du coût mais parler justement de la durabilité d'une de, 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 approche en tout cas qui prend plus en compte l'environnement. Le, euh, J'aimerais aussi savoir bah, justement votre avis alors que vous travaillez à la ville, représentant donc du gouvernement ici. Euh, Comment donc, vous innovez aussi sur cette collaboration, non seulement sur les appels d'offres, le procurement, euh, donc, pour regarder effectivement ce qui se passe, euh, des bons conseils que vous pouvez donner aux entrepreneurs euh, qui sont dans la salle aujourd'hui. Et puis aussi une question qui revient souvent, parce qu'on est dans l'aspect collaboration, c'est euh, à quel niveau de gouvernement, alors comment vous, vous travaillez avec le canton, avec la confédération, comment ça s'organise tout ça pour qu'on comprenne bien euh, ben si je commence par les marchés publics, euh, c'est vrai que c'est des montants très importants. Les, les critères environnementaux et sociaux peuvent être pris en compte depuis longtemps, si on veut. Hein. Ça mmh. fait euh, un certain temps que c'est quand même pas que le prix qui décide, heureusement. Euh, mais c'est vrai que, en tout cas, je, je, le, je le vois très régulièrement, on a beaucoup de difficultés à les intégrer de manière, euh, je dirais, fiable et, et à croire à ce qu'on fait vraiment quand on intègre l'environnement. Ce qui fait que, euh, je dirais, par manque de critères pertinents et discriminants, on se retrouve souvent à mettre un poids à ces critères très faibles. Alors les, les critères socio-environnementaux, c'est souvent 10% de, de pondération dans les marchés publics. Et puis ensuite, il y a des critères environnementaux, par exemple, être ISO 14 000, des choses comme ça, mais qui ne sont pas forcément très, très, très pertinents, je dirais. Voilà, c'est mieux que rien, mais enfin. Euh, les critères sociaux aussi, c'est le nombre d'apprentis, c'est des choses comme ça. Euh, donc c'est vrai qu'on on manque, je dirais, d'avoir de, des manières de mesurer de manière crédible, sans discriminer les entreprises, hein, mais euh, leur performance environnementale et sociale. Donc de ce côté-là, moi, je, je, je pense qu'il y a des, des, des progrès à faire et je serai euh, en tout cas preneur de nouvelles solutions par rapport à ça. – Et le canton de Vaud est très en avance euh, <rire> en Suisse sur ces questions-là. Ils ont, ils ont fait une révision l'année dernière de leur, de leur canevas de marché public en prenant en compte différentes certifications euh, dont celle de Bicorp et d'autres. Et on oui, voit oui, qu'avec une pondération plus haute, hein, on est plus. Oui, 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 ça bouge à 30 25. 30 25, je n'ai pas encore très... tellement vu, mais. Oui, ouais, non, non, pas 35, <rire> j'ai dit 25. Mais... Ah, d'accord. <rire> mais donc, ça devient intéressant. On voit qu'il y a ce changement qui commence à se faire. Mm -hmm. Et puis, bah, juste après, peut-être moi, je vous partagerai un rendez-vous euh, <rire> l'année prochaine par rapport à cela. Très bien. Voilà. Et puis, par rapport à la, la deuxième question sur les, les collaborations, alors c'est vrai que dans. Dans le domaine de l'eau, je dirais que la Confédération indique vraiment des règles, des normes, euh, typiquement de qualité d'eau, de, de choses comme ça, loi sur la protection des eaux. Le canton a un rôle de surveillance pour vérifier que les communes fassent le boulot correctement. Et c'est les communes qui ont, qui ont tout le travail, en fait. Hein. Euh, mmh. Ce qui fait qu'on se retrouve avec euh, euh, bah, devoir fournir la population en eau potable, euh, épurer les eaux, etc. Et, et très, très clairement, l'échelle communale, ce n'est pas, pas toujours la bonne échelle pour le faire. C'est rarement la bonne échelle, en fait, parce que se... les bassins versants recoupent rarement les frontières communales. Euh, les communes sont souvent petites, enfin, en tout cas dans le canton de Vaud, je crois qu'il y a 400 distributeurs d'eau, donc avec des échelles qui ne leur permettent pas d'avoir les compétences et d'avoir les moyens financiers pour, euh, pour répondre aux exigences actuelles. Donc il y a une régionalisation qui est en cours. Euh, les communes qui se regroupent à Lausanne, elle a eu lieu depuis longtemps, en fait, parce que, au niveau de l'eau potable, comme toutes les communes n'ont pas accès au lac, certaines avaient peu de sources, puis Lausanne leur avait déjà piqué les sources depuis longtemps. <rire> on s'est retrouvés, en fait, euh, 
dès les années 20, par là autour, à avoir des communes qui ont vendu leur réseau à Lausanne et délégué complètement la, 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 la mission d'approvisionner en eau potable. Donc on s'est retrouvé avec une régionalisation un petit peu forcée, on va dire, euh, qui, qui fait que le, le service de l'eau aujourd'hui a un rôle vraiment euh, plus important que si on n'était que sur Lausanne. Euh, et puis maintenant, bah, le, 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 tout n'est pas réglé parce qu'on voit que dans chaque nouveau projet, euh, il y a par exemple maintenant un plan régional pour le bassin versant de la Chambronne. Eh ben, il y a une dizaine de communes qui doivent collaborer avec l'impulsion du canton, avec des subventions du canton, des subventions de la Confédération. Donc euh, le, 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 la collaboration à l'échelle régionale, elle est juste fondamentale. On n'arrive pas à faire grand-chose sans ça. On a des cours d'eau, par exemple, qui ont des pollutions d'origine urbaine, des, des, des mauvais raccordements des collecteurs d'égouts. De, 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 dans, dans un cours d'eau, ben, en général, il y a une commune d'à côté, une autre de l'autre, puis une troisième en haut. Donc il, si on veut régler la situation, il faut discuter, il faut collaborer. Et dans tous les domaines, c'est comme ça. C'est vraiment comme ça que vous arrivez à, à mener votre équipe, à être aussi dans le changement, dans la collaboration, dans l'écoute de toutes les parties prenantes Absolument. Euh, le temps file. Alors, j'aimerais vous poser une autre question avant de pouvoir aussi, et puis commencer à penser à vos questions, vous, pour le, le, le panel, euh, aussi bien en ligne qu'ici avec nous. Euh, si on se revoit dans un an sur ce même euh, stage, donc sur cette même estrade, quel serait le projet que vous aimeriez absolument mettre en place et être fier de pouvoir nous dire « ça y est, Victoria, il y a un an, je t'ai dit que je ferais ça, et là, je l'ai mis en place ». Est-ce qu'il y a quelque chose qui vous vient en tête alors, euh, de mon côté, je pense qu'un an, ça va être dur, mais euh, dans l'idée, on aimerait aussi travailler pas seulement en B2B avec les grands producteurs, comme on a aujourd'hui en Californie, au Chili, puis dans une quarantaine de pays à différentes échelles, mais aussi pouvoir travailler sur un, un bassin versant complet ou un pays, un pays donné. On, on pense notamment à des projets sur la mer d'Aral, au Maroc, où là, la, la criticité est encore plus importante et, et le fait de, de rendre des régions désertiques par manque d'eau, par salinité, ça fait des migrations de populations importantes. Et on aimerait pouvoir, justement, on est en train d'essayer de commencer à discuter avec la FAO, les United Nations, les banques de développement, les agences de développement. Je fais un clin d'œil à l'agence de développement suisse. Mmh. Et, euh, et on aimerait pouvoir ne serait-ce qu'être connu de tous ces services pour proposer euh, nos solutions, parce qu'on pourrait vraiment être central dans des projets comme ça pour permettre euh, de continuer de l'agriculture dans, dans des régions qui se dépeuplent parce que bah, c'est plus possible et il n'y a pas assez d'eau ou les terres sont devenues impropres. Donc euh, un an, je pense que ça va être très dur parce qu'on se rend compte que bah, le temps de, de discuter avec tous ces interlocuteurs et puis de rentrer dans des projets euh, de cette nature, c'est assez long, mais j'aimerais beaucoup dans un an qu'on soit déjà dans un premier projet. On va avancer en tout cas les négociations, les discussions, la collaboration avec les premières parties prenantes. Merci. Jonathan Alors, Le rendez-vous, en fait, il serait lié à peut-être un, un programme que certains d'entre vous ont entendu parler, qui s'appelle le Swiss Triple Impact, hein, le triple pour euh, People, uh, Planet, Prosperity. En fait, on a lancé ce grand programme national avec le soutien de la Confédération, euh, un grand nombre de partenaires euh, il y a maintenant de ça une année et demie, on a près de 200 entreprises qui se sont engagées en fait dans une structuration, une priorisation d'actes mis en action de leurs pratiques de durabilité et de leurs solutions. Donc vous pouvez retrouver ça en ligne assez facilement. Et donc dans un an, ce qui se passe en parallèle de ce programme, c'est qu'on a créé des groupes de travail. Il y en a un qui est sur la question des marchés publics. Et donc comment, avec ce groupe de travail national, on va en fait, à travers une démarche multipartie prenante, faciliter le travail de l'adjudicateur des pouvoirs publics ou de l'administration, euh, faciliter aussi l'accès aux porteurs de solutions, aux PME, euh, pour ces marchés publics, en formant des outils, euh, le matériel nécessaire. Et puis là, c'est une collaboration vraiment multipartie prenante. Donc, euh, on va initier ce groupe de travail au mois de septembre. Euh, on a pu regrouper les acteurs. Et donc, euh, bah, dans une année, on pourra vous présenter les résultats et, et peut-être avec plaisir, euh, bah, au moins, donner un signal qu'on a apporté des facilités dans les deux sens pour rejoindre ces acteurs autour des thèmes de la durabilité euh, dans euh, l'économie concrète et réelle. – Et le but, c'est-à-dire que c'est un forum euh, où ça va être vraiment des outils que vous mettez à disposition ?– Ce sont toute une série d'outils qu'on va mettre à disposition, qui sont déjà en fait à disposition pour la plupart gratuitement, mais qu'on va en fait euh, faciliter, qu'on va aussi créer de la, de la sensibilisation, de la formation, euh, parce qu'en fait, euh, bah, il y a toujours ceux qui, il y a les porteurs de solutions très techniques, qui maîtrisent vraiment. Et puis, on a plein de PME qui n'ont pas forcément tous les moyens, tout l'équipement, on va dire, pour répondre à ces demandes de marché public ou des demandes même dans le marché de donneurs d'ordre privé. Et donc, c'est comment est-ce qu'on équipe l'opérateur économique avec tous les bons outils accessibles pour se mettre en opération dans la durabilité, dans l'économie de la durabilité. 
Et puis vous avez cette force de l'écosystème en plus. Donc bien souvent, effectivement, on est trop petit pour répondre à une problématique. Ouais. Donc réussir à mettre ces gens euh, euh, sur une même plateforme. Et on a des villes qui rejoignent ce programme. On a la ville de Gland qui dernièrement rejoint ce programme. On a des chambres de commerce. On a voilà, des, 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 même des grandes entreprises qui disent ouais, engager toutes leurs chaînes de valeur. Donc il y a une belle dynamique. Je crois qu'il y a un momentum. Et puis peut-être je finirai là-dessus. On va faire un peu l'aspect la, la, suisse. On n'est quand même pas loin de votation. Hein. Il y, a, il y a quelques jours, euh, qui, qui donne un signal. Et ce signal, c'est euh, bah, l'action euh, volontaire, c'est l'impulsion qui va venir par l'économie pour amener ces solutions, amener cette dynamique. C'est ce qu'on essaie de soutenir avec ce projet euh, au niveau national. Merci. Sébastien, une idée bon, Je vais tricher un peu parce que ce n'est pas facile de, de séparer les choses. Donc, euh, on sait que l'horizon d'un an est court. Euh, mais j'espère arriver euh, euh, à la fois... Euh, avec des solutions techniques qui permettent au, de, de, de répondre aux enjeux que j'ai rapidement cités euh, auparavant, euh, à mettre en œuvre toutes les relations, toutes les coopérations avec les, les, les différentes communes, autorités et entreprises privées euh, pour être le plus efficace possible. Et puis si on peut arriver aussi, alors je rebondis un peu sur euh, les marchés publics, mais être un acteur qui, euh, qui, qui attribue des marchés euh, de manière... Euh, en tenant mieux compte des, des aspects environnementaux et société, ben je pense que ce serait, ce serait tout bénéfice. Donc voilà, ça fait beaucoup de, beaucoup de choses en une année, mais en tout cas, c'est clair qu'on va progresser pendant ce temps-là. Voilà. Très bien, merci. Est-ce que dans la salle, il y aurait déjà des questions Ou bien euh, par, euh, sur la plateforme Pas pour le moment. Alors pour l'instant, je peux commencer avec une autre question. Je suis désolée, j'ai un sentiment de m'acharner sur vous, Sébastien. <rire> pas de problème. Mais justement, on parle, vous parliez de comment on peut attribuer, euh, enfin être la ville soi-même un marché. Euh, comment ça fonctionne les processus d'expérimentation, euh, par exemple dans une ville comme la ville de Lausanne, pour des technologies qui ne sont pas encore tout à fait euh, prêtes à, à déployer à d'autres, euh, d'autres. Euh, alors, tout, tout dépend des cas. Il y, a, il y a vraiment plusieurs cas de figure. Dans certains cas, on est juste un terrain d'étude, c'est-à-dire qu'on met à disposition soit de l'eau, soit le, le, le réseau ou, ou les installations pour des entreprises qui veulent innover, qui veulent tester. Parfois, ça va un peu plus loin parce qu'on met aussi nos compétences à disposition en termes d'analyse, en termes d'ingénierie. De, 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 Et puis, dans d'autres cas, on est plus avec des projets internes où on essaye de développer des solutions, d'évoluer, et puis où on s'appuie plutôt sur des partenaires qui vont apporter certaines parties de solutions. Donc voilà, ça peut être vraiment à tout niveau, en fait, qu'on qu qu collabore, suivant nos compétences internes, suivant aussi les, les demandes qu'on peut avoir de l'externe. Très bien, merci. Un, un mot à ajouter de, de nos panélistes, quelque chose qui vous tient à cœur, que vous aimeriez donner comme conseil ou comme... Bon, C'est ça, une réflexion ouais. sur l'intelligence collective, en fait, et sur ce, ce besoin, en fait, de se réunir... Ces enjeux, sont, je crois on les connaît tous, et il y en a dans, dans la thématique de l'eau, forcément, euh, de très nombreux et de très importantes. Mais quand on sait que c'est 44 000 milliards, hein, donc la moitié des actifs en circulation dans notre planète, sont dépendantes du climat, sont dépendantes de la biodiversité, sont dépendantes de la nature, il faut agir vite, il faut agir fort. Et donc, il faut, avec cette intelligence collective, en fait, faire tomber ces barrières de façon structurée, crédible, pragmatique. Mais il faut les faire tomber pour aller dans ces solutions. Donc, euh, Appel à l'action, euh, forcément. Tout de suite et pas demain. Exactement. Dernier mot de euh, fin. Pour finir, oui, bah, j'en je profiterai pour remercier euh, Waterpreneur et Intent pour l'organisation de cet événement. C'est vrai que l'eau, c'est vraiment un enjeu crucial euh, pour le futur. Donc il faut mettre beaucoup de poids sur l'eau. Et puis la mission de Intent, euh, effectivement, de, de pouvoir construire des ponts et réunir les différents acteurs de la chaîne, je pense que c'est une mission extrêmement valable parce qu'aujourd'hui, on a besoin de, justement de réunir tous ces acteurs pour arriver à, à, à atteindre des objectifs, euh, on va dire, qui sont euh, importants aujourd'hui, mais qui sont nécessaires. Et puis on voit ici en Suisse aussi qu'il y a un certain dynamisme avec différents clusters. On a vu le cluster O un peu plus tôt, je collabore bien souvent avec le cluster CleanTech Alps, Waterpreneur aussi a ce rôle de marketplace, Intent arrive aussi avec ça. Donc il y a un très gros dynamisme je trouve à essayer de mettre en place ces parties prenantes, à discuter les uns avec les autres, à monter des projets collaboratifs. Ce panel en était un exemple d'ailleurs avec une PME, quelqu'un de, enfin, le responsable du service de l'eau, de la ville de Lausanne et puis un représentant non seulement de Bilab qui est vraiment sur la gestion du changement mais finalement aussi des corporates parce que c'est beaucoup ça qui, qui compose votre, votre membership donc on avait ici un, un panel assez divers alors avec ceci, s'il n'y a pas de questions de la foule ni sur la plateforme je crois que nous avons terminé le panel de la soirée merci, merci.
Merci. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you so much for that, gentlemen, for being on the panel, for joining us this afternoon and giving us so much to look forward to. Thank you. Stuart, if you'd like to join me. Okay, so we are almost there, almost at the end, almost at that glass of wine that's waiting for us <laughs> at the bar outside for the apero. Now, Stuart, you have been with us throughout the entire day. Yeah. And, of course, you've just um, uh, moderated the last pitch session. What is your big takeaway from what you've seen today? Wow. <laughs> so, uh, quite a day. So, I think first thing to say is it's really nice to be back in a venue where you're with people. Even with the masks, it's just great to be out of the house and put a suit on again. I know my wife was very happy when I left the house today. <laughs> So, so I think it's great. I think the organization of today was fantastic and well done. You juggled a lot of stuff today, but I think you did it very, very well. Uh, I think those of us who came here and were online are obviously drawn to this subject where we understand water, we understand the challenges. Um, but I felt the passion today, which I thought was really great. To, to, and, and it was great to be, again, in, in, in a venue where we could share these ideas. Um, and so I think while we saw an array of extremely different interventions and uh, startups and innovations, uh, we're all drawn here because we are uh, obsessed by this incredible uh, resource. Um, and I think as Andre Hoffman said at the very, very beginning today, he said, you know, we're not here to navel gaze and we're not here to be doom and gloom. And I think that's really important because you know, as we do go <clears throat> back into the world of the, the global water conferences and we do go and we sort of spend our days wringing our hands and complaining that nobody cares about us and the fate of the world, uh, we didn't spend our day doing that today. We spent our day today talking about solutions and opportunities and we came here to put ideas on the table that I thought were inspiring and they were all directed at solving problems. So I really you know, I mean, it's a long day for all of us, but we all hung in there, and I think we felt hopefully energized by that. I learned about underwater drones. I learned about impact investment. I know what a digital twin is now, and we all, for the first time ever, learned the word chlorella. Uh, we talked about hydro irrigation utilities, the city of Lausanne. We had really big perspectives over big problems, but we also learned about plastic in rivers, bees, willow, plantations, and everybody had something to say and everybody had something ingenious to think about and everybody gave me something to learn. So I left today learning something from everybody. And I think that this crisp and sharp format also allowed all of us to keep energized, keep entertained and, and keep interested. Um, so as we reemerge from COVID, uh, I think a takeaway from me is that we need to continue to inject in these global water conferences sessions like this where we talk about solutions and opportunities to the bigger problems because we know how big they are, we know how important they are, we, we all believe they are the biggest challenges we face, but I think time spent on talking about solutions was very rewarding. I mean, I have very little to add to that list, um, only to echo that, yes, that, you know, I, I came in a believer yeah. also, and not an obsessor, <laughs> but uh, certainly a believer, and, um, and, and very aware of the problems, but leaving very hopeful that there are so many opportunities, tools, ideas, innovations out there. So, um, so for that, I am grateful and seeing, of course, the benefits of this kind of event, right? Connect people, connect the dots. So on that note, a big shout out to the Innovation for Water team. Thank you so much for putting on such a great, great event to the waterpreneurs, the three gentlemen who are scattered throughout here. Thank you for being the motor behind this to intent for the outstanding partnership without which this could not have taken place today and to the fantastic technical crew back there from the STCC. Thank you, ladies Thank you. and gentlemen. Very nice, nicely done. So, and then of course, not surely not the least, our great audience, as you said, who stayed with us throughout the day, live and online. Thank you so much for joining us. And as we said, this is first of a series of three, the next one taking part sometime in the fall, to be determined, but another Innovate for Water coming soon to Geneva. So. If I may, Frank, I'm just going to invite everybody. <laughs> Hope that you join us again, be it live or online. We'd love to see you again. And now it's time for that apero. Please enjoy.